Ethan. Ethan, get over here. First of all, I want all of you to check your balance on your cameras. Say that this is a play, and then moving that way, yeah. and you start out like this wide, and then the person in the orange has the ball, and you're coming in on them, and you're catching focus the whole time. Is there and then, These are the most fun shoots. And you're just trying to get this full body shot right here. You're trying to get that full body shot falling smoothly. If the play starts to move to so like they toss it someone else, then you, you need to zoom out a little bit, try to try it again. Uh, it's okay to be on a semi it's okay not to have them play. You guys can be, you guys can catch them like this. If, if it's too much movement for you, catch them on a little bit of a wider shot. But if you can, the rest of the time, you know, try to, try to be, you know, running from the three, you guys are mostly going to be catching up to them. Let's say they're coming this way down the field. This camera is going to be catching this action from the this half down the field. Camera one. You're on that side of the field. Hello, everybody. from Lincoln Intramural Field and on the campus of Boise State University. And welcome to Boise State Television's coverage of the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Tournament. I'm Riley and this is my co-host Alton and my analyst Kyle. And today we are excited to bring you over five hours of non-stop rugby coverage. We got our first game about ready to kick off here. It's going to be Northern Colorado kicking to the Boise State University A team. Kyle, with these chilly conditions on the field, how can we expect the pace of play to be affected today? The pace of the game is going to diminish just slightly at least, but we're going to see a lot of drop balls today. It's going to the ball's going to be cold and hard to catch and throw around. So the big thing today is possession, possession, possession. Whatever team is able to hold on to the ball the longest. 
this and able to slowly methodically drive down the field for these tries is going to come out victorious at the end of the day. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We'll turn our attention now to the pitch where it looks like we're about ready to begin after a one hour and change, one hour and one minute exactly, snow delay. Overnight, we accumulated about an inch of snow here in Boise, a little unexpected early April snow shower. And so we all had to adjust accordingly. All the uh, girls and parents down there have been very hard at work shoveling off snow and making this playing condition what it is, what you see in front of you now. So as we get ready to go here, it looks like Northern Colorado is about ready to kick. We still have some people off to the left here shoveling off last minute. Kyle, before we get going here, who is your early prediction for a tournament winner? Tournament winner, I, I think it's going to come down to Boise State A versus Montana State. Uh, Montana State and Boise State actually played each other in 15s earlier this year where Montana State came out victorious 55-7. to But as we all know, 7s is a completely different game and anything can happen with this weather. It's a level playing field today. But I do want to give the slight edge to Boise State A today. I'm, my prediction will be... Uh, 15-10 Boise State A in the championship round. There you have it, folks. Kyle Curry, 15-10 Boise State A in the championship. The first kick went out of bounds for Northern Colorado. It will be a line-out for Boise State. Now, Kyle, describe line-outs to us because people are very familiar with the visual of a person being lifted to catch the ball. So, yeah, when the ball goes out of bounds or is taken out, as you see, they did a line-out, and both teams have the option to lift a person up into the air to try to catch the ball. You have to throw the ball down the middle, but it looks like we and got we a And we have our away. first breakaway right here. Running down the right side, Boise State is free. I don't think anybody's gonna catch her, and they most certainly will not. The first try of the Fool's Gold Tournament will be converted by Boise State. That is number 15, the All-American Maria Donovan, the senior from Boise, Idaho. Puts the Broncos on the board, and it is five to zero, Boise State. What do you think about that play? I mean, it really was just a quick transition almost, you know, with they did a, such a great job. I mean, offloading after making some good progress. I mean, what did you see on the breakaway, though? On the breakaway, it was a, a little bit of a complete defensive breakdown by Northern Colorado. They got sucked into Boise State. And you can't do that when you have Maria Donovan on the sideline, on the edge. If you give her just two steps, she'll take it all the way. Big thing for you. Uh, Northern Colorado today is spreading out on defense and playing inside out defense and sliding off. If they can corral Maria Donovan onto the edge, they'll have a good shot to come back here in this game. Absolutely. Northern Colorado is in their first year as a program after a four year hiatus after their program shut down pre COVID. And so this is actually their first out of state tournament. Meanwhile, Boise State is coming off of a fourth place finish in the Division I National Tournament in Washington, D.C. last spring. Boise State kicks off, and that will immediately be a knock, I believe. That'll be a knock. On Northern Colorado, Boise State will feed the ball into the scrum. As they set up their scrum here. So in 15s, how large are the scrums for each team? In 15s, we see eight on eight. Typically, that's all your forwards. Uh, with the, in addition, you have the scrum halves there, as you see here, and then with the remaining of the backs out of the scrum. But in fi seven, since it's half the players, you only got three, and it looks like they found it. And we're swinging right around the corner. Very quickly, that is Lee Lynn Hewitt, the junior out of Boise, Idaho, and she will make it another try for Boise State. Lee Lynn Hewitt, the junior out of Boise, Idaho. And what happened there? Just another defensive breakdown? It was a little bit of another defensive breakdown. It does come with the inexperience of just developing, bringing back that program off that hiatus. But what we need to see from Northern Colorado is on these scrum set pieces is if you're going to have Boise State overload one side is we're going to need to see that scrum half play behind the back of this scrum to be able to defend that weak side channel. If they pass the ball wide, that's going to be relied on her outside backs to take care of those backs. But it just speed got that one step on the weak side channel and there was no one there and it was home free. So halfway through our first half here, we have a 10 to zero Boise State A leading the Northern Colorado Bears. Now what's Northern Colorado have to do to find some success here? Well, I think a lot of it is kind of what Kyle was talking about. I mean, you need to just keep those weak sides, um, you know, keep attentive on those weak sides, you know, make sure Boise State's not getting that outside edge and forcing them back towards the inside. There we go, and Northern Colorado on the break. Nice a nice look. little layoff there. And now they get down into the ruck. 
a clean exit for Northern Colorado. They're running down the left side of the field and a good tackle there by the Boise State defender, driving her backwards and eventually to the ground. Took her for about five to 10 yards there before she brought her down. A nice another little layoff there from Northern Colorado. Oh. Advantage and advantage Boise being State. played to Boise. The ball kicked forward. No, oh, there comes that Boise State speed once more. That is Bree Fry, and Bree Fry will score the third try of the game for Boise State. Man, uh, just another like you know frequent play where the ball just kind of starts going on onto the turf, and it was a great knock on there uh, by Boise State just to keep knocking it forward and eventually find an opportunity forward. It is now 15-0 Boise State A versus Northern Colorado. 15-0 ball game here. So as far as seven scoring goes, what would you consider a high scoring game in sevens? What's the highest you've seen in your time, Kyle? Highest I've seen upwards to 40s to 30s in a game. A lot of breakaways. You typically see those on hot summer days when people are just tired, dehydrated, and just any little step can make the ball go for long tries. Northern Colorado receives the kick and immediately she is down, but a nice little layoff. Northern Colorado reversing field, trying to find something to the right, coming near us now. Moving right, trying to get spacing and trying to get formation. Number two for Northern Colorado, that is Genevieve Hankins, the captain. They call her Big G. She is the president of this club and she is the reason that Northern Colorado's program came back from their four year hiatus. They're brought down now into the ruck and that's a clean exit to the right for Northern Colorado. Carrying people with her is the Northern Colorado player down into the ruck. Boise State really scrapping after it, but Northern Colorado is able to maintain possession. Seems we have a knock on by Northern Colorado. A knock on there. Boise State picks it up. And they're running down the sidelines. That is number 15, Maria Donovan, the All-American, once more turns on the afterburners and smokes Northern Colorado. That will be the fourth try of the first half for the Boise State Broncos. Well, again there, I mean, like, even when Northern Colorado was slowly, like, moving up the field, they were super narrow, and once that loose ball came out, you just saw Maria Donovan scoop it up, and there was just nobody there to help contain the edge again, and Boise State taking another lead. And we have our first successful conversion of the game. So in Rugby Sevens, for those that are not familiar, a try is worth five points, a conversion is worth two. So we are now at 22 to zero, Boise State A, the Broncos leading the Northern Colorado Bears. 22 to zero as we are slowly coming down on time here in this first half. In the second half, I would love to see University of Northern Colorado make sure to hold on to possession of the ball. With it being a little bit more inexperienced program, trying to offload after contact every single time is not going to be a recipe of, for success for them. If they're, as you can see here, they're really flat on attack, which makes it very hard for them to pass and distribute that ball. Why? That's why we're kind of seeing these one pass and try to break through the game line. Understandable, and there's another turnover for Northern Colorado, and that is number 12, Kaya Strang, breaking away for Boise State, and there is another try for Boise State, 27 to zero, as we are slowly coming up on time here at the end of this first half. Again, Boise State doing a good job, you know, when they're defending Northern Colorado, just forcing them backwards as they got the uh, try or the uh, conversion there to make it 29 to nothing 29 to nothing Boise State a up on Northern Colorado Northern Colorado hoping to find some success and stave off what so far has been a drought as we come to the end of the first half once more our score Boise State Broncos a 29 University of Northern Colorado Bears zero once again, for those of you that are just joining us, we apologize for the slight delay. We had to clear some snow off the field after an unexpected April snowstorm that happened overnight here in Boise. We are Boise State Television, and we are covering the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Tournament. This is the third annual Fool's Gold Rugby Tournament hosted by Boise State University here at the Lincoln Intramural Field on Boise State's campus. The date today is Saturday, April 6th, and I think we are a shade after 10 o'clock. My name is Riley Chappelle, and my co-host here is Alton Dillis. My analyst here is Kyle Curry. Kyle is a former Boise State rugby player, and he also played a little bit of club rugby down in California, from what I gathered earlier. Uh, we're very grateful to have Kyle with us because this is Alton and I's first time actually covering rugby. So you're kind of here to be our guru and walk us through this. A little bit, uh, I guess from, from kind of 
playing 13 years of rugby myself, you kind of pick up a thing or two, learning, playing the game, and now I'm currently coaching here in the Treasure Valley area. Oh, you are? Okay, where are you coaching? I'm coaching at Rocky Mountain. Oh, good deal. Coaching the uh, their varsity uh, men's team. Right that. on. So uh, how does high school rugby work out here? Is it a club-based system? So it's kind of interesting. With rugby, you kind of get a cluster of different ways. Back in California, you do see a lot of clubs where it's multiple different high schools commun coming into one team. But here in the Treasure Valley area, one high school, one team. If you go to that high school, our entire team is comprised of Rocky Mountain high schoolers. So it's definitely a different interest playing back in 2015, 16, 17 having nine to ten different high schools on your team and coming to coach a team where they all go to high school together is a completely different aspect. That's wonderful. So it's the fact that this has changed the way it has in the past ten years with having nine to ten high schools form into one high school team, is that a testament to the growth of the sport? Yeah, rugby is consistently growing in the United States. It's one of the fastest growing uh, sports in the United States, especially more on the western side of the United States. Uh, it's definitely growing. Uh, people are just a lot more football players. We're seeing transition to rugby in the offseason, something that can kind of translate more. So, you know, you got your linebackers, running backs can still take that contact and even NFL teams to this day are, are taking on rugby tackling forms such as the Hawk tackle as we see with the Seattle Seahawks take on. Absolutely. So I was curious, so you're, you're coaching high school and I mean, what is what are some of the differences between like the high school club level and kind of the collegiate level? Big thing is you're going to see is one is at the collegiate level. There's a lot more size and speed at that level. At the high school level, you typically have people that only have played for a couple of years. So the experience is kind of relative at the time. Uh, big thing that happens is just we see skill and size and speed just go up another notch at that collegiate level. The kick from Boise State was received by Northern Colorado's Genevieve Hankins, but she was not able to hang on to it, dropped it forward, resulting in a knock-on. Boise State will be able to enter the ball into the scrum. They're fanning out left with hopes of exiting to the left and using that speed they have on the outside to outflank Colorado once more. Don't forget the last time we had a scrum, too, they went to the near side and went into the uh, end of the try zone. Absolutely. There we go. The ball is entered. It looks like Northern and Colorado. It looks like stole Northern it. Colorado hooked it out. Northern Colorado passes it off to the right, and they are not able to corral it. She is taken down with a pretty big hit there. Taken down once more there into the ruck. The balls bounce loose. We have a knock on by Northern Colorado. And we have a knock on by Northern Colorado, meaning we will reset there. Yeah. Boise State, they uh, they have some very aggressive players out there. They're not afraid of hitting that cold ground at all. No, it's a few years ago this program, uh, it's been a very, they've done a lot of successful things in helping develop this program. Uh, I remember the times when they only had six or seven people at practice. Now they have upwards of 30 to 40 people showing up at practice and developing. Uh, that's a huge testament to their lead club leadership here at Boise State, developing the program to what it is today. A successful program that's won two bull NCR games down in Houston, Texas. Yes, with the most recent bull win being the 2023 Lone Star Bowl down in Houston this past September, or December in 15s, where they took down Kent State by a score of 20 to zero. And immediately here, Boise State is on the attack, looking to press forward. That is number four, Ali Franzak. Down once more is the ball there in the ruck. Northern Colorado comes out of it. They're exiting to the left, trying to find something, but they're being swarmed by defenders from Boise State. Offsides by Boise State here. And an offsides by Boise State there. So offsides is when they're in improper alignment off of the ruck, correct? So, correct. So with that ruck being formed, you have to be behind that last foot or even head of that ruck from Northern Colorado. So somebody must have came up a little bit too early, got a little too excited to make a hit, and it cost them there as Northern Colorado is starting to drive down the field. Genevieve Hankins there. She took a couple defenders with her before she was able to lay it off, and they're advancing the ball forward. Hankins now looking to take it out of the ruck. Oh, and oh. it's immediately picked up. That's number 10 for Boise State, Sydney Halsey, the junior from Meridian, Idaho, and that will be another try there on a slight miscommunication between Northern Colorado players, it looks like. What we saw there is from Northern Colorado taking a little too long to set up and get someone established. That wing there on the side should have just kind of stepped in and passed that ball and kept play going. As we saw, the uh, the person in the ruck was a little bit confused and stepped away from the ruck, which opened up the gate, making it legal for them to step over and secure that ball for an easy try. And it looks like the conversion was no good. The conversion ends up just short. 
And so now here our score is going to be Boise State A 34, Northern Colorado 0 with 446 left to go here in this second half. Northern Colorado looking for anything positive to build on heading into their next game against Southern Utah, which will be coming up here at approximately 1120. Our next game coming up here is going to be a pool three game between the College of Idaho and Western Oregon University, which should start immediately when this game ends. Boise State there with a the kick, and that's a good kick. Goes deep into Northern Colorado territory, and they take it out. Northern Colorado looking for something here. They're coming to the left side, quickly approaching the sidelines there, and that's a good tackle by Boise State. As they are now fighting in the ruck, Genevieve Hankins takes it out for Northern Colorado and passes it over to Grace Blanchard. Boise in the ruck once more. My apologies, Kyle. What were you going to say? I was saying Boise State's doing a really good job of contesting the rucks. When we have these inexperienced teams, sometimes they're a little late or not to have that strong foundation to secure to those rucks. So Boise State's doing a really good job contesting these rucks and making it difficult for them to get a good, clean ball out to their support lines. Genevieve Hankins, if there's oh. been one bright, what a hit! Yeah. Upended. Wow. Oh. If there is one bright spot for Northern Colorado at the moment, guys, it's Genevieve Hankins. She has moved the ball better for them than anybody else on the Northern Colorado team so far, which you would expect considering that she has prior rugby experience. Looks like we have a knock on yes. by Boise State, scrum to Northern Colorado. Northern Colorado here at this point. It looks like they've got some substitutes in, trying to get everybody some playing time here. As we are now halfway through the second half. Alton, what do you think watching your first live rugby game? You know, I think uh, it, it's been interesting because you, we've seen a lot of, you know, kind of a difference in, in, in styles here. I feel like because Boise State's happy to use the edges where I feel like Northern Colorado wants to hang out more inside and try to make this more of a physical game. Um, and so far, uh, Boise State's been happy to meet them in the middle, but also then use that to go outside and use their advantage on the edges as well. Absolutely. Number 10 with the ball currently. Number 10 with the ball currently for Boise State. Sydney Halsey will enter the ball into the scrub once more. And for you viewers at home, do not forget that you can engage with us using the chat feature in your viewer to shout out your favorite player. If there's any parents of players playing in today's games, feel free to go into the chat there on YouTube and, you know, ask us to give them a little shout out. Ultimately, we are doing this for the players of all these teams here. We feel that it's important that they get the coverage they deserve and also they have a little memoriam and a little video to go along with their collegiate rugby careers as Northern Colorado here is coming up on the halfway mark, and that will be a knock and a legal forward toss there for Northern Colorado. Boise State will be able to enter the ball into the scrum. I think we're starting to see a lot of these weather conditions playing a huge factor in this game, and I would say more from the unexperienced side of it. We see Boise State able to make a little bit cleaner, better passes, easier to catch, and that just comes with the experience of being playing rugby the last couple years. So we're starting to see that set in with Northern Colorado, and hopefully we can just have their emotions set in a little bit, get settled, and hopefully we can see an exciting second game for them against Southern Utah. So Kyle, talk to me here. Northern Colorado, they have a lot of first year rugby players. Possibly the entire team outside of Genevieve is a first year rugby player. What is it teaching somebody, not just the rules of a completely new sport, but also how to play it at a high level? The biggest part is player safety at all times because rugby being a physical contact sport, there is that possibility of getting injured and getting hurt. So the big thing is teaching proper positioning. And with the whistle blowing, it looks like that will be the conclusion of our first game here at the Fool's Gold Tournament. Our final score at the end of the first game is going to be Boise State Bronco 18-34, University of Northern Colorado Bears out of Greeley, Colorado 0. Moving on to our next game here, we are going to have a Pool 3 game, as I said before, between the College of Idaho out of Nampa, Idaho, about Caldwell, Idaho, rather, sorry, about 30 minutes northwest of here taking on the Western Oregon Wolves. Well, Kyle, so, you know, we, you kind of were talking about how the, the experience in that game was kind of more focused. I mean, you kind of saw Boise State make some adjustments perhaps and just playing a, a bit of a simpler game, an easier game. 
you know, do you think with some of these more, you know, these pool three teams, I mean, do you think we're going to try to see them kind of just kind of stick to the basic stuff, try not to do anything fancy and just kind of wait for maybe mistakes from the other team? Or do you think that they're going to just say, you know, we're going to, we play how we play and we're going to figure it out? I think we're going to see a lot of different aspects here from both teams. And this game, College of Idaho's women's team is also a fairly new team as well. Western Oregon being a little bit more established and dominating more on the West Coast. I think from this, from what, from Western Oregon, what I'd like to see is spreading the ball wide and utilizing their athletes wide while College of Idaho, I want to, want to see them be able to maintain possession and not worry, as is, this is not football. There's no set downs. You can take as many phases as you'd like to go down and score. So just holding on to the ball, even just if it's a meter every single phase, just kind of progressively pushing their way down the field and securing that ball. If, they, if College of Idaho can hold on to the ball uh, longer than Western Oregon in this game, they're going to win today. We have some shout outs from the chat. Thank you for all the interactions, guys. Hannah Smith says, go Ashland, number eight for Northern Colorado. That's going to be Ashland Mass, the freshman out of Castle Rock, Colorado. She was a former volleyball player in high school. We also have a shout out from somebody saying, go Gabs. So as we get ready here for game number two, it looks like the College of Idaho will be kicking off to Western Oregon. I love those kits for the College of Idaho, by the way. The white on purple looks really sharp. It's a combo you can't go wrong with. That's definitely for sure. I grew up a University of Washington sports fan, so I definitely am a little bit biased. And that's a great boot there from the College of Idaho as Western Oregon looks to chase it down. Immediately, a big collision, but not able to wrap up. Western Oregon falls forward with it immediately into the ruck. And this game already being played with a tremendous amount of patience. Oh, number nine for Western Oregon, Emily Moore, the junior, takes off and she is tackled. Now this is number six, Tessa Medina, the sophomore, trying to break through. Carrying people with her, takes two people. Western Oregon's playing at a very fast pace right now and is catching College of Idaho a little off guard. If Western Oregon can just spread out and create a little bit of depth between their players right now. Oh, but it looks like we got a little breakaway right here. A little breakaway on the right side. That's Estella, Mir Estella Miranda Aguilar, the junior. Falling into the ruck quickly. Very, very quickly, Western Oregon seems. It's they're falling down, but they're getting rid of the ball. They're continuing, mo they're continuing movement and not letting College of Idaho to kind of set their defense. One thing I would like to see College Idaho do is start contesting those rocks as we saw right there. No one was over the ball and that we had a player just kind of looking over at it when she could have easily just kind of pushed over that rock and secured possession for College of Idaho, stopping the momentum of the Western Oregon. The pass bouncing off of the West or Western Oregon player results in a knock, meaning that the College of Idaho will be allowed to enter the ball into the scrum here in their defending half. Not quite the start we expected. One thing we are definitely seeing from this level is that quick play uh, from this small college. Oh, and it looks like we got a little contest for the ball right now, and it looks like Western Oregon's coming out from the scrum with the possession of it. And that ball will be bounced forward down into the ruck. College of Idaho comes out of it. I have a let's go Estella number seven in the chat. Well, Estella just made a great play to get it down into College of Idaho territory earlier. So let's go Estella indeed. College of Idaho now trying to fight out of their own half of the field. Looks like West, Western. Western Oregon fighting to get that ball back. Looks like we have a penalty and it's a quick tap and go by Western Oregon. And another quick tap and go there from Western Oregon. They're on the left side. That's number 11 for Western Oregon. Quinn Ritter. And Quinn Ritter is able to get in for the try for Western Oregon. That fast play for College of Idaho, Western of Oregon is just kind of catching them off guard. Yep, it's going to, that's what it looks like. It's going to be Western Oregon's recipe for success today. The key thing is be able with endurance, but playing at such a fast pace, endurance and stamina will kick in, and we'll see how that will affect them later in the second half. Absolutely. We have a stoppage in play here now. So, so I would love to ask you guys, with this being your first time watching rugby what are your first impressions of this game at this collegiate level um so far two games in i'm impressed at the difference in speeds between the first game and the second game now our teams in pool a and pool b you would expect them to have a bit more talent and experience but western oregon has come out very ferociously and they've just looked like the more prepared team so far in this first half
Yeah, I mean, and, and building off of you know what Riley was saying, I think that you know I'm impressed at, at the uh, at just the the various levels of um, of kind of like I guess uh, tactical ideas. I mean, because you kind of see like some of these teams like Boise State A and Western Oregon so far are really interested in kind of using those wider areas where we've seen. College Vado when they've had the ball uh, so far in this first half, but also in our previous game um, with Northern Colorado trying to kind of hang out in the middle. I mean, it's been interesting and to see the we difference. have a breakaway going down the left side for great, College of Idaho. Great tackle by number nine of West. Very Oregon. good tackle. Exiting out to the right now, College yeah. of Idaho looking to reverse field, but Western Oregon once again able to track them down. That's Coral Davis, the junior, with the tackle there for Western Oregon. One thing we saw there that comes with the inexperience is we had from College Vida had a three-on-one attack situation. Oh, and it looks like, unfortunately, we do have a player down at the 50-meter line. We do have a player down there, unfortunately, for the College of Idaho. We will try to get you that player's information as soon as possible, but for now, we hope that everything's all right. With uh, rugby being a physical game as it is, injuries are, unfortunately, a part of it. Um, Later on in the day, we'll see the Colorado School of Mines play, and one of their stars went out with an injury in a tournament down in Missouri a couple weeks ago, so they are now acting team manager, but unfortunately, she will not be able to play today. And I'm sure many teams deal with that same thing throughout the course of a rugby season. With rugby being a very physical sport, there are actually some benefits compared to other physical sports that are comparable, like football, for instance. You actually see per ratio per rugby player less concussions in the game of rugby than there is football. Uh, a couple things that contribute to that are the actual tackling. In you know rugby, you're taught to tackle, as they call the term cheek to cheek, putting your face cheek on that person's yeah. bottom cheek. And by doing that, you're keeping the head out of the tackle. And being also playing football myself, having that helmet, there comes the psychology of the game where I have this protection, I can use it as a weapon. And you're taught in football to put your head in front. But as we've seen in more recent years, we're seeing that transition in American football to rugby tackling because of how much safer it has been proven to be. And we're seeing concussions in rugby significantly less than compared to American football. We are getting multiple shout outs right now in the chat. Once again, thank you for all the interaction. Quinn's dad says that she rules. How about that? We also have a nice tackle, Emily. Thank you for all the interactions, guys. Keep it up, we really enjoy it. Keeping our friend Courtney here busy, running back and forth, letting me know what people are saying in the chat. And it looks like she is up and at him right now. And it looks uh, like everything seems to be okay. It looks like she's going back in and playing. Good to see. I love to see a warrior. Yeah, definitely a lot of toughness to play in these cold conditions. De definitely getting tackling on this cold turf is not going to be anything too fun today. Anyone who played sports growing up knows, especially if they grew up in this neck of the woods, just how difficult it is to play on cold turf. It's like playing on concrete. So any bounce you get off of there is going to hurt 10 times as much when the weather is the way it is. Got some great. Oh, and oh, we have a breakaway right here for Western Oregon. That's going to be number two, Jada Miller. And she is taken down about 10 yards outside of the try line. And not a clean exit from the ruck there. We will have a yellow card assessed to the College of Idaho. It looks to be as of a high tackle. I couldn't see from it clearly, but it looks like to for a high tackle. We have a yellow card on the College of Idaho, so she will have to be out for two minutes, which will create a seven on six advantage for Western Oregon, which they immediately take advantage of and score. The captain, Emily Moore, the junior with the try, making it 10 to zero, Western Oregon over the College of Idaho. That yellow card is gonna play a huge role in this game. Playing six on seven with such a wide field, if Western Oregon's able to take advantage of that increased space on the field, it's gonna, they're gonna run away within these next two minutes if College Vida is not able to put a stop to, put a stop to them. And it looks like that yellow card was assessed to, it looks like to the captain, Lila Jamison, number one for the College of Idaho. So the College of Idaho, now when you have a player with a yellow card, what's your offensive strategy playing six on seven? Six on seven, personally, right now, we only have a couple minutes to halftime. It's just keeping possession and keeping ball. You can still do everything you normally did. The big 
key thing is going to be on defense having to cover more space with less people as in compared to 15s if you're playing 14 on 15 it's still a disadvantage but not as drastic as it is in sevens with that taking basically in realm of 15s two players out in that kind of translation yeah absolutely i mean everything is much more drastic in sevens than 15s i would imagine so as a coach what's your defensive strategy when you're down a man well when you're down a man like this we would what I would do is place our first person on defense in behind the scrum so that weak side channel is gone since you are losing a scrum half in this scenario. And then just having the cover and play soft defense, letting him gain yardage or meters, but not letting him score that try. It's giving your defense time to establish. We have shout outs for Coach Nick, and we also have shout outs for Jada and Emily of Western Oregon. And also thank Bryce Cornwell for the shout out. Looks like we have a tap, we have a penalty here. It's gonna be a tap and go by number nine. Tap and go by number nine. That is Emily Moore once more. And Western Oregon breaking through. Did they get in? Yes, that is Claire Rickus, the senior. And Western Oregon once again, just proving that speed kills as that conversion is no good. And we now have a ball stuck up in the fence. That official's working hard to get it down from the netting. So it looks like it's halftime. The score is 15-0. 15-0 here at halftime of our first pool three game. Very, very fast paced first half dominated by Western Oregon. What do you want to see from the College of Idaho here in this second half to bounce back? From the College of Idaho, what I would like to see them do is use the space that Western Oregon is given. They're, they've had a couple of opportunities to pass it wide and let their playmakers run free, uh, but with the lack of space and depth that they are doing, they're just kind of taking these uh, tackles and not taking advantage of what Western Oregon is giving them. So when that uh, that yellow card comes back onto play, I would really love to see them spread that ball wide and see what they can do on the edge. Because right now they're attacking on the inside and that's not working for them. Absolutely. Just a reminder to everybody here as we reach halftime that we are Boise State Television and we are here covering the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Tournament live from Lincoln Intramural Playfield on the campus of Boise State. We will be with you for approximately the next five hours bringing you 13 more rugby matches. This tournament here, Alton, if you want to break it down for us real quick because we didn't get a chance in the intro, tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely. So. There's 10 teams total in this tournament. They're each divided into three pools. So we have pool A and B, which each contain uh, three teams each, as we've mentioned, and pool C is containing four. Uh, the teams are gonna play in their pool in a round robin style for seeding, and pools A and B will score off against each other at the end of the day. Uh, the games are gonna culminate with the one seeds from pools A and B, scoring off in the championship match at approximately, we think, 250 mountain time for the Fool's Gold Medal. The schedule for this tournament is that games will be kicking off every 20 minute. Now, of course, that's approximate because sports are unpredictable and we will have stoppages here and there. Our next game on the docket is going to be a Pool B game. Pool B, which we're going to call the Pool of Death because there is a ton of talent in Pool B. It's going to be Montana State versus the Colorado School of Mines two teams who went to nationals in their respective divisions last year and found a lot of success with the Colorado School of Mines finishing second in Division Two and Montana State winning third place in the Survivor Shield in the premier division of sevens. And that, I'll be honest, that is the game I am looking forward to most. We have two powerhouse women's rugby programs going at it on this cold and wet day and we're going to see what happens this wet this field and conditions is going to be the greatest equalizer we can see who comes on top because the winner of that game could be the reason why someone goes to the championship or not absolutely and as we resume action here in the second half college of idaho is looking to build some momentum and possibly stage a comeback now how often do you see two three score comebacks and sevens where the pace of play is so fast it can happen almost instantly it, with there being the lack of players on the same size pitch you can see huge breakaways come often and quickly and it looks like we have an overload here if they can spin it here to the wide side coming down the left side is the yotes they immediately fall into the ruck number four for the college of idaho takes it away 
She's got it right back now. To what I was mentioning, what College of Idaho did right there, they were attacking that weak side channel with the with numbers, and that's what we want to see in a great tackle. Looks like we have a not on penalty scrub to Western Oregon. That was really interesting watching that. It looked like they were trying to set, like maybe College of Idaho looked like they were trying to slow play um, that that ruck there, and what ended up happening was Western Oregon wanted to speed things up a little bit, so that tackle happened, and it led to the knockoff penalty. I mean, do you typically see teams try to slow things down? Another one says, no, let's, let's, get, let's play this a little bit faster. Typically at sevens with it only having those seven minute halves, we do want to see that ball go at a quicker pace. And if you have one person covering that ruck and you guys are gonna take your time, somebody will eventually come in and try to break that up and steal the ball. Wolves have the ball out of the scrum and they're heading to the left. A good take down there for the College of Idaho. Quickly though, out of the ruck, that's number nine for Western Oregon. Once more, Emily Moore down the sidelines and she is taken down by the last person that could have gotten her. But quickly, though, Western Oregon just continuing to apply the pressure. It is nonstop. Great offload. Oh, and a great offload there. Western Oregon looking to rotate it a bit further to the right. This is Jada Miller. Jada Miller, nobody's going to touch her, and she is down for another try. 20-0, to Wolves on top. Western Oregon did a really great job right there, passing the ball through the hands and avoiding going into the ruck. If they had those, they had those two, two hands available to make those offloads, and it looks like the conversion is no good, bringing the score to 20 to zero. But one thing we saw really good by them is using the hands effectively and running at pace, hitting those punch lines hard and making it hard for College of Idaho to react and establish their defense. So Kyle, talk to me a little bit about conversion percentages here because so far today we are only two games in and obviously we're going to see a lot more teams play as we see Montana State enter the pitch here on the bottom left but how successful are conversions usually and how much are they stressed once again with general beginners to the game like this? Conversions can be huge, being the difference of those two points. As you can see here, we've only had a couple conversions here between the first two games and that drastically changed the score. You have two, three conversions, that's an extra try added to your point total. So the real key point is scoring under the goalpost and having your best kicker be able to just kind of drop kick that ball through the uprights. Absolutely. We got a couple more shout outs to mention here. Chris Ricketts says shout out Claire Ricketts for the Wolves, former All-State Lacrosse High School player in Oregon. Can't kick though. <laughs> oh, a little bit of family razzing, I love it. And then we've got a shout out for you here actually, Kyle, from Andy Main. Says great job with the commentary, gentlemen. Tell Kyle I said hi, loved watching him play at BSU. Excellent scrum half. Well, thank you. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. Andy Main is over at Western Oregon. He helps with the rugby programs over there. He's helped build a very aggressive and well-established Western Oregon team. They made it to the 15s for national small college playoffs numerous times now, and they're continuously growing that program more and more each and every year. Well, very exciting to hear that we have listeners out in Monmouth, Oregon. Shout out to all you guys out there near the Oregon coast. As running down the sidelines here, we have Estella Miranda Aguilar once more. She lays it off to Emily Moore, who is taken down and into the ruck quickly and out of it quickly. Seems to be Western Oregon's favorite way to play. Right now, they're doing a really good job of when they are breaking the line to gain, they are having support runners. And right now, we're seeing College of Idaho slow to those rucks. And great tackle right there. We've also seen Western Oregon use the tap and go a lot. And once more, here we go for, I believe, the third time. It's going to be Emily Moore converting another try and making it 25 to zero Western Oregon. The route is officially on, folks. It's been interesting watching this because, I mean, in the, I feel like in the first half we saw a lot of Western Oregon really kind of trying to use the full width of the of the pitch, and then as the second half has kind of gone on, I feel like we've seen them try to go for more of those overloads, in, using the, the width of still, of course, but kind of then working more towards the middle. I mean, I feel like their last two tries came just on breakaways through the middle. No, you're 100% right, and when they get break that game, mind the game, they're doing a really good job of creating that support line and following their teammates, not just hoping that they just get the breakaway and score. They are actively pursuing the ball carrier in the event that they are wrapped up in tackle they're making those great offloads and making their tries easy for them as we reset here with a little over a minute left to go in this second half college of idaho looking for some positive momentum to lead them into the second game as we have a big collision there 
and it'll be knock on by College of Idaho. It'll the ball knock barely on. scrapes over that 10 meter line right there. Ball scrapes over the 10 meter line. College of Idaho touches it right as she is contacted by a player from Western Oregon and that results in the knock on. Western Oregon so far possibly establishing themselves as the leader of pool three. We've yet to see the other two teams play, but so far I feel like we're all pretty decently impressed with the way these Wolves have come out and handled this decent College of Idaho team. Did a little switch here to number seven. Little switch here to number seven. Number seven, that's Estella Miranda Aguilar trying to get in. She's chased down by a very, very fast Yotes defender, but she could not get her in time. That will be another try, making it 30 to zero, Western Oregon. And the conversion is no good. It goes wide left, almost hitting some Northern Colorado players. And that looks like to be the match today for Western Oregon and College of Idaho today. Very, very strong start there from Western Oregon as their coach is high-fiving players on the sidelines. I believe that is one of the two coaches, either head coach Nick Smith or assistant coach Mike Gonzalez. This is actually Western Oregon's first seventh qualifier in program history for a program that was established in 2004. Half of this team is actually first year players. Let me tell you, for half of the team being first year players, very, very good performance. Yeah, they looked like they were very, very well drilled. They knew exactly what they wanted to do and you know, they consistently stuck to their game plan. I mean, it looked like they just knew exactly how they wanted to attack the College of Idaho and uh, were able to take advantage. And now we shift back to our Pool B game, folks. This is going to be the one that we were hyping up earlier. Montana State versus Colorado, or sorry, the Colorado School of Mines. So Kyle, kind of talk us through, I mean, how, what we should be looking here. I mean, these, like you said, these are the two heavyweights of, of Pool B. I mean, what, are, what kind of game can we expect here from two teams that should be pretty close together in terms of, of their talent level? I think today we're going to see the first close game of the day. I think a lot, we're going to see a little bit more experience on both sides of the ball going at it at each time. Uh, I hope to see the ball being used wide and see what kind of speed that both these teams have. I'd probably give the edge to Montana State at this moment, uh, being a little bit more established in having that more wins under their belt and experience I think is going to play well in favor to them here as both of them are from states where it does get cold and snow I don't think the weather is going to be a huge drastic impact to their normal field of play on this matchup here so do you think we're in for more of a, a KG opening few will they kind of feel each other out or do you think we're going to just see them hit, hit pedal to the metal and then just go I think we're going to see a slow start but they're going to make each make some halftime adjustments and create some more points I think we'll see somewhere along the lines of 15, 10, 10 to five, or even seeing some conversions made today, depending on who is kicking. Uh, but seeing those points being uh, tallied up there in the second half, it, when we have that stamina endurance start kicking into the game. As we reset once more, I once again want to remind all of you who just joined the live stream, we are Boise State Television, and we are here broadcasting the 2024 Fool's Gold Tournament, the third iteration of the tournament hosted by Boise State University here at Lincoln Intramural Field. And we are now watching the beginning of the Colorado School of Mines and Montana State. Colorado School of Mines will be in the striped blue and white, and Montana State will be in the all-white, for those of you watching, as already this game starts off at a frantic pace. Lots of hits and lots of strong play so far. Colorado School of Mines clears it from the ruck and immediately they're headed off to the left. Oh, a wayward pass there, bouncing around. Mines takes it down the sideline, a nice little layoff there. That's number 15 for the Colorado School of Mines, Mariana Moreau, a captain. They could spin it wide right here and score. Look at, they have the position. overload. If they can make this pass and see all a little bit on the ground, but we can see what Colorado School of Mines is trying to do is get that ball wide and play fast. They don't like to go down to the ball and play in the rocks very often. So we can expect through this game, we're gonna see them pass wide. Key thing for Montana State is to be spread out on defense. If they're gonna clump up like that, Colorado School of Mines is gonna take advantage of it and Montana State's gonna pay for it in the end. We have a shout out from the father of Aaliyah Lynn, the player for Colorado School of Mines, the All-Americans I was talking about earlier. It says big shout out to my daughter Aaliyah Lynn, key player for the Mines, out with a season ending torn ACL injury. That is the injury she received down in Missouri at their St. Patrick's Day tournament for Missouri Science and Technology, I believe. 
unfortunate to hear, but, you know, as we were talking about earlier, that's part of the game. Looks like we got a loop, and that's a great a loop. Great in line. loop there from Montana State, and they are on the run. Oh, turning on the afterburners. That's number 12 from Montana State. Bridget Crowley, the junior from Kalispell, Montana, puts the Bobcats on the board. And this is where you're going to see that experience come to play, running these loops, unders and overs lines, creating that space. They kind of caught Colorado School minds almost in shock of running that loop. Uh, and we just saw some great speed and great experience right here. And that's what happens when we see these more experienced, well-established teams come into play in these tournaments like this. So when you see something like a loop there, for those that don't know sevens, the advantage of that is what? Almost like setting a pick on a defender in basketball or something similar to that? And the hopes of when you run that loop is hoping that the defense do not adjust and slide off and adjust their defensive responsibilities as we can see there the person lined up on the person who was looping did not push their follow the defender off to that person which created that gap right there and montana state took advantage and i you can expect to see one or two or more of those throughout this game we have another shout out here Ch shout out to the tiny but mighty Jade Lavelle, former soccer player and cross country runner at Cheyenne Mountain High School in Colorado Springs. Go Ore Diggers. Looks like we have a knock on by Colorado School of Mines. It's gonna be a scrum to Montana State. I'm curious to see what kind of play they cook up here after doing that loop on their previous try. So far in this highly anticipated matchup, it looks like the Bobcats have the Ore Diggers on their heel a little bit. So let's see, on their heels rather. So let's see if they can bounce back here, stop it, and get possession. The entrance into the scrum. Still fighting for it, and there's the exit for the Bobcats as they're swinging left trying to find something. Oh, a hand on a jersey is the only thing that stopped a breakaway there. And diving in to the ruck, Montana State clears it out to the right, not a clean pass. It's been interesting watching them, these two schools go at it so far because I feel like on both of their first possessions, I mean, we saw School of Mines almost have that breakaway but just couldn't quite you know, uh, keep, the, keep possession of the ball there. And then Montana State had their opportunity and immediately took advantage. And I feel like that is going to be what you know decides this game based on what you've already said, Kyle, because the fine margins, I think, w against teams that are as good as these two are and how tight the skill level is, I mean, I feel like those fine margins are going to make the difference. And we see they take advantage of the open side right here. She may have the speed to go all the way. Where she's, and loses the ball in contact. It's gonna be advantage to Montana State. And now play will be stopped. Is that advantage will now be called a foul. It's a great run by freshman Kyra Shaner from the Colorado School of Mines. So Kyle, as somebody who's familiar with the women's sevens game, can you tell how these field conditions and this weather is affecting the game so far? Or do you think that for the most part, the players are fighting through it? I think they're doing a good job of fighting through it at this moment. It does, will, and, uh, it will affect the game of play. Sevens is the game you like to play fast and wide. And, and as you can see and here- And the Bobcats on the run now down the left side. Absolute wheels there. We're trying to see the player's number, but the Bobcats are free and they are in for a try. That will be their second of the game. And if you saw it back there, they, what they did is that same exact play. The defense is not adjusting to that loop and getting to the space wide. Big thing I would like to see Montana State implementing this game is actually scoring near the goalpost. If you have that chance to run into the tri zone and score in the middle and possibly get those two points, that's what they need to start doing because they could be playing a Boise State A or somebody else from that Pool A team who will take advantage of those conversion points and that could ultimately be the deciding factor in the championship day. Absolutely. And as we head back to the center and reset here, our score is the Montana State Bobcats 10, Colorado School of Mines or Diggers 0. Colorado School of Mines and Montana State, as I said earlier, both made appearances in the national tournament last year in Washington, D.C. The national tournament this year is actually coming up in the end of April. Montana State and Colorado School of Mines. Colorado School of Mines actually has already qualified with two recent victories they had against Northern Colorado last week. And that will be a line out. And it will be the ore diggers with the throw in. So talk to me a little bit, uh, Kyle, about, about the um about this, you know, the next sequence coming up here, because I feel like I, 
I've, now I can't say I've watched a ton of rugby in my life, but I feel like it. Do you no normally see like a turnover? Because both teams typically go up for these, but I feel like I only ever see the team throwing it in get get possession. Is that typically the case? I would say in this scenario, with the conditions how it is, as you can see, they kind of just throw it straight in. It's just preparing, preparing and playing on defense. If your team's not a strong team lifting up in lineups, might as well just let them try to see if they make the mistake and play on defense. And as you can see here, they made a mistake, and it's going to look to be a scrum to Montana State for not throwing the ball in straight. And with these bad conditions, line outs are going to be very hard to do and throw in today. So if you have the choice between a line out and a scrum, I highly recommend moving forward with the scrum since we've seen some success. And watch right here. I'm predicting right now Montana State's going to run that same loop right here. And let's hopefully call it a school of minds can adjust on defense. Kyle the Savant with the call. Let's see if it happens here. Montana State gets it out and they exit it to the left. Looking to get that edge, a little cutback here. A swarm of ore diggers try to take them down, but they cannot, and that is a Montana State player on the left side who is taken down, and that will bring us to halftime. A little exciting flurry of action there at the end of the first half, but we will go into halftime with our score, Montana State 10, Colorado School of Mines 0, here in this third game of the day at the Fool's Gold 2024 Rugby Sevens Tournament, sponsored by Boise State and brought to you by University Television Productions. So Kyle, what are your adjustments that you're making here in the second half? I mean, you're Colorado School of Mines, you're only down two tries, so you know, you're still very much in this game. What are you doing here? What are, what are the adjustments you're making? Honestly, big adjustments are going to be on defense. Big thing is, is as you saw there, Montana State did try to set up that loop, but Colorado School Mines came up hard, closed the gap in spacing, which made it hard for them to even get it wide, and they swarmed onto it and swarmed tackling. If they can just come up together and fast, they're going to shut down Montana State. Big thing I want to see on offense is running those support lines. We've seen them have a couple of breakaways, but with not having that support, they lose the ball and turn it over. Now, keep in mind, they're only down 10 points. They only need to score two tries and one conversion to take this game back. And in seven minutes in Rugby Sevens, anything can happen. So this game is not at all over just yet. Now in this tournament style format, if we were to see a tie at any point today, would we just call it a draw and that's how it would go into the table? Or is there a way that we can play a quick overtime? There would be a quick overtime, uh, basically just kind of your standard overtime rules. Usually it's about two to three minutes at most. Uh, first person to score wins. And that can be if any points to, it can even be a three point conversion as a well. A three point conversion as well, which is when in play, you kick it up through the upright. Now with the conditions, I don't know if we will see that today, but there's a lot of rugby left. So curious, I mean, Kyle, because we've kind of talked a lot from the perspective of these teams that have been down at halftime. What what changes would they make? If you're Montana State, what are you you know what are you talking about here? Possession, possession, possession. Still want to play at a fast, high tempo pace, but in control. You do not want to give them any opportunity. And the big thing is, do not commit any egregious penalties. Keep the tackles low, because if you get a yellow card in this second half, it could be the nail in the coffin for them, even being up by 10 points. And so, you know, offensively here, I mean, School of Mines, we've seen them try to work to the outside a little bit after, you know, dr drawing them in on the near side and then trying to go for a quick switch, you know, reversing the field. But that hasn't quite worked out for them yet. Do you think you try to switch up the offensive strategy, maybe play towards more the middle or? No, I would say keep doing what you're doing right now and just bring some added support, getting those breakaways and then having someone to pass that ball back inside to to create an opportunity. Second half is underway. The kick from Sam Gardner, the sophomore for Cincinnati, Ohio, started up for us, and now Mines are on the attack. Very aggressive tackle there by the Bobcats. Yeah, we have advantage to the Colorado School of Mines. Montana State was not back 10 on that tap and go penalty, and that's going to give them an extra 10, and they're going to go right back at it again. School of Mines looking to get the Bobcats on their heels a little bit here, and oh, oh could not convert that pass, and they lose what momentum they had as Montana State ferociously tracks it down. Looks like we have another penalty. It looks like it was an offside penalty. Montana State being a little too aggressive, and unfortunately, the knock-on right there is gonna cost, it could cost him right there. Well, that's unfortunate there for the School of Mines. It looked like they were starting this second half out hot, but that knock-on's going to give the ball back to Montana State to enter into the scrub. Almost around midfield, slightly into the ore diggers defending half. Montana State going out wide to the right. And we will reset that scrub. 
Now talk to us about the scrum. What's the art of the entry into a scrum and why are sometimes we seeing scrums be reset? So with that, the ball came straight out of the channel. So we, what we want to see is like how you kind of put in, you want to feed it a little bit more into your team so that basically when they set that scrum, all you guys have to do is just step over and the ball is presented and easy available. You don't have to really hook it like as you would in 15. I see. Montana State fighting down the left side now, and that will be a line out as we have players falling into the snow banks created by the snow shoveling earlier. That cannot be warm. That will not feel good tomorrow, that is for sure. Tackling them basically a brick of ice over there. Alan, getting a wet jersey at the start of the day, too. Not envious at all. Not that it's much warmer up in this parking garage we're in right now. <laughs> Great thing for them is they do have time in between games to go over to the Student Union building, heat up, warm up before their next match. That is very true. And the ruck is cleared off to the right. Montana State looking to go to that open expansive field. Oh, oh great punchline. Cutting number. up, great play by number 13. That is Sam Gardner, the sophomore out of Cincinnati, Ohio, with the try. Very, very solid run there by Sam Gardner to bust through Colorado School of Mines lines and get in there. That was really impressive. I mean, you, we watched them kind of reverse the, the, the field there, and we see them. We saw uh, Colorado School of Mines look like they had it all covered because they had their numbers out there and they were in good position. And then uh, I think, you know, looked like Sam Gardner also saw that and tried to make a move inside and managed to get pa past their defender and in for the try. Yeah. And the conversion does not go through the uprights there for Montana State, making the score. Or Diggers 0, Montana State 15. Now with roughly 4 minutes and 30 seconds left, we're slowly starting to learn that our clock up here is not accurate to officials' hand time down there. Do the ore diggers still have a chance? And if they do, what do you need to see from them? We need to see quick play and reduce some of these mistakes. They've had the opportunities to capitalize and make this a close game, but right now we're just seeing small little errors, passes a little bit too far ahead, some drop balls, and even just some silly penalties that are kind of costing them here. It is, they have three possessions to, to get through and score, so when they score, you gotta go through and kick that conversion quickly. You only need one of them to make this game yours and just settle up on defense, but it looks like we're, they're having some problems here. And Montana State now heading down the right side, trying to get that edge, and the Ore Diggers are just able to keep a hand on that player. Going into the ruck now, Montana State clears it out to the left, trying to reverse field quickly. Or diggers are all over it, though, as their defense was able to reset. Now into the ruck, Montana State trying to decide which way to clear it, and they do it to the right. If Montana State can put one in here, that would put this game away and make it too hard for Colorado School of Mines. Well, to at this back. point, even holding on to possession, right? Exactly. If you can hold on to the ball for another 30 seconds to one minute, there won't be enough time. It's going to be the Good. ball coming out here for the school mines, though, it looks like. We have a not releasing penalty from Montana State, and it's going to be a penalty for Colorado School of Mines. And they have the advantage wide, and it looks like there's a gap in his space. And the ore diggers are off and running. Straight down the middle. Nice cut. That's number 10, Emma Barta, the senior oh, captain. We have a great oh, offload. And a great offload there. She's School of go Mines the looking to bust in, and they do. This game is not over. We, if they can convert here, they make this game a lot more interesting. Now, they have to kick this conversion quick in order to have more time to set up for those two tries. You cannot wait here in this situation. A wicked run there by the captain, Emma Barta, and then a great offload there at the end to her teammate who was able to get in for the try, makes the score after the failed conversion. Montana State 15, School of Mines 5. Now, I would like to see from Colorado School Mines a little bit more pace right here, getting set up and not letting them burn and chew more clock. Getting When you get this ball, just making sure you hold on possession and score. If they can at least score with at least 10 seconds left in the half, they will have that final play to be able to take advantage. But we need them to kind of play a little bit quicker pace right here, being down. Absolutely, so very similar to a sport like soccer. If there is momentum when the referee's hand time runs out, they will allow play to continue until that play is done. If correct? they score with no time left on the clock, the game after conversion is over. But if they score with time remaining, they will have an opportunity for one last final play, as barring any penalties. But it looks like Montana State's going to try to take advantage of this weak channel right here. And that is going to be a costly mistake for Mont Montana State. Throwing the ball out of bounds is going to be a line out for Colorado School of Mines. And if they can score here, this game just got interesting. Line out for the Mines in plus territory. They will have to get this ball in quick as we are under the two minute mark left here in this second half. 
Mine's looking to set up their play right now. Montana State setting their defense. Or diggers out wide to the left. Ball is in, received by the Ore Diggers. Make sure to, they need to make sure they stay in bounds right here. A good offload and a friendly bounce. They could have the advantage here wide and see. They're oh. on the left side. Oh, and they're not able to catch it. And then a boot from Montana State. Very, very heady play there by the Bobcats to get that out of danger. Advantage, it looks like to Montana State, and it looks like the ref is just gonna play on. The referee will just allow it to play. Montana State, once again, trying to do anything, just kick the ball down the field, keep it away from the ore diggers for this last minute. And it looks like that is the match right there. Final score, 15-5, Montana State with the win. Very, very valiant effort there from Colorado School of Mines in the second half but Montana State was able to hold on to that big lead they created in the first half to finish it off. Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting watching the game. I mean, because we had talked about the, the, tight, the, the level of skill that's in this game, and it was really interesting watching because it didn't feel like there was as much as the score might have indicated. I mean, that's a two-score win there for Montana State, but kind of watching the game, it just felt like, you know, Montana State made less mistakes at the end of the day, and, um, you know, we'll see if uh, Colorado School of Mines is able to kind of pick it up for the next game. I think you hit it right on the nose. I personally think this game should have been a lot closer. I think Colorado School of Mines has some things to learn on to take on to their next pool play game. Uh, hopefully they can learn from this for when they do move on to playoffs in seven games later in this season. Simply the end of the story was they made a lot more mistakes than Montana State and Montana State was able to capitalize. Lots of very pleased Bobcat fans in the chat. We have Andrea Moser saying, go Cats, go. Joe Lynn, come on Diggs, dig deep, you're still in this. Andrea Moser once more, go Sam, great job Cats. Denali Smith saying, go Cats, you guys killed it. And Andrea Moser also saying, great job Cats. Thank you everybody for the participation in the YouTube live stream chat. Please keep participating in it. We'll continue to give the shout outs to your players that you want. As we welcome a new member of our broadcast team, Can you introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Jose. I am a reporter at KVOI here in Boise. Just catching some great games out here this evening, or afternoon, I should say. <laughs> yeah, Jose will be joining our squad here for the next couple of games. All of us, you know, aspiring sports broadcasters at some point, hoping to kind of, you know, cut our teeth a little bit here in these 15 Rugby Sevens games that we will be covering today. As we get ready for game number four, this is the University of Idaho versus Willamette University. A little Idaho versus Oregon action. Willamette University located in Salem, Oregon, and the University of Idaho located a couple hours north in Moscow. And we got Willamette trying to get it to the edge here, and it looks like she has the inside support. It and oh, and just, she is taken down. That's going to be a costly mistake for Willamette University. Idaho was able to save that tackle right there. Willamette will be wearing the white and red. The University of Idaho will be wearing their traditional colors of white, black, and gold. We apologize for the two white jerseys, but hopefully the trim on their shoulders will make it a little bit more noticeable for everybody. Now, Jose, I would really like to know, what is your experience with the game of rugby so far? Honestly, besides uh, being a spectator for my friends who competed, uh, this is about as much experience as I have with it. <laughs> Great to hear. Well, welcome to the uh, welcome to rugby in person. Oh, it's a lot better to catch it in person than it is on the screen, that's for sure. It absolutely is. Fast pace action as Idaho is looking to get something going here. But we'll lamb it, we'll take it back. We have a turnover by College of Idaho, and it looks like they have the numbers here to take advantage. Let's see. Seen a little bit of sloppy play to start here, but it looks like they're going to... And number 18 for Willamette's trying to bust down the side. They cannot quite get there, but they clear the ball out of the ruck to the right. One thing Willamette is trying to do is stay away from rucks. As you can see, they're doing a lot of offloads and making sure that they continuously play and not let it be a slugfest with College of Idaho. I think College of Idaho, if it becomes a slugfest game, has the advantage in here. we set up here for the tap and go for the University of Idaho. They'll look to get the ball out of their own defending half and they just may with a good bust through there by number nine for the University of Idaho. Once
once again here. We are on game number four, the second game in pool number three here at the 2024 Fool's Gold Tournament, the third annual Fool's Gold Tournament, hosted by Boise State University and brought to you by the crew here, the lovely crew at University Television Productions. It looks like Willamette's gonna go right, and that scrum half for University of Idaho tackles, makes a great tackle and forcing the turnover right there. It looks like it's gonna be a line out to the University of Idaho. And the University of Idaho's number nine, that is going to be Willow Oswald, the sophomore, will be taking it out. And the ball is received, but... It was not thrown in straight, and that's gonna be a turnover. It looks like it's gonna be a scrum to Willamette here. So once again, on lineouts, the ball must be thrown directly between the two teams. You cannot give your team an advantage by throwing it back. Hence why, as we were talking earlier, both teams lift a player because in theory, they'll both have an equal chance. Equal chance, and if you have that taller, more a little bit lengthier player and you're able to get that ball, you're gonna have that advantage in the lineup. But it is, at the end of the day, all predicated on your hooker throwing it through the pipeline straight. Absolutely, and that is an improper entry into the scrum, so it looks like we will reset. One thing I do like to see how it is, is compared to, you know, 9 a.m. mountain time earlier, a lot of snow in the field, and we're pretty much virtually all gone on the actual playing field. Obviously, we still have some little banks here onto the sidelines, but it's great to see that the snow is starting to go away as the sun comes out. And it may not necessarily be coming through great on all of your screens, but it is starting to brighten up a little bit. And hopefully with it brightening up a little bit, this wind will stop too, as the wind is definitely lowering the wind chill and making it a little chillier down there on the field. Looks like there was a offside by Will Lamont, causing the penalty to college, or University of Idaho, apologies for the... And it looks like that will be a knock there. Seen a lot of action on the right side Four there this, this, uh, this game. Yes, absolutely. It's very nice for us. Easier to see numbers. That's yeah. true. Looks to be as a forward pass. A forward on that. pass, yes. As you but regardless, it will be a scrum to the University of Idaho. The University of Idaho and Willamette here, 0-0 zero to zero over halfway through the first half. Both teams trying to find an edge, but most of this game has oh, been played oh, there in the go. center there third. But as I say oh. that, number 15 for the University of Idaho, that's Lucy McDougal, the junior, breaks free and nobody will get her. She will also place the ball down right between the uprights as we were talking earlier, and it is five to zero, University of Idaho up on Willamette. Now with this game being so close right off the bat, not a whole lot of team, either of these teams making those breakaways until we just saw here. If they can make this conversion right here, this could be a close game of seven to five right here as we're seeing so far as deep, neither defense is giving up right now. We have seen a lot of offensive displays so far in the first few games. Could this possibly be our first defensive slugfest? And the conversion is not made by the University of Idaho, but nonetheless, it will still be U of I five, Willamette zero. Still keeping it close, I see. Absolutely. So with there only being a couple minutes left in this first half, what would you guys want to see with Will Lamont moving forward from what we've seen so far today? I think uh, a little bit more action on the left side. I feel like they're giving a lot of uh, attention to the right, and you can kind of see in both styles of gameplay, and I think that's where U of I is kind of taking the advantage on uh, Will Lamont there. Uh, I'd love to see Will Lamont maintain possession a little more here. So far, you know, they've had some good looks at it, but they haven't been able to maintain possession and steadily move the ball down the field. It's almost as if they're going to score, it will have to be on a breakaway because they're not able to string the passes together necessary to really move the ball. I think you're hitting it both right on the nose. I think they need to look up and utilize the space that the defense is giving them. And if have to, with these poor conditions, is condensing down your attack just a little bit to make those passes easier and just running those great support lines. But it looks like it's gonna be a scrum to University of Idaho. And the Vandals will enter the ball in and that will be picked up by number nine. Oh. That is Willow Oswald once more, and Willow Oswald will go in almost untouched to make it 10 to zero for the University of Idaho. What a score for the last few seconds there. Yes, absolutely massive score there for U of I. The difference between a five to zero lead and possibly a 12 to zero lead as we wait on this conversion is huge. 
looks to be good. And we have a conversion in this game, making it 12 to zero. And the conversion is good, as he just said. And we head into halftime here with our score, the University of Idaho Vandals, 12, Willamette, zero. We are now almost a quarter of the way through our games today. So actually over a quarter of the way through our games today. So congratulations, everyone. As we're getting waved to there from the Northern Colorado team. Great to see them as they're getting ready to go back into action next against Southern Utah. We'll get to see Southern Utah for the first time today. So what would we like to see from Willamette? Being down 12-0, they're still in this game. What would you like to see more from Willamette? Besides, obviously, we're seeing a little bit of sloppy play. There's, we're seeing little spurts of that great line attacking and moving the ball, but then just costly turnovers and penalties costing them right now. What would we like to see better from them in this second half? I think just a better utilization, uh, utilization of that space that they uh, they have great movement. They're just not getting it done in those small, compact areas where they're finding themselves a lot of the time. And I do would like to give a quick shout out to the Boise State men's rugby team coming out and line judging th these teams out here. Both, it's great to see that both these programs are helping out each other in tournaments. Uh, as we can see here, out here we have Luca and Kevin out there helping side judge this these match games. Here. So it looks like we are going to go underway with the second half, Willamette versus the University of Idaho here. And it looks like they are still keeping that positive attitude, giving high fives, keeping the pep in their step, and that's good to see that their heads are not down because they are not out of this game. Well, I think with that much action left to play, anything is possible still. I think it's within reach, and I think that's the nice part about this game is it's not really over till it's over, is it? No, of course not. And if we can just, if we can see a quick try here by University of Idaho right here, it's going to be make this game a lot closer. And one thing I would like to see is scoring under those posts. If they have a kicker who can make two conversions, they only need two tries and the hold off and zero out any points that uh, in the second half. Right, see the second half's underway here. Got a grubber type kick down the middle. And they have some, they have a numbers wide. Let's see if they can get it. Oh, there we go. Stay, they must stay in bounds right here. And Willamette's using the ball very effectively as you, like I mentioned, they could end run to loop here. So Willamette's doing a really good job right now, utilizing the ball and spreading it wide. I'd love to see him just attack up straight a little bit more because right now they're doing a great job spreading the ball, but, oh, and we, it looks like we got a breakaway down the right sideline. It's number nine, Grace Rogers, the sophomore for Willamette. She's gonna score under the goal post to make this 12 to five. This game is not over just yet. And with the following conversion, this could be just a one try game to tie it up. Now with about five and a half to six minutes left in this game, what do we need to see from University of Idaho here to hold on to this small lead they have right here? Well, I think it's uh, also a change in their offense of uh, Willamette there. Was, we saw they were utilizing a lot more space as we were kind of mentioning in the first half. So obviously their plan of attacks looking a little different now. And so I think for University of Idaho, they're gonna have to spread themselves to accommodate that extra uh, field that they're oppo uh, opposing to now. Yes, 100%. And it looked like Willamette's gonna kick off to the University of Idaho. And we will see, and we'll continue with this second half coverage. And it looks like another grubber type kick down the middle. And the University of Idaho is going to take it straight up and pass it off to the left. Oh, well, Lamo with a good tackle there. Setting up a clean ruck and playing some quick ball. Number one, uh, Lexi. And it looks like having an ankle tackle there, and she is not down just yet. It looks like they forgot to bring her all the way down to the ground. And a Willamette contested. Oh, and it looks like we have a not rolling away penalty by Willamette. It's going to be a penalty tap for University of Idaho. If they can tap and go right now and play quickly, this could be a turning point for them. Oh, and she's still going. 
ball is nearly out, out of bounds, but it looks like it's still University of Idaho's ball, and they pick it up off that pass. And she is still up. University of Idaho's playing quick ball here. One thing we need to see from University of Idaho is playing a little bit deeper. They're very flat, which is making it hard for them to pass, but it looks like we have a penalty by University of Idaho. It's gonna be Willamette's ball right here. Can't actually see what the call was on that, but I'm inferring that it was a not rolling away call, and they're just gonna tap and go run straight up. I like the aggression here that Will Amos uh, coming out with on the, the second possession here. Ball nearly knocked on forward, but luckily it goes and falls backwards here. Will Amos still looks like to have possession. Diving into the rock by University of Idaho. That's going to be a dangerous penalty right there. And they're just going to tap and go immediately, trying to catch them off guard. Oh, it looks like she was trying to make that pass a little bit sooner, but it just wasn't there, unfortunately. But we have number 17, Eliquin Johnson trying to loop loop around to try to make a play there. But it looks like it's going to be knocked on by Willamette and it's going to be scrummed to the University of Idaho. So this is going to so Jose, this is going to be a big scrum from University of Idaho. Besides holding on to the ball and keeping possession, what would you like to see them do here on attack and just try to waste as much you know time as possible in the second half to secure this win? I think uh, I think if they utilize, obviously spreading themselves a little bit wider, uh, making the opposition there kind of uh, spread themselves a little thin, and maybe even just play a little bit slower so that way they have more possession with the ball, but still you know protecting it. I think it'll play in their advantage greatly here as they try to eat up some time on the clock. Unfortunate knock on. Looks like that loop, they unintentional loop they did could have been a the nail in the coffin, but unfortunately it does bounce a little bit forward. It's going to be a scrum to Willamette here. And I mean, with uh, two and a half minutes left, I think it's still anybody's game. So let's see what happens as things develop here. It takes just one missed tackle here, or one good support line to secure that try. But we do have to keep in mind that University of Idaho has made their conversion. So even if Willamette scores a try right here, they're going to have to kick that conversion to just tie. If not, it's going to be another possession. But it looks like we have an offsides call by University of Idaho. It's going to be a penalty tap for Willamette. They're just going to go, and they have the numbers wide. Let's see if they're able to utilize it. Great pass. And it looks like we have a ruck, contested ruck here on the left sideline. And the, the call is going to, looks like it's going to be from, it's going to be Idaho's pe penalty. I can't make out what the call was from the ref, uh, but it looks, it's still going to be University of Idaho's ball right here. And they're going to take advantage and they're going wide with it right off the bat. Oh, it's loose there. So University of Idaho is taking the ball out here and is smothered by Willamette here. And but University of Idaho is kind of playing a little bit slow right here, but they looks like they found a crease. They just need to maintain possession there with there being less than two minutes to go in this match. And Willamette steals the ball and just kind of sticks out of the rock. Oh, and she has a breakaway. She's going to go down all the way down, and she looks to be gone, making this a 12 to 10 game. University of Idaho only up by two. But key thing here, it's going to be that kick as we see here. If they make this kick, it's a tight ball game and we could see it being the next score wins, but we'll have to see how this conversion attempt goes in favor of Willamette. And unfortunately, it is a failed conversion, making it 12-10. So with, a, and unfortunately, that's the game. That failed conversion is gonna be the nail in the coffin for them, making it University of Idaho 12 to Willamette 10. Jose, well, with our next matchup here, we have the University of Northern Colorado, Colorado who lost in their first match, play, and they're facing off against Southern Utah. What would we like to see from them in their bounce back game? I think what we would like to see is just a little bit more uh, aggression from them. I think the first game it was probably just getting all the all the jitters loose, and along with that, they still had a lot of they're still dealing with a lot of the, the early snow that was coming on uh, from the field when we first originally had started this morning. So. I think for them a big, big uh, thing that'll help them out a lot is just being able to attack and then just being able to maintain a good presence of what's going on in this next matchup. 
Yeah, definitely going to be a big matchup for the University of Northern Colorado and Southern Utah's first matchup of the day. So I'm excited to see what Southern Utah's able to come up with. But with University of Northern Colorado having that first game under their belt, having the jitters kind of kicked out of their system, it's excited to see what kind of unfolds here. We had the University of Northern Colorado in the black and gold jerseys, as you see here in Southern Utah, in the red and black. So I'm very excited to see uh, what Colorado produces in this matchup. Just to, you know, obviously they got the first game out of the way and then, you know, they're a little bit more warmed up probably, but at the same time too, uh, Utah there did have a little bit more chance to kind of wake themselves up as they waited for that first matchup of the afternoon. Yeah. A little fun fact about Southern Utah is actually in the first, this is the third annual Fool's Gold Tournament, the first one dating back to 2022. Southern Utah actually took third place in the women's division in the first annual Fool's School Tournament. So they've had some success here in Boise, Idaho for this Fool's School Tournament. Let's see if it can translate here today. If they win here, their game against Boise State will come down to whoever wins that match and will go to the championship uh, against the Pool B who could, as of right now, it's still anyone's game. You still have Boise State B here to play as well. And it looks like we are all set for game five here. Southern Utah kicks off to Northern Colorado. Southern Utah playing their first game. Northern Colorado looking to score their first points of this 2024 edition of the Fool's Gold Tournament. And immediately, Southern Utah busting down the middle. That's number six, Malia Cronquist, the junior. Southern like Utah into the ruck, and they exit it out to the right cleanly to number four. Southern Utah still does have an advantage right here. The ref hasn't called it off just yet, but it looks like they're taking full advantage of that. Northern Colorado doing a good job there hanging on, but they end up letting go. And a good hit there, shoulder to face. What a connection, that one can't feel good. They have some space here wide. Let's see if they're able to utilize it. And it looks like she's gonna take it wide, number not, uh, four. I've That's made. number four, who I do not have in my program. I'm so sorry about that. But number four will score the first try of the game for Southern Utah and put them up five to zero. Just one minute into this game. And she will attempt a conversion. The conversion will be no good, keeping it at five to zero. Southern Utah Thunderbirds out of Cedar City, Utah, up on the Northern Colorado Bears of Greeley. As you can see today, conversion, like we mentioned before, conversions are gonna be a huge importance in today's game. They are gonna be, you saw the University of Idaho versus Willamette. It was, at the end of the day, it was a team that was able to make a conversion. It's gonna be the, it was a deal breaker giving the University of Idaho a win. Because right now, as it stands, University of Idaho and Western Oregon are the front runners for that small, that pool C division. Yes, they are. And that kick dribbles down. It's picked up by Northern Colorado. That's number eight, Ashlyn Mast, the freshman from Castle Rock. The Bears go down into the ruck and it's picked out cleanly. Ooh, with a massive tackle right there. Very, very good tackle. But the Bears maintain possession. They're swinging it out to the right, trying to take advantage of that open side of the field. And uh-oh, we may have a breakaway here. The Bears off on the run, trying to get their first points of fool's gold. But we have number four from Southern Utah coming all the way. She's starting number to Number four of Southern feet. Utah is taking a great, great angle, and she's able to take her down. Try saving tackle right there. Let's see if Northern Colorado is able to capitalize on that huge line break. Northern Colorado looking to maintain that momentum they have from earlier. They're in the attacking third inching closer and closer to their first points of this tournament. And that was the kind of uh, play style I was uh, trying to get at earlier, was if, if it could really get after it right there, I think it'll make all the difference in there. Absolutely, today. we've got a ball that's picked up and it looks like Northern Colorado Score. will have their first try of the tournament, tying it at five to five. Northern Colorado, after the blowout loss to Boise State in the first, has no quit in them. And after going down five to zero immediately, they're able to bounce back and draw it even halfway through this first half. Love yeah. to see the effort there. Yes. That's yeah. wonderful. If University of Northern Colorado wins in this game and Southern Utah actually beats Boise State A, it sets up an interesting, interesting tiebreaker because it's going to come down to points scored at that point since we're having three-way ties. So if Northern Colorado can pull this game out, it's going to be up to Boise State not only winning against Southern Utah, but scoring even more points. Because at the end of the day, what's going to come down to is if we can get that three-way tie, is in your victory, scoring more points. That's gonna be the key for today. Absolutely. So, 
as we readjust our broadcasting booth here as the drizzle starts to fall. Let's just all be thankful that it's not more snow. We have a five to five game halfway through the first half between the Northern Colorado Bears and the Southern Utah Thunderbirds. A very even contest so far. It looked like Southern Utah had the early advantage and Northern Colorado is able to fight back. Ball picked up there by Southern Utah as they start their attack. Oh, oh and it's immediately oh. stripped away there by the Bears. That looks to be Genevieve Big G Hankins, the junior out of Yorkville, Illinois, the only one with any rugby experience on this team. Colorado immediately in the attacking half and looking to take their first lead. Oh, with another good tackle there from uh, Utah. Another good tackle there from Utah. Bears press on. Utah very, very stingy. And they're just gonna pick and jam and eat their way through, trying to offload here on the five meter line. They're only about two or three meters away. They, all they have to do is just keep very, doing these very pick close. and jams. Here we go. Carrying defenders is Northern Colorado. They're two, three meters away at most. One meter at most now, and did they get over? They did. They, they did, did get over. What a truck for number one. That's gonna be a great try for their first lead of the tournament for the Bears in this. It's gonna be 10-5, and if they can get this conversion right here, it's a two-possession lead. Southern Utah went from looking great in the first minute to now all of a sudden down five. That's how fast it can happen in Rugby Sevens, folks. Rebecca and Justin Lavelle, thank you so much. They say they're very impressed with the announcers and the quality of the broadcast. That is a testament to our entire team. Good job, everybody. Very, very cold and windy day up here. All yeah. of us are fighting through the elements. And it looks like the uh, the rain's also try trying to trickle into uh, our broadcast here as well. So. Yes, all my sheets are starting to get wet. Was worried this would happen here. We also have a Go Gabs, number three for Northern Colorado from the Cyan's family. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong, but Go Gabs nonetheless. We'll reset here, and Big G will boot it down to Southern Utah, looking to tie this one up. Southern Utah immediately going into the teeth of that Northern Colorado defense. They try to get an offload, but it's intercepted there by number four, that Charlotte Stuck. Northern Colorado, one thing they haven't, they didn't do well in the first game, that they're doing better in the second game is playing fast and quick ball. And that's what we need to see with them more, is when they played that quick ball, they were able to push that game line and make advances during the field. And actually, we're minimizing their penalties and turnovers while playing a little bit faster. Absolutely. And I think another thing we can admire about their work on this game is that they have just a better control of the ball there. And they're, not, they're not losing it as consistent as they were in that first game. They have they have a player wide, in, but it looks like they're, she's going to run diagonal with the pitch. A great tackle by Southern Utah right there. Looking to reverse field now. They've got players out to the left. Let's see if they can get formation to do it. Friendly bounce there, and it looks like Northern Colorado has a bit of a lane. But once again, Southern Utah, they may be slightly undersized compared to Northern Colorado, but they always have one or two players around the ball ready to throw multiple people at it. Northern Colorado still seven to eight meters away. Very, very close. They get it, and they're trying to go on the left. But once again, Southern Utah just denying them. It seems like Northern Colorado is having no issue getting within 10 meters, but once they get within 10 meters, the Thunderbirds are really making them work for it. The big thing is they need to attack the game line. Right now, they're kind of catching the ball at a slow pace. Oh, here we go. We have a runaway. Oh, Southern ahead. Utah. I don't know if anybody's going to be able to get them. Number three, that's Gab Science. Can she track her down, make her folks proud? She's starting to lose a little bit of she steam. She's starting here, to lose yo. a little bit of steam. Let's see if Gabs can get her. And she cannot, but she needs to ground oh, it, and she may have she, gone out of the back. That's going to oh. be no try, and that's going to be that's going to be a costly by costly mistake by Southern Utah not tapping the ball in before that try line. So it looks going to be a no good. Wait. Let's see what the rep, sir, here is calling. I'm yeah, he may have given her the try for it, as it looks like, but I'm not, no. It looks like it is halftime. There is no try there. That is an unfortunate mistake, which would have tied this game up right here. When you got, when you enter in that try zone, you just need to fall down if you have somebody on their back, back hip like that. Absolutely, and also, you know, the lineage out here is confusing, but you have to be aware of where you are on the field. 
it was a long, long run for that player. I mean, it's about a 50 to 60 yard jaunt. But once you get to the end, you got to keep your eye on those pylons on the side to understand where your line is that you need to touch past. And for our first time listeners, how rugby works is unlike football and other sports, is once you enter that try zone, you actually have to press and tap down the ball firmly with possession into the dry, try zone. The reason being for that is they usually back up at least 10 meters for that conversion kick from where you tap down the ball. And if you fail to tap down the ball, there's no points until you do it. So if you were technically a live ball player while you're still in that try zone if you have yet to tap it down firmly. Well, the missed opportunity, unfortunately, leaves the game at 10 to 5. The Northern Colorado Bears with the advantage over the Southern Utah Thunderbirds. We will take a second once again to remind all those joining the live stream to participate in the chat. We love all the interactions. We love seeing that there is a ton of Western Oregon, Montana State, Northern Colorado fans out there. I'm Riley, and this is my broadcasting team here. It's been a little rotating door, people. We've got Alton way down there working a camera now. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. We are University Television Productions. Our distributor is Boise State Television, and we are here covering the third iteration of the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Tournament from a rain turning into snow, Boise, Idaho. Starting to get cold here, starting to see some grimaces up in the broadcasting booth, but <laughs> we will charge on no matter what. We are... As I check my sheet to make sure I'm doing my math right, five games into a 15-game set, 33% of the way, folks. We're doing great. May have lost a couple of toes here on the way, but you know, it's worth it. It's a great day. You know, unexpected weather for Idaho weather in April of all times. I believe uh, the saying goes, we're in our third winter now out yeah. here. That's yeah. great to hear. I can't wait for the fourth one as well. Yeah, we go first winter to fourth summer, because we'll have a weird warm spell in December. And then we'll go into second winter. First spring happens somewhere around there. And then we all kind of lose track and we start making it up as we go along, right? I mean, <laughs> I think that's the only way to do it here in Idaho. You grow up out here? Yeah. 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 So uh, originally I was born in Texas. So uh, way more consistency out there, I feel like. But over here, uh, it's always, you know, it's always good to be on your toes, I guess, right? <laughs> Down in Texas, they got that golf ball sized hail. Oh, yeah. that's no joke. Yeah, see, uh, I'm very grateful that uh, I didn't have to encounter that as uh, consistent as some of the other Texans out there, but, uh, you know, I find it in a different form out here in Boise, so. Oh, sure, there's bad weather everywhere, isn't there? And as we get ready here to start the second half, just waiting on a ball by the looks of it. Northern Colorado looking to secure their first victory and make pool one very, very interesting. 10 to five, bears over the Thunderbirds here as we get ready to go. A good amount of fans out in the crowd today. It makes me happy to see, including somebody in the back right there who's got a whole rain tent. Look at that. They got the little ponchos on the side and everything. Hey, Very yeah, prepared. <laughs> and Southern Utah immediately on the break. Just like oh, in the wow. first half when they scored in the first minute, they're looking to do the same in the second half. Oh, oh she, no, she drops the ball, and it'll be a knock back to Northern Colorado. <laughs> Two big missed opportunities within 30 seconds of game time, one at the end of the first half and one at the beginning of the second half for the Thunderbirds. They are their own worst enemy at the moment. They are currently just shooting themselves in the foot. The score should be, as of right now, 15 to 10. They're they're playing great defense, just some very, very unfortunate mistakes. This game is still not over. They have the capability to make those big explosive plays, but the key thing is capitalizing on those and not letting the slippery and poor conditions change that. They're still in this, and if they, like I said earlier, if they win this, if they win this game, it comes down to that game. Last pool A game between Boise State A and Southern Utah. You may, uh, you may see a lot of breakaways here, folks, but I am learning slowly today that rugby truly is a game of attrition with each step mattering more than the last. Northern Colorado slowly kind of taking that ball up, just itching and chewing away at that field, but they have some space on the right side. It looks like they have a three-on-one setup. They're just continuously attacking that inside. Yes, they are. They're looking to just bully Southern Utah who has slightly less size than them out of the way. Looks like we have a penalty, offsides penalty by Northern Colorado. It's going to be Lent. Southern Utah. Touch and go, of... Southern Utah. Lots of teams today, I get it. Southern Utah into the attacking third. Southern Utah trying to get something. They're trying to get it out to space where they can work a little bit better. Number four around the right side for the Thunderbirds. Jim's Northern Colorado doing a good job of pursuing and a nice little layoff there. Southern Utah still on the right side. 
Oh, Will Genevieve Hankins be able to track her down? She almost she's close. gets it. There's a great try saving tackle right there. Oh. She can't be more than a meter away, but the referee now oh. blows the whistle. It looks like it was some kind of offsides penalty by the looks of it, and they're just going to tap and go. A quick tap and go for the Thunderbirds. It it's looks like they're in. Can they touch? Number four from some of the Utah needs to just take down, take the just possession. Just get down, get down, get uh, down, and instead it will be a line out. See, that's another costly mistake by Southern Utah. In that case, I know they were trying to maybe create a mall and tap it in, but in that, you have that spacing and numbers wide. Take the possession, take your losses there. You're only still two meters away. It's not, you don't have multiple downs. You have as long as you need to to get in. In that case, just play it safe, keep possession go down and set up for another attacking phase. So now we will see a rare line out from within two meters of the touch line here, of the try line. Let's see if they can get it in cleanly here. And just a quick toss there for Northern Colorado, but it will be reset. Northern Colorado will retry that line out. Or rather Southern Utah will have an opportunity. Let's see if they can take advantage of being so close to tying up this ball game here as we quickly approach the halfway mark of the second half here. Southern Utah in their first game looking for their first victory of the tournament. Northern Colorado also looking for their first victory of the tournament. A very competitive and fun game so far as that's into number two for Southern Utah and she is dragged down by a whole host of bears. And now around the left side is Southern Utah. Can they get in? Try. And that is a try. It is awarded by the referee in Southern Utah. Ties it up at 10 apiece here with roughly three minutes left to go in the second half. See, that was a great job of capitalizing, holding on to possession, and just attacking forward. Number four from Southern Utah sh showing that she, how she has become a dominant player in this game. But what we need to see from Southern Utah to come out on top is with it now looks to be a tied ball game right now. Oh, it looks... Oh, oh, looks like there's yep. a failed conversion here. It's going to be tied with about a little less than three minutes left to go in this game. I think Southern Utah has the ability to lead away with this game, but is are they going to make that another costly mistake that's going to bite them in the end? And on a personal note, with the score being so close, so near the end of the game, I'm excited to possibly see that sudden death overtime we were talking about earlier. That is if neither of these teams can get it in as we had a little swing and a miss there on that kick, so we will reset. So with the ball not going 10 meters off the kick, what's gonna happen is typically teams have two choices to pick from. They can either, it looks like they're gonna be doing a tap and go penalty from the 50 in sevens, and they're just, she's gonna just take it straight up. Straight up, running into two Thunderbirds. It's laid off to Genevieve. Hankins. And they're just going to do a Now the Bears go. just looking to bully Southern Utah. Dragging defenders. Two, three Thunderbirds draped over her. A clear toss out of the ruck to the right. Northern Colorado slowly, slowly getting closer towards the try line. Hankins passes off to the left. Northern Colorado looking for real estate, but Southern Utah is holding their line good, and that will be a knock advantage play to Southern Utah, who oh, is trying oh. to get around the edge. It looks like there's a little bit of hair pulling in yeah. the game of rugby. And what do I may have to say is technically legal in rugby because it is therefore technically a part of the jersey. It is could be dangerous, so that's why we recommend people with longer hairs to put it up in some kind of bun or even tuck it into your jersey because it is a part of the jersey if you choose to have it that long. That goes for men's and women's rugby. Well, I, if I was playing rugby, I would keep my hair tight and short. It is to a technically an unspoken rule not to pull on the hair, as it one could obviously be very painful. But if something were to accidentally grab a hold of, it is technically illegal as long as it's not malicious. Absolutely. And Southern Utah will come up with that line out in there, forcing their way down the left side. A nice little layoff there, but a whistle by the referee. It looks like she... It looks like it's going to be a penalty tap for Southern Utah. Penalty tap and go there for number 19 from Southern Utah. That is, I believe, Rachel Nebaker, the sophomore. 
And with only a couple of seconds to go, I mean, I'm very curious to see what we can make happen or if we're going to have to go into that sudden death that you guys mentioned earlier. Yeah, so we'll have a touch and go there for Northern Colorado. And if they can maintain possession for just a little bit here, I imagine the referee will be blowing his whistle soon. Northern Colorado, though, they're not ready to settle for overtime just yet as Genevieve Hankins is dragging down, drugged down rather. She's got the ball back now, forcing her way left, taken down again by a Southern Utah defender. Southern Utah defender jumps over. Wow, great play there. And it looks like it's going to be Southern Utah's ball. They have space wide right if they, they can. They have space wide right, and oh, they might take advantage of it. This could be the name oh, of the Oh, this conference. could be a buzzer beater. And they get the ball Ooh, down this time. Southern Number Utah four the avenges done. their earlier mistake at the end of the first half by putting the ball down right as time expires, and that should be it. Now, with this conversion, as long as there's no time left, that is going to be the game. And this sets up a very, very important Pool A matchup between Southern Utah and Boise State A, which is going to determine who's going to be in the championship round for the Pools Gold. And that is the game. Southern Utah comes out victorious. Even with all the errors they had throughout the game, they were still able to persevere, and that's a tribute to those players. But what are some other key takeaways from this game received from Southern Utah? Well, I mean, first and foremost, an absolute heartbreaker there for Northern Colorado. Looking for their first big win in a qualifying tournament. They had the lead there, but weren't able to pull it out. Southern Utah, however, they were able to overcome those mistakes like we were saying earlier, and they were able to put together a very nice last two or three minutes there to pull it out. Northern Colorado will be almost done for the day. They will most likely be playing the 210 Pool 1 number 3 versus Pool 2 number 3 game. Southern Utah, on the other hand, will be looking forward to their 1240 matchup against the Boise State A team, who we saw in action earlier beat down on Northern Colorado in the first game. Very excited to see what happens as all of a sudden Pool A is very interesting as we now pivot back towards Pool C, or Pool 3 rather, where we will have the College of Idaho, who previously lost to Western Oregon, taking on the University of Idaho, who we just saw beat Willamette University by the score of 12 to 10. So a little inter-Idaho battle here and between the university and the college. And I apologize in advance. We got too many Idahos coming out here and playing, make it them a little College of Idaho, University of Idaho, make it a little mixed up, but, and I do, and as we have here, we have College of Idaho in the white and purple and University of Idaho in the white and black. So it's gonna be interesting. We may see a pass or two accidentally get tossed to the wrong white jersey in this game. And it also looks like uh, the sun's kind of creeping out too, so maybe it'll help uh, with the conditions out there. And I can only imagine what the players feel like on the field right now as we're up here in the booth. So it'll make it for a great matchup, that's for sure. It is great with the warm, uh, warmer weather heating up and with them running around, getting the blood flowing and everything like that, being able to naturally heat their bodies up. And it looks like we have a knock on by University of Idaho. And it's gonna be called Jill Idaho's ball today. Looks like College Vida is playing a little bit slower game rather than a little contestion at the Rock. And they're going to go right with it. It looks like number 14 from College Vida has some speed. And she's going to take it all the way. And that's going to be a try for College of Idaho. That is an I seal Epa. Salipa Swide, a freshman for the College of Idaho, takes it in to make it 5 to 0. It's a great start for the College of Idaho. Coming off that first round loss to Western Oregon, because who we originally thought, you know, University of Idaho was going to be that second team compared to Western, Western Oregon, but it looks like that might not be the case. So what would you want to see? So we had College of Idaho losing that first game, University of Idaho winning their first game in close fashion to Willamette. What do we like to see from the University of Idaho in this in this matchup right here? I was going to say, I think what worked for them really well in the first game was able to have the protection and along with the coverage of spreading themselves a little thinner when the defense was uh, obviously being a lot more elaborate. Um, for the College of Idaho, I think for them it's going to be an aggressive play style that's going to get the job done. We just saw them score that first try of the game. 
and I'd like to see a lot more of that from them and see what they can make happen. Looks like University of Idaho is taking advantage of the kickoff and has a little break breakaway on the sideline. She stays in bounds. She looks and makes a great offload to and another group. Oh, she just takes it down. It looks like right here. I, and they're just going to pick and go from that and just keep offloading, which seems to be working for them. College of Idaho struggles to support defense. So when somebody's making that tackle and there's a support line coming, we don't see that second or third tackler coming in. That's so far costing them. And it looks like there's a penalty for University of Idaho. And they're just going to tap and go and take it straight on. There we go. And they go with the pitch. And they're right there on the left side of the field. And they're, you know. It looks like we have a penalty here. It looks like a yellow card has been dished out. And I'm trying to make out the number, but it looks like it's going to be I think it's number four, 14 for Salipa Swap. We just had that try earlier, so it's definitely going to hurt the College of Idaho right here. And it looks like University of Idaho is going to take advantage and spin it wide. Let's see what happens here. And it's going to look like number one for Uni uh, University of Idaho, Lexi. Farhage, the senior, scores tying up this matchup between the Idaho teams here. And we can see already with two minutes into the, or three minutes into the uh, the first half here, they're already a tie game. And uh, it's going to be very interesting how their uh, dynamics will change over the next few minutes as well. And that is a failed conversion by the University of Idaho, keeping the score at five even right now. I think we're starting to see a little bit of that stamina and endurance start playing effect as it, it may only be seven minute halves. It's basically a seven minute full on sprint for each half. And that can may not sound too hard from just saying it, but on the field as a former player myself, that is extremely tiring no matter how fit and shape you are. Endurance and stamina is going to play a huge factor in this day's tournament with teams playing three to four games in total. And it looks like the startup University of Idaho kicked a rubber down the middle on the kickoff. And College of Idaho is going to take advantage by going right. And they found a seam. But it looks like we have a penalty here. And it looks to possibly have been a forward pass by the College of Idaho. And it's going to be a scrum to the University of Idaho. So with only uh, six players for College of Idaho, what would you advise University of Idaho to do to maintain them and suppress them from scoring in this uh, possession? big thing is just playing good defense here and not worried about you can give up some meters in space let him get him wide let him but it looks like they're letting the yellow card may be off it looks like already i i don't know if it was two minutes already but it looks like that yellow card is back onto the field so that's no longer in play <laughs> let's see here they're getting for the scrum and Looks like University of Idaho will maintain possession for that moment there. They're going to go wide right, and it looks like they have an advantage. Oh, but they knock it on. It's going to be advantage, and it looks like we're going to have a scrum down to College of Idaho at this 5-5 five to five contest right now. So one thing I'm seeing from College of Idaho right here is they have, I think, a slight speed advantage with number 14. Oh, uh, Salipa Sway. Yes, she is very fast, as we saw in that first try. And a big thing for College of Idaho is it taking advantage of that. Spinning the ball out wide, getting to the ball to her in open space, and then running the support lines for her in the case that she gets tackled. And I have a feeling that's what they're going to look for right here. And a great little offload. Oh, looks like they missed the pass there. And they're just going to play the safe way. And it looks like the penalty... We have a penalty for College of Idaho diving into the ruck. It's going to be a penalty tap to University of Idaho, and they have these numbers wide. Are they going to utilize it? They offload it, but a College of Idaho is swarming over to into the tackle, makes it within five meters of the try line, but they pick it up, and it's going to be a try for the University of Idaho. That's going to bring the score to 10 to 5, and with a very, very far conversion kick. With the way conversion kicks have been going in this weather today, I'm not too optimistic that it's going to be converted here, but hey, anything can happen here today. Man, I think we've learned the importance of those conversion kicks as we've seen one be, you know, one game be dictated for the University of two points, so. Those are two extra points will, I promise you this, will make a difference in a game later, later on in the future, because right now it comes down to who's just scoring more tries. So key point is when you can, giving your kicker the best opportunity to kick those conversions by just making sure the tap in the middle of the field. 
the middle of the tri zone. Pardon me. But it looks like University of Idaho is going to kick off. And what would we need to see from College of Idaho here to limit some of those mistakes they've been making? And it looks like they're just College of Idaho is going to take it up. And that lo oh looks like a little bit of obstruction by College of Idaho, but a ref's not going to play, call it and let him play on. It's University of Idaho's ball right there, and they're hopefully going to take advantage of this short field position. And let's see here. Oh, and it looks like. Looks like oh, number one from University of Idaho is going to be Lexi Verhage, the senior and captain, going to score, bringing it to 15-5. Now they're up by two possessions here. There's a, University of Idaho, we're starting to see pull away, and we first thought maybe this game was going to be a little bit closer, but it looks like University of Idaho is going to be taking advantage of that size and experience that they have to their advantage, and it looks like going off to the next kickoff. It's going to be 15 to 5 with the failed conversion. So what would you recommend if you're a College of Idaho in this position as we've seen how the last few possessions of their game has gone? Well, it looks at, so now with it being halftime by the looks of it, big thing for them is give it to their speed on the edge. If they're, they're not as big as the University of Idaho team, University of Idaho team has a little bit more experience is getting it to your speed on the edge. We saw what how fast they can be and score and be that explosive. And I think a problem with them is University of Idaho is coming up really fast, really hard, and taking away the space before they can dish it out to the outside. Just as a reminder to those now joining the stream, we are University Television Productions, and we are here live broadcasting the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Tournament hosted by Boise State University here at the Lincoln Intramural Fuel Fields. rather. We've got some people in the comments. We've got Ozzy Coriel saying, Go Bears. We've got Kayla H saying, Great Announcing. And we've got Kyle Cockle saying, This announcing is fantastic. A++++. Wow, what good people. Yeah, we <laughs> greatly appreciate all the all the great compliments, you know, especially since I've lost two or three toes at this point, but <laughs> we'll greatly appreciate it. And thank you guys for all tuning in. We uh, appreciate it supporting women's rugby here in the great state of Idaho. Yeah, this is a very, very neat opportunity for everybody involved. I had the chance to personally reach out to uh, some of the girls involved with these teams and talk to them, and all of them expressed their excitement for having a live stream opportunity for their people back in their respective hometowns and their families, wherever they are, to watch this. And I actually have an interesting fact for you guys about Idaho. Did you know that Idaho has the most high school and lower players, so all basically 18 and under high school rugby players, male and female, per capita compared to any other state in the entire country. Oh, Interesting. Wow. What do you reckon that is because of? Well, rugby is just uh, growing more and more out here in the western part of the United States. And with Idaho not having the biggest population already, there's already been a huge influx of rugby players growing in. You know, rugby's only been in here in the Treasure Valley for a short period of time, but it is growing rapidly. We have ages from fifth grade all the way up to that high school level. And we even have won Rocky Mountain a few years ago, winning a national championship for the state of Idaho. Now, I was not the coach at that I time. I was gonna say a little pat on the back <laughs> there, I was huh? not the coach at the time <laughs> of that, but they do have, uh, you know, Idaho State you know, Idaho has one national champion under their belt. For all of you just joining, our analyst, Kyle Curry, the man with the magical voice, is the head coach of the Rocky Mountain High School Boys Varsity Team, Rocky Mountain located just about 15, 20 minutes from where we are currently. As we get started here in the second half, we have the University of Idaho leading the College of Idaho in the Inter-Idaho battle, 15 to 5, 30 seconds into this second half. College of Idaho started off the scoring in the first half with Salipa Swai running down the right side, but the University of Idaho responded very quickly with three tries in the last six minutes of the first half to take this 15 to 5 lead. And I think uh, one thing's important is uh, obviously we've seen a lot of games just really pick up in the last few minutes of the second half. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen here as the next few possessions over the next uh, few minutes as well in this game. Absolutely. We have a line out now for the Vandals. Both players go flying into the air and it is tapped back to the Yotes. The Yotes into the ruck. 
the Vandals are doing a great job coming up on defense and eliminating and that space. But it looks here like here comes a little breakaway for the Yokes. Let's see if they can make she, this a one score game. Support on a her left hand side. Gaining quickly. Let's see if she sees her support. She's going to try to do it herself. Oh, and she's just tripped up. But let's see if but, she can get back up. Get oh, it down. She and it. And she lost it. Are they going to call that a knock? I think it was a knock forward. Are it, they? It no is try. no try. try. They were going to call that a knock. She dropped it before she was able to make solid contact with the ground. I have one key thing to keep in mind for rugby is if you are tackled, but you are not being pressed down by another player, no other posing person is on top of you or touching you, you can actually release the ball and pick it back up. Unlike other sports like, you know, football, for example, if you get tackled, you're down right there. But in the game of rugby, if you get tackled and no one's touching you, you just release the ball and pick it right back up. I'm sorry, folks. It looks like we are mistaken. The try was actually granted to the Yotes. Oh. It looks like the referee took mercy. And so with that and the conversion that was not converted, it is going to be Yotes 10, University of Idaho, the Vandals 15. Well, it's great for the Yotes there because we can see how explosive they were on that last play. So hopefully that'll, that momentum will spark them to be able to get more tries and find themselves in an opportunity to at least tie up the game for the next few minutes. Yeah, there's still plenty of time left to go. The college... College of Idaho, well, the Yotes, I should say, are going to have plenty of time and opportunity to not only score, but get that conversion. They can end it right there. Look for them to get it out to the wing where all their speed is kept. James McGeady in the chat says, big time players make big time plays. Shout out Bridget Crowley. Special teams, special players. <laughs> special plays. There you go, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you were talking about. I got the reference. You know too, don't you? <laughs> And the Yotes will kick off here, trailing 10 to 15. We are reaching the halfway oh. point here of the second half, and I don't believe that kick went 10 meters. But I don't believe it was touched by the universe, by the Vandals as well. I'm kind of surprised that the Yotes have possession of the ball there, but it caught, could costly mistake. Well, the Vandals take it right back, so it doesn't matter nonetheless. Oh, a great layoff there as a Vandal takes a big hit, and there is a penalty called. It looks like it's going to be, I think, if I'm not mistaken, she's calling a forward pass. Personally, I thought the call was going to be hands in the ruck, but it do, regardless, it is going to be the Yotes ball here with a scrum middle. And let's see what they do here. It looks like they're going to overload that right side, or I'm mistaken, they're going to play a split game here. All right. And as they line up for the scrum here around midfield, what are the Yotes going to have to do to get this last try to tie the ball game up? They're going to need to give it to number 14 right here, right now. She has speed, and it looks like that's what they're trying to do, if they can just offload it here. But, oh, that's a great poach by, by the Vandals, and they're going to take full advantage of the lack of support that we are seeing from the, from the Yotes. Number 14 currently actually not in the game for the College of Idaho. Very interesting decision going on here as the Vandals now pushing. Number one for the Vandals, that's Lexi Verhage. She's making her run, ball gets knocked loose. Picked up and into the ruck we go. And it's the Yotes possession right here. They're taking their time a little bit right now. And great forward ball by number 11 from the Yotes. Number 11 for the Yotes, that is Crystal Araujo. We apologize if we mispronounce any your, any first or last names. I have all my phonetic spellings here, but I didn't do myself a ton of favors last night when I was doing them. So we have a great little up upline, but... Into you know, the ruck now here. The Vandals really getting some pressure and making it hard for the Yotes to get out. But number three for the Yotes does make it out, and that is Ollie Schneider, the freshman. Back into the ruck again we go here. Yotes deciding which way to go with it, and they go right. That could be a cut. Oh, we got a break. Uh, we have a little bit of a breakaway here. I don't Number think 11 it, moving quickly. Oh, we got some speed from the. Oh, uh, we do have some speed in. coming oh, from the, the other side. Arm. Oh, a vicious stiff arm. She's but still, she's able to take her down. Oh, and it's a oh, pick. quick pick pickup. Up. She's going to. And that's going to be Confirm a try. Confirm the try. And that is number 18 for the College of Idaho, Gracie Castillo, the senior, junior rather, tying it up at 15 apiece with one minute left to go in this Battle of Idaho. 
we could see if there's a failed conversion right here we could see a overtime here situation and sudden death rules would apply first point scored wins the game but we still have a minute left to play and anything can happen here let's see what happens with this conversion number four for the yotes that's lily haney lines up to take this the freshman can put her team up and the conversion is no good leaving it at 15 apiece with 45 seconds and running left here now, in the game of sevens, typically you just do a drop kick for those conversions. But when you're in situations like this, you still have 30 seconds, having someone on the sideline ready with a tee to set up to give yourself a better shot at making those conversions when you're in these tight ball game situations is something that is very crucial that I think teams should be aware of in the future when if they have a tight game and there's no time left, it's bringing that tee out to just end the game right there and then. Absolutely. Yotes definitely taking their time here to reset. They could possibly be very pleased with going into sudden death overtime, it looks like. With this time left in the game, one costly mistake could be the nail in the coffin. And the ball is dribbling around in Idaho's defensive territory, and they're able to pick it up. Let's see if they can mount one last charge here before oh. the clock runs out. And oh, it looks like they're doing it. Oh, the Vandals streaking down the sideline. Willow Oswald Stiff arm. finally grabbed. Oh, there's a penalty, it looks like. Let's see what the call is here. And the penalty, maybe a high tackle? It looks like it's going to be, looks like they. it was a malicious hair pulled, and they're going to do a penalty tap. And that's kind of where, if it's accidental, you can kind of get away with it. But it looks like she grabbed and pulled down right there. So that's going to be a tap and go for the... Uh, for the Vandals, and they're going to take full advantage of that penalty. Vandals about five meters away now, very quickly closing in. Can they get in here? It's the captain. Can she get the ball down? She does. And the Vandals take the lead as time expires. Two games in a row it's happened now. We're having a lot of exciting games the further we go along, and, nothing, and I do expect more of these type of situation games to unfold, and I'm almost certain at this point there's no time left in the game and that sh this conversion shouldn't matter right now the conversion is no good and that is our match but it does not matter and the battle of idaho is won by the team from up north how about that a furious comeback mounted there by the college of idaho down two tries almost halfway through the second half but ultimately the vandals of moscow idaho take it out 20 to 15. Well, I think their uh, captain, Lexi, there was the one who was a big playmaker for them, and I think it really goes to show that, uh, you know, as a team, you can collectively come back and uh, have a very empowering moment, and uh, that was a very exciting last few seconds there in overtime. Yes, it was. And now we pivot, folks, back to the group of death. The group of death, and it looks cool like we're too. seeing our first Boise State B team get their shot today, and, and they are going to be facing off against Colorado School of Mines, who I, I bet you has a little chip on their shoulder after that loss to Montana State. Oh, most certainly they do. Very, very excited to see this matchup here. Colorado School of Mines, they played all right. Colorado School of Mines played all right in that first game, but they were not able to pull it out against a Montana team that just seemed, Montana State team rather, that just seemed a little bit more experienced than them. Let's see if they can get that redemption here against Boise State B, who's been sitting on the sidelines for an hour and a half now, I'd imagine, trying their best to stay warm, but also in this condition. It's tough to do. Yeah, and with this Boise State B team, what we're gonna see the difference between that Boise State and B is Boise State is still a relatively young team. They had a lot of seniors that graduated this last semester, especially players such as Evdo and Ali Davis, who were some of their key players in sevens, are no longer with the program, but as coaches now, no longer as players. So it's gonna see where this experience kind of falls into play. There has been a lot of roster shifting for this Boise State B team today too. Two players who they thought they would have access to at the beginning of the day were not able to play today. And so this is a team that's not playing at full strength. And it looks like Mines is trying to take advantage of this early. Already in the attacking third here, 30 seconds in. A nice little layoff. Down the left side go the Mines. And they're taken down. Great stop there by the Broncos as Mines look to almost be a sure thing to get the try. And they're playing wide, playing fast right now, and they're looping right here. Oh, uh, and a good snag there by tackle. Mines. Almost lost that one, but a great bring down there by Boise State. Boise State bending but not breaking. 
minds. They're dragging defenders, though. My goodness, dragging two, three defenders. We have an offsides call, and it's going to be a quick penalty tap. Oh, quick penalty tap there for Mines, oh, but the referee does not allow it. There was another offsides, but number nine on Boise State, giving them an additional couple meters for that tap. And there's the tap and go there. But it looks like, oh. Mines got it, and it looks like they're reaching to this end zone. And that's going to be a and try. And that will be a try. Looks like it's going to be for Number eight, by the looks of it, for Mines, that is Trinity Bohati, the senior, punches it in and makes it five to zero Mines about a minute and a half into this game. And the conversion it's good. is good. Seven to zero, excellent kick, splitting the uprights. One thing I would like to see from when uh, these team score tries is you can be as close as you can to that try line to kick that. So with these conditions, giving yourself the best chance to make that kick is, you know, scooting up a little bit more. The angle might be a little bit more narrow, but at least it reduces the chance of wind or rain or anything like that messing with the trajectory of the ball. And the closest you can be when attempting the conversion, correct, is 10 meters behind where the ball, where the try is scored. And now Boise State looking to respond after going down five to zero early. Into the ruck they go, and the Broncos. Looks like there's gonna be a penalty. It's gonna be a knock on by Colorado School of Mines. We're gonna have a scrum. Oh, I miss, looks like the ref changed his hand signals. It's gonna be a scrum to the Colorado School of Mines. I here. believe that was a knock on there for Boise State. When the player was pulling it out of the ruck, they didn't quite secure it, dropped it forward a little bit. Yes, yes indeed. So this is gonna be interesting how the coordinators here take advantage of this short field position with not much time, and a whole lot of time, and they loop, do a loop oh, here. Oh, nice little loop. Can oh. they make the pass? No, they cannot, they, but a friendly little bounce there. They have some numbers and space wide. Everything going the ore diggers way so far. Number 13 on the outside has the ball. That's Willa Toronto. Into the ruck they go. They clear it out to the left, trying to take advantage of that open space, but Boise State's defense resets very well, but they can't make tackles. Into the ruck, out to the left. They're gonna keep trying that side there. Throwing stiff arms, but Boise State doing a good job of avoiding that stiff arm and getting underneath, really wrapping up at the thighs. There, Boise State is contesting heavily, but it looks like they keep coming from the side on those rucks, and that's gonna cost now them here. a quick tap and go, here we go. Can Mines get in, and yes, they will. It will be 10 to, sorry, 12 to zero, Mines. So with that score, as we're seeing from when we watch Boise State A and Boise State B, what are some of the key differences we're seeing so far from these two teams? I think uh, one of the things is, uh, I think Boise State Team A was a, uh, a little bit more on the possessive side of the ball, whereas uh, right now, uh, the B team seems to be more on the defensive end here. And I think they just need to get themselves a quick break to be able to be more possessive with that opportunity and a little bit more aggressive. I mean, I know the conditions are a little different, but at the same time too, Boise B, uh, Team B hasn't had, the, hasn't had their first game yet. So, you know, they're still trying to loosen themselves up, stay warm and kind of, you know, get all the jitters out. We have lots of friendly compliments in the live chat right now. Thank you all so much for participating. As a reminder to all you who are just joining us, our live chat on YouTube is open and we welcome any shout outs that you want to give us to any players. We'll be happy to echo them. Great times here on the attack again. Boise State has not had much possession this game. I mean, I'd say it is possibly 80 to 90% dominated by Mines as far as possession goes. Mines just living in the attacking third of Boise State. No ruck was formed right there, but they're going to get award the knock on to Boise State. And Boise State has an opportunity to take advantage and use some of the speed they have here on the outside. It looks like we have num number two, Holly. Holly Buz Buzzi. some wheels and if they can get it to her on the edge she could be able to put a dagger and spark into this offense but unfortunately it's going to be the Colorado School of Mines ball here. Mines on the right side here that's number 16 Jade Lavelle. Jade your parents are watching and I'm sure they're very proud as Mines presses into the 10 meter mark about. Mines threading again oh and the ball is taken away by Boise State that's number 15 Zoe Mills with the takeaway. 
Boise State trying to fight out of their own defensive half, trying to get some momentum, but Mines just will not allow it, continually applying the pressure. There's an overload there on the left side, and they're going to, the Ordinger's going to try to take advantage of it, but Boise State comes up and is playing some overall decent defense swarming up on them. And it looks like the ore diggers are just keep chipping away at that at that game line and just holding on to possession, which I which was one of my key factors uh, today. And there go the ore diggers once more. They're able to break the line, and it looks like we are headed to a 17 to 0 game. As they milk that one a little bit before they put it down there. Is that a bit of gamesmanship? <laughs> a little a little bit to just kind of kill some clock, you know, if the if the defense is not going to honor you taking your time there, why not? You have the lead. Let's kill some game clock and give your team a break and being able to set up. But like I said, she is still a live player. So if a Boise State player came in and tackled her and knocked the ball loose, that try would not count. And it would be Boise State's ball at that point. And now with that failed conversion, School of Mines is up 17-0 on Boise State B. And Boise State B, as we approach halftime here, is going to need to readjust and try to find a way to maintain possession here in this second half. What do you think they're lacking so far as far as their ability to maintain possession? What's going wrong? Big thing is, like you mentioned, is going to be that possession. You can't win games when you have the ball for approximately 10 to 15 seconds. When they have that ball, they need some support lines and just establish, get the jitters out. Like, like you guys said, this is their first game. There's going to be a little bit of rust. They got to kick off and some emotions that are built up. What we need to see is when they get the ball, just take a couple phases to establish their offense and then try to do some fancy at that point. But right now, they haven't been able to do a whole lot just yet. Well, the Broncos still in the waning moments of the first half have an opportunity to build some momentum for the second half. They're running down the right side. Oh, and a great tackle takes her out at the knees. And in the ruck, it seems like Boise State will just take it, and they're finally past midfield. Let's see if the referee keeps play going here. Boise State has a great offensive structure set up right here with players with depth and space. Let's see if they're able to utilize it here. But it looks like Colorado School Mines is prepared and maybe even slightly a little bit offside right here. Uh, trying to catch him off guard. And unfortunately, the ball goes out of bounds. It looks like it was a poor and pass. And that will be halftime there, folks. Halftime, our school score is Colorado School of Mines 17, Boise State Bronco B team 0. And I'd like to remind everybody now joining the live stream that we are University Television Productions, and this is the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Tournament brought to you here on, from the campus of Boise State at the Lincoln Intramural Fields. I'm Riley Chappelle, and then this is my co-broadcaster, Juan, and our man with all the answers, Kyle Curry, a former Boise State rugby player and the head coach of the Rocky Mountain High School varsity boys team. I do actually want to come to this broadcast and give a little fun fact about the history of Boise State rugby in general, men's and women's. Interesting fact, in the 1990s, can you actually take a guess of what the program was actually called? It was the Boise State what? They weren't the Broncos. Mm. Funny enough, in the 1990s, they were not the Boise State Broncos. <sighs> yeah, I couldn't even begin to guess what it is. What do you think? They were the Fighting Flamingos. In the 1990s, Boise State was not the Boise State Broncos. They were the Boise State Fighting Flamingos back in the day. And then as in more recent years, they've transitioned back to the Boise State Broncos. But a little Boise State history fact is they used to have some little pink and blue jerseys running around on this field, no blue and orange. I won't lie to you, it'd be sick if they were I still the fighting for me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they ever changed it back. I mean, well, maybe that's an idea they can get back in the merch shop there or something for, uh, you know, the historians and Bronco sports there. But I mean, I would don a blue and pink jersey. I, that, that, I absolutely that'd, that'd would as well. Uh, so, Kyle, tell me a little bit as I'm watching some Boise State men's rugby players out there. How is their seventh season going? Are you familiar with it? So, unfortunately, they haven't had much of a they haven't had a seventh season at all this year. They've been focused really focused on 15s this year. Uh, they've only had two losses this year: one to Utah State and one to the University of Utah earlier this year. Unfortunately, they were not able to go and play Western Washington earlier in this season due to poor traveling conditions for the league championship. They had an overall good. season season this year but just weren't able to fully capitalize it this actually this next Saturday here at Boise State University on the student union subfield is the NCRC League Seven championship team where we're gonna see teams Western Washington University of Washington Oregon Oregon State and Boise State six total teams competing for a playoff national berth 
for USA Rugby this year. So the winner of that tournament will move on to the Sevens National Championship Tournament. Well, those of you who are finding rugby enjoyable today, maybe that's something you stop by Boise State's campus and watch next week. And as we get set here for the second half, Boise State will be kicking off to the Ore Diggers, trying to find some momentum and really trying to maintain some possession here. Let's see if they can do it. I was to say, you could definitely tell that the School of Mines is playing from that uh, with a chip on their shoulder from that loss earlier today. Absolutely, so they got oh, they something got to prove and they're gonna prove it right now by the looks of it. I don't know if anyone's gonna catch her. There's one player in pursuit down the side. She cuts oh, back nice in. Cut back there, that's number 16 for Mines. That's gonna be Jade Lavelle. Converts the try, 22 to zero. Or diggers over the Broncos. I think we're starting to see as we're almost at that halfway point through these games is we're starting to get an idea of who's going to be playing who in those championship rounds for right now, in my opinion, humble opinion, I believe what we're going to see as long as Boise State A wins their next game, we're going to see Boise State A versus Montana State in that championship game, which is going to be a little bit of a rematch game for Boise State A. Well, coming up here in the 1240 slot we will have an opportunity to see boise state a as they take on a southern utah to decide the winner of pool one following that game at 120 approximately we will have montana state return to the field after almost a two and a half hour hiatus where they will take on this boise state b team that we see playing here our next game coming up in Pool 3 is going to be Western Oregon, the quick play and team that we like watching so much the first time around, taking on Willamette in a little battle of Oregon out here in Idaho. So it looks like we're going to have a scrum. It was a knock on by Boise State by number 13. I don't have that number here on my roster sheet right now. But it was a knock on by Boise State. It's going to be a scrum to the Colorado School of Mines. And the ball is entered into the scrum by Mines, and they take it out. Looking to go to the right now, and that will be a forward pass. A little bit of a brain fart there for Mines. That will be a knock. Boise State will get the ball. I have to imagine, you know, a long day for everybody. Long time for these teams to be sitting around, you know, start to get a little cold, start to tighten up a little bit, and eventually your brain will start to drift. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more and more mental errors as the day goes on here. Definitely a key factor is just trying to keep warm in those off periods. And that's a great and offload. The great offload there for Boise State. To number 15. Number 15 coming down the sidelines, that's Zoe Mills. And it looks like the ball is still in play close to that side. They had the space wide. They got to play fast here. To Trying to rotate it very quickly, and they can't do it as that Mines team got back into their defensive formation very quickly. Now into the ruck. Going back to the right side now. Trying to take advantage of the Mines over rotating. And it looks like they're going for that poach, and it looks like it's a not releasing call by Boise State. It's going to be a penalty tap for and the it'll School be a of Mines. Quick tap and go for School of Mines. They get it out to almost midfield. Nice little offload. Another nice little offload there for the Mines. Stringing a couple of nice offloads together there into the ruck. Out to the right now. They got a three on two if they can take advantage of it. Moving quickly is Mines. And here comes the breakaway. Mines looking to make it 27 to zero. Not a Bronco in sight. And it is 27 to zero Mines almost halfway through this second half here. Boise State just not able to keep up with the speed and the organization of Mines right now. We're definitely seeing that chip on their shoulder playing into effect right now. And it looks like we see what happens here with this conversion by the Colorado School of Mines. Absolutely. And the conversion will be no good, keeping it at 27 to zero. The Mines over Boise State B team. I think a good question to ask also, uh, we've seen a lot of these conversions not follow through, but uh, is there like a proper form or technique when it comes to wanting to kick a good conversion? I'll be honest, I was never the one to drop kick myself. That was not an arsenal of my game I ever mastered. Uh, but basically, you want the, when you drop that ball, you want to make sure when you drop it, it bounces exactly straight up. And just kind of like as a normal kick, as in with soccer, just having that nice sway arcing motion in one kind of unison. Uh, but in this situation, when you are up 27-0, these conversions, I'll be honest, really do not matter for the most part in this situation. And the Broncos looking to get on the board here. Into the ruck they go. Looking at an offsides call. 
And the quick tap and go. That'll be number six, Brooklyn Smith with the ball. Lays it off real quick. Oh, and that looks like to be a forward pass right there. Looks like the ref gave it advantage. The referee will give the, the advantage. And referee will give the advantage again. Ooh, oh, there it is. Absolute it. truck. My goodness. Zoe Mills laying the lumber. Out to the left now. Broncos have numbers. Can they take advantage of it? She has Looks the edge. She needs the support. Boots Eastland. Boots Eastland on the run. Boots Eastland lays it off. Down the side. One more layoff. Could be it. Oh, it could not complete the pass. That will be a knock for the Broncos. So disappointing in the attacking third. They were able to get the ball wide and see how they had those support lines kind of coming in. She, had, she dished it off, and then they, she got the ball right back and having those great support lines. Just an unfortunate ball handling error, which will cost them five points right there. But there's still a few minutes left to go in the game. Let's have to see if Boise State can end on a high note in this matchup. Regardless of the knock, the Broncos were able to advance the ball a far ways downfield. So even though Mines has possession of the ball right now, feeding it into the scrub, they are in their defending third. Ball fed into the scrub. Scrub starts to collapse and Boise State will come away with it. That's Zoe Mills with the ball. Passing it out to the right. One more pass. Number two, Holly Bazigian. Could she get here? It looks like she's almost fighting there. Fighting through, fighting through. Meters away, simple meters away into the ruck. They go quickly. It looks like they're going to do some picking. Boise State stopping and resetting. That'll be number eight reaching out. Sophia Brockle will score. And the Broncos will not be shut out in this game. 27 to 5. Boise State with 50 seconds left. 27 to 5. Mines. Boise State scores with 50 seconds left. Looks like Colorado School Mines had a little bit of a defensive error right there, opening up a huge space next to the ruck, which made it just almost a virtual walk-in try. And what and a beautiful kick. And the conversion kick. is made. Beautiful kick. Great little 30-second sequence there for the home team. 27 to 7. And it looks like we just have a little bit of time left in this second half right here. Boise State could still capitalize even more and add they up absolutely some more could. points. Well, and with points being the big tiebreaker, you never know. One it, try here at the end of the game could be the difference between playing in the two seed game or the three seed game. Boise State beast. Oh, oh big monster oh. hit. Absolutely enveloping, and that Mines player is slow to get up. I hope they're all right. Gosh, we felt that one up here. And they poach oh, it. Oh, and they it away. Sophia Brockle, fresh off of scoring the try, poaches the ball away from the mines. They had numbers wide. They did not take advantage of their numbers wide there. Turned back into the teeth of the defense rather than going to open space out on the left. That ball is dropped. Boise State looking to reset on the far right side now as we approach the weaning seconds oh. of this game. And down the right side go the Broncos. That's number 15, Zoe Mills. Can she get it? Oh, oh. no, she will be pushed out. A goal, and she falls hard on the concrete over that snowbank there. But she looks like to be all right, she is one tough cookie, and that is going to be the end of the half. She may have hit a little bit of concrete there, but she, he is one tough rugby player, and is able to get up and walk out of it. That tackle there at the end was made by the Mines, Trinity Bahati. Very, very good play and a good angle, and glad to see Zoe Mills get up all right as this game comes to its conclusion. Final score here in game number seven of the day is Boise State University B team seven, Colorado School Mines 27. Definitely a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was about to say, these games are going on really fast, and there's been a lot of exciting plays and close games here today, and I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of unfolds. No, I was going to say, it was definitely a tough loss for the Broncos there for the B team, but I'm hoping to see that they can come back in their second game later on today when they're going up against uh, MSU there. So lots of action to go with, lots more excitement to see. It's going to be a great day for some more rugby. We've got a couple of shout-outs to go through here. Uh, some dude named Evan McDonough is talking nonsense. Charla Bay is having fun. Joe Lynn says, woohoo, Trin. Mackenzie Williams says, let's go, Mines. Well, Mackenzie, you got your way in that one. And then my dad, Isaac Chappelle, 
says lay in the lumber hashtag rgc knows dad you don't have to use hashtags in youtube comments <laughs> but thank you nonetheless hey, at least you know your dad's watching the stream though. yeah that is very very nice down in sunny arizona he's probably sitting in a hot tub right oh, now that's being nice right now uh, I know. Right now. must be jealous of us and our beautiful cold and cloudy weather we have here in idaho yeah drizzle coming down we're sitting at about 38 degrees right now wind chill's got to have it somewhere around 30 and up here it feels even cooler as we all shiver in place. Uh, nothing like sitting in a nice parking garage in downtown Boise. Oh, there's nothing better than it. As we come up here on a Pool 3 game, we are going to have the Battle of Oregon I talked about earlier. It's going to be Western Oregon coming off of their earlier win against the College of Idaho taking on Willamette, who came off a close loss to the University of Idaho. And considering that the first two games were closely matched, I would expect this one to be a closely matched game as well. Let's see if Western Oregon looks to use their speed against Willamette just as they did against the College of Idaho in the first game. This is going to be a great testament to see where Western Oregon is at. You know, with their first win earlier in the game, we're going to see how will it or how this team reacts and seeing if they can come out 2-0. and oh, This could be, they could just run away with this whole thing because it could be a three-way tie at the end of this with the other three teams. They absolutely could. And as a reminder to everybody at home too, Pool 3 will not be playing in any post-pool play seeding games. And so the games they have scheduled are the games that they will play and that is it. So this is the second to last game for both of these teams. Each team, every team here gets three games today, just depending on if you're in the small college division or the big college. It's gonna depend if you have a championship game or not. But it looks like Western Oregon is gonna take that tap and it looks like they're, Number three from Western Oregon didn't release the tap, so they're gonna have to come back to redo it. And as you know, on tap penalties, the ball must be released from your hands once you kick it. And number seven had a great offload, and they are just driving, and the ball looks to have gone backwards. I'm not sure what was called right there. And it looks like a yellow card. I believe it's gonna be a yellow on number Sorry, I cannot get a number for you right here, and I'll try to get that name and number for you. That will be a yellow card on Willam. It's number 13. That is Grace Jackson, who will spend two minutes on the sideline, immediately putting Willamette at a disadvantage against this fast Western Oregon team. This is the time for Western Oregon to take advantage and build up one or two tries while that yellow card's in play. They can do that. They can set themselves up very nicely for the rest of this game. As a reminder to the viewers at home, Western Oregon is in the black and red. Willamette is in the white and red. Willamette looking to feed the ball into the scrum here. Three for a sec. And they do so. The ball straight goes and straight it goes the all tunnel. the way through the tunnel. I do want to remind our viewers today, just because they are in the small college division doesn't mean the rugby yeah. play and skill levels diminish. And actually, a lot of small colleges across the United States, there's some very good rugby that's even beating teams here at the big school level, Division One level. St. Bonaventure out on the East Coast can go out and play schools such as Ohio State and actually just to dismantle them. Absolutely. And the ball is not cleanly received there by Willamette, but they keep a hold on to it anyways. Willamette trying to branch out to the left now. Western Oregon playing stingy defense. A good layoff there for Willamette. We're not seeing a whole lot of structure from Willamette so far. It seems like we're they're kind of guessing where the ball's going. That's going to hurt them because Western Oregon has a great structure built out right now, and they're having great support lines. And that's going to be a huge deciding factor in this matchup. Absolutely. And we're looking at a little tap and go here for Western Oregon as they enter the attacking third. That's number two for Western Oregon. Jada Miller with the ball. Jada Miller lays it off. Into the ruck they go. Oh, vicious fighting stolen by Willamette. Willamette trying to get it out of their own defensive third here. That's number 17 going on the left side. Breaking away with speed. Oh, had an opportunity there. Still down the left side they go. Little one on two. Let's see if they can get some more numbers. I think one of the advantages that uh, Western Oregon's able to do right now is those one-on-one -on -one matchups are really paying off right now in this game. 
One thing with Willamette is they are having some success on the outside, but they're still very clumped up near those rocks. And Western Oregon still just staying spread out and capitalizing on that kind of clumped structure right now. So if West or Willamette, if they can just spread out a little bit and utilize their speed on the edge, is they could take advantage in a big way with only having six players right now. We've got a shout out from Connor King Goring. Go number four, Coral Davis. I adore you. Very, very sweet. <laughs> it looks like we have a penalty for Western Oregon and they're just gonna tap and go. Western Oregon going and they're not, doesn't seem to be much pressure from Willamette right now. They've oh. got numbers on the left side. Oh, a big stiff arm there. Western Oregon, can they get in? Oh, and a great takedown there by Willamette as they get into the ruck. They're going to just pick and go. From a right quick here. pick and go there for the Wolves. Throwing stiff arms, trying to fight people off. Can't quite do it. Willamette ends up with the ball right around their own try line. Looks like the penalty was a, looks like it was a knock on by Western Oregon. That's going to cost them inside the five meter line right now. That will, that will allow La Willamette to feed the ball into the scrum here. It's going to be interesting to see what Willamette can do because right now they are have that, I believe that yellow card is not on the field as of right now. Actually, I misspoke the yellow card. Yes, is the back. yellow card is now back. We're at full strength, seven on seven. And we Willamette will just boot it, trying to clear space. Very cheeky play there, and Western Oregon's trying to track it down, but oh. she, they've got two Willamette players bearing down on them. We have a knock-on on that kick. That was a great And decision. a knock-on. Great play there from Willamette. That pursuit, too, rushed that Western Oregon player and made that knock-on happen. Four teams that have somebody who can kick and have that speed. Making a kick down the field and chasing it could be a great way for them to not only push back that defense, but to hopefully cause a mistake by the opposite team and even score a try. Absolutely. If you have that speed there and you can coordinate a great attacking kick, that this could be a game in their arsenal that they could utilize throughout this game. Willamette looking to feed the ball in now. And it bounces out to them. Oh. On the right, it looks like we will either have a Forward knockoff pass. or a line out. Yes, that'll be a forward pass. Or we'll take the line out, actually. Pick your poison. Ball will be sent in by number three from Western Oregon. That's Claire Rickus, the senior. Rickus now with the ball right back. Looking to lay it off, and a nice little layoff there to number four. Western Oregon looks to have some space. Rickus wide, with the ball once more. That's to number seven. That's Estella Miranda Aguilar. And on the right side, oh, they had a step and could not catch it. And that will be Willamette's opportunity to feed the ball into the scrub. Just a reminder to everybody that the next game coming up after this will be the Boise State A team, who we have not seen since the very first game of this tournament, taking on the Southern Utah Thunderbirds, who previously won 15 to 10 in that tightly contested game against Northern Colorado. The winner of that game will move on to the championship round for the big school division. So this has a game of huge implication. Absolutely. And the... W the other person, or the other team rather, from pool two, that number one seed, will be Montana State if they can overcome Boise State University's B team. But if Boise State can pull off the upset, I would say, and beat Montana State and create a three-way tie, then we would go to a points tiebreaker. That's exactly what will have to happen. And it will see how dominant Boise State's team is overall in this next matchup. And Western Oregon pressing again. These two teams locked in a stalemate here, trying to break it. Western Oregon dragging Willamette defenders. Western Oregon, nice little layoff there. That's number 11. Quinn Ritter. Western Oregon still with the ball within three meters now, very close. It looks like not rolling away is going to be the call by the ref. It's going to be a tap penalty. Uh, and quick tap and go. 
try. And a try is converted. That is the captain, the senior, Claire Rickus for Western Oregon, making it five to zero. Wolves over Willamette. Western Oregon was able to at least get the try right before the half there. Absolutely, big for momentum there for Western Oregon as the conversion is no good, keeping it at five to zero. This, I'll be honest, this game's a little bit closer than I was anticipating going into it, but Willamette is holding their own and making some plays and making it real interesting right now. Willamette has played very, very scrappy so far. They've been able to keep some of the faster members, the Clara Rickuses, the Estella Miranda Aguilars, the uh, Jada Millers at bay so far. Big Let's see if Willamette can get on the board themselves here in the second half, tie this thing up. I think for Western Oregon, they need to continue what they have been doing and taking those hard punch lines up forward and having those great support lines. We've seen success with that in the first game. We've seen some of it here, but it seems like we're going through a little bit, a little dysfunctional at this moment. Maybe some jitters are setting in or anything like that, but a big thing is just running those hard punch lines and having those great support lines. They're going to find that success again and just will land it. I, I think kicking is the way to go for them right now. They're having problems playing inside the interior of this field and they're struggling a little bit to get it wide. So I'd love to see them do a kick down the field and having their speed try to catch up to that ball for a great play. Likewise. No, I think a big thing for uh, Willamette is also going to be just uh, their ability to get down the field and uh, you know capitalize on some of those mistakes that Western Oregon can make sometimes. And I'm excited to see what they're going to be able to put together for the second half. And we welcome all the viewers at home who are now looking at our wonderful mugs here in the Lincoln parking garage. We've cordoned off a nice little section here so that no cars can park. Uh, every once in a while, if you hear a loud noise, it's a car backfiring or driving right behind us here in the garage. But we're making do with what we can here on this drizzly Boise day. Probably about 38 degrees, very, very cold. But so far, you haven't been able to tell in any of these games. The only real difference and the only way you can tell the temperature is the snow banks on the side and the specks of snow you see still out on the turf. And those are not any fun. To, as being a former rugby player who has been tackling the banks of snow, it hurts, it does suck. And for those who do get tackled into it, I'll hope them the best. But key thing is let's stay away from those sidelines completely while also attacking wide. Yeah, just at the end of last game, we saw that big collision there between Boise State and Mines, where the Mines player right at the end of the game pushed the Boise State player out of bounds, and she took a little slide straight over that snowbank, oh. straight onto that wonderfully slick concrete. I was saying, I can only imagine that the small sprinkle of rain that we're getting doesn't make any traction easier for being on that field. I'm sure it doesn't, but that being said, I haven't actually seen too many slips today. Surprisingly, right? People definitely are taking a bit longer of a time to chop their feet and change direction, but I haven't seen any, you know, all out slips so far, which is positive to see. We want the best rugby possible, and we want this to be the best display for all these teams that it can be. As we line up here for the second half, Western Oregon will kick to Willamette. Willamette down five to zero to the Wolves. Looking to take advantage of the smart play that they had in the first half and build on that and hopefully get on the board themselves and make this a ball game. There's the kick from the Wolves, fielded cleanly by Willamette. Willamette already off to the races there. Unfriendly bounce that time. Western Oregon really coming at it with ferocity. Strong hits all around. Willamette trying to rotate it and find some open space. Could have been a forward pass, was not called. Willamette advancing. Looks like Western Oregon's really wanting to contest those rocks and use their big, size big hits here. there. It looks like we have a diving over the ruck call. It's going to be a Willamette tap, and tap for them. And they're going to be a little slow with it, but they're going to take advantage of it. They have some numbers wide, and I they think do that's have what some they're numbers trying to do. And quickly out of the ruck is the pass. Willamette down the sidelines. She's looking for support, and she's not finding it just yet. She does just release the ball and pick it right back up to continue play since she did not have that support with her there. Western Oregon there in the ruck. They win the ball. 
Back into the ruck we go here. Very aggressive play from both teams here. Bodies hitting the ground everywhere. Western Oregon slowing the game down a little bit here. They got a two on two out on the left, made a two on three now. And we have a Western Oregon player a little slow to get up. Very aggressive play here in this second half. We have a scrum here. Looks like Willamette will be feeding the ball into the scrum with Western Oregon still leading five to zero, two minutes into this second half. Willamette gets the ball out and they immediately clear it right, trying to take advantage of space. Number 10 for Willamette has the ball. That's Annie Birch Wright. To set up, yeah, they were looking to set up a tap and go there by the look of it, but it looks like the official called for a scrum. No, I think that uh, all the both teams have great defense going on, and I think that's why it's really hard for each team to get an advantage one over the other. So I think it's going to come down to who's making the mistakes and who's going to capitalize on those. Absolutely, I agree. As the ball is exited out to the left, not a clean catch, but Willamette will end up with it anyways. Coming around the left side now, looks like we got a little bit of space for Willamette there. That's going to be number nine, Grace Rogers, down the sidelines, and the sophomore scores the try. It is five to five as Willamette draws it level. Great run there by Grace Rogers and a great find by her teammate to see her out there on the wing with the defense not set. Yeah, did a great job looking up and utilizing the space the defense was providing and just speed kills. Speed absolutely does kill, especially in a sport like sevens. Ah. And it looks like Willamette missed that conversion. So we're gonna stay even after that try. So it is a tight ball game with relatively about four, little less than four minutes left to go in this matchup. And a defensive slugfest to say the least here. Willamette kind of playing the game the way they want to play it. They've made Western Oregon uncomfortable and Western Oregon hasn't been able to establish themselves the way they were able to against the College of Idaho in their first game. No, so you're hundred percent right right there. Western Oregon starting to look a little bit frazzled than they did in the first game right here. Absolutely. Makes me curious if these two teams have played each other before. Because Willamette looks like they know Western Oregon's playbook a little bit. If I'm not mistaken, I believe they are in the same league with each other. So they should be familiar with each other. But I could be mistaken. And into the ruck we go. Willamette comes out. Willamette trying to enter the attacking third once more. Quickly out of the ruck they go one more time, trying to get the edge. Uh oh, here we go. There's no support. Oh, She's looking for down. support. No support. Oh, and a quick dive over by Western Oregon. The ball's contested. And what's the call there? It looks like diving into the ruck. Diving into the ruck. And it's going to be a. Looks like it's going to be Willamette's ball still. Bodies everywhere. You can see the exhaustion on Willamette's face. But hopefully with the uh, the recent score there, Will Willamette's going to be uh, bouncing back and have a new spark under their, you know, under themselves to be able to score some more points. Absolutely. Willamette feeds the ball in on the ground and immediately into a ruck. Good push there by Western Oregon. Western Oregon is awarded the ball. A tap and go, and Western Oregon's moving the ball closer to midfield. Wolves trying to avoid a tie and a trip to overtime or even a loss with a Willamette try here. Into the rock, oh, and the ball is exited and given to Willamette. Finally utilize that uh, extra space over there on the right side of the field. Ball's right around midfield now. Both teams alternating possession. Willamette moving the ball to the left here. They're in good formation with good spacing. A skip pass there. It goes to Grace Rogers. Over to the left now. Willamette's going to try to rotate it back to the right. 
Charging forward is Willamette. Nice little layoff there, back to Grace Rogers. Grace Rogers with the move. Nice little layoff again. Can they make another pass? Can they string them together? They got numbers on the right side if they take advantage of it. Oh, that's gonna be a costly mistake and right there for the knock-on. that will be a knock-on. Was not able to be fielded cleanly there by Raya Hirsch, the freshman. And that will cost Willamette possession at midfield. They did have a great string of passes there, though, and that was very impressive to see come together. They did, and we are closing in here on the end of the second half. According to our clock up here, which once again, folks, is not accurate. The referee keeps his own hand time down there. We have six seconds and counting left. We will see what the referee decides to do here, if he decides to let it go a bit longer, or if we head into that sudden death overtime that I think we're all silently rooting for. I believe there's a little less than a minute, because we did have one of those injuries earlier in the game. I think we have about a little less than a minute left to play. Absolutely, and we will reset that ruck. Now, talk to us about the intricacies of a ruck, because my understanding is the two teams almost have to work together to create one that's safe for everyone involved. Yes, big thing is keeping the ruck safe, but a big component of that is going to be how your how the person who's tackled is positioned, because the ruck, the gate, as they call it, is from the head to the feet of the person. So the thinner you are, as in like the more like fold over, try to make yourself as thin as possible in that, will actually minimize the gate and minimize the place of entry for the opposing team. And as the whistle is blowed, it looks like that will be the end of regulation, folks. We got a 5-5 ball game. We're it's heading to sudden death overtime. Let's see if there's this sudden death here or if it's just a tournament play or they're going to mark it down as a tie because of the round robin. They so, may call it a draw. So it looks like yeah, it's going to be a draw. It will be a draw. Unfortunately, it will be 5-5. But that has huge implications for the rest of this tournament for that round robin because now one team could just come out with Two wins, two wins and one loss, and take two wins, one loss, or two wins and a tie, and come back, and that's great. Could be huge for the other Idaho teams who have, still have more games to play here today. Updating everybody on Pool 3 standings. Currently, the University of Idaho is two and zero with wins over Willamette and the College of Idaho. The College of Idaho is 0-2 with losses to Western Oregon and to the University of Idaho. Western Oregon is now 1-0-1 one, and one with a win over the College of Idaho in this draw. And then Willamette is 0-1-1 one, and one with the loss to the University of Idaho and the draw to Willamette, or the draw to Western Oregon, rather. So very, very tightly contested Pool 3 here as we now switch back to Pool A, where the Boise State University A team, fresh off of a two-hour break, will take on Southern Utah, whose legs are probably a little bit fresher than theirs, considering the long hiatus that BSU's A team had. You are 100% correct, and, and I want to remind our viewers this. The winner of this game, since they are both 1-0 with both their wins coming over Northern Colorado, will move on to the championship round versus the Pool B winner, who I'm anticipating to be Montana State. But right now, this is this is a big game. This is relatively a playoff game for both of these teams right here. And the ball is kicked off, kicked around a little bit. And the referee. It looks like it might be a little offsides. It looks like we got a short arm penalty. It's going to be Southern Utah's ball right here. We need Boise State still not officially back all 10. And a, oh, and there and we go. And we've got a little bit of a weird play going on, but it looks to be a tap and go. And Southern Utah advances into the attacking side of the field. Southern Utah trying to find players. Oh, oh and a nice little cut there. And all of a sudden, the Thunderbirds are on the run. Oh. Number six for the Thunderbirds. That's Malia Cronquist. Puts the Thunderbirds on the board. That was just a missed opportunity tackle, which exploded in seven. You can't miss those type of tackles. One missed tackle, as you can see here, is going to equivalent to a try. As the rain starts to fall a little bit more aggressively now, the Thunderbirds 
jump on the early sleepiness possibly from Boise State's A team. And while the conversion is no good, they still have a five to zero lead on the Broncos, who are our friend Kyle's tournament favorites. Yeah, and here's the thing with these two hour breaks, it's a great thing and a bad thing at the same time. The great thing you get that needed break, but you're gonna come back a little bit more sluggish. You got the rest longer. You don't, your blood's not moving. It could also be a detrimental for having that long extended break. We're gonna see how Boise State reacts here. For Boise State reacts after being scored on right here and making the score down 5-0. Well, I'm sure the Broncos are trying to take this as a wake up call here. As Southern Utah really kind of jumped on them early. That kick will roll 10 and it will be picked up by Boise State. That's number 16, Bree Fry. Bree Fry out to the middle of the field already and they dive into the ruck. Boise State being patient with it and they toss it out to the right. Trying to find positioning there, trying to make it cut through and a good tackle there by Southern Utah. Really met her head on there. Out to the left, Boise State trying to be quick and rotate. Oh, and they look like they're looking to set up Maria on the sideline. And, and they are. And she has the speed, but can't get away. And, she, and she's still in bounds. And they set up the ruck. Boise State slowing it down a little bit again. Very good tackle by the Thunderbirds on the outside there. Switching over to the right now. They have the overload right if they can get there and see They how, do. Oh, oh, and the pass could not be completed. Boise State will have to reset a little bit. And they got two Thunderbirds swarming all over them. Thunderbirds really coming out and playing with some fire here. They definitely want that spot in the championship and they're showing it right here, right now. Yes, they do. And oh. that's number 13 now going down the right side for Boise State. That's Lee Lynn Hewitt, the junior out of Boise, Idaho. She scored in the first game and she will score in the second game. The Broncos on the board, tie ball game. They definitely responded quick and shown that the button happened there may have been just a little hiccup in their defense and the one thing I will give Boise State credit to is they may be one of the better kicking teams in this tournament and that could be a deciding factor in this game well we will see if they put it on display right here as that kick is up oh, and it is oh. no good looks like it was pulled just a little bit to the right keeping our score at Southern Utah 5 Boise State a5 I'm assuming it's probably going to be a pretty high scoring game for either team just being uh, given the premise of the importance of it and knowing that they're both great at attacking and even their defense is phenomenal so well with a try I, yeah with a try on the board for each team halfway through the first half I'd imagine you might be right and a kick there for Boise State so it looks like it's going to be a tap hit on the penalty tap at the middle of the field that's going to cost you a snake, but Boise State's not back 10 yet. There could incur another penalty right here, but it looks like the refs going to let it play on. Southern Utah immediately into the ruck. Ball falls back. Doesn't matter. They got it. Trying to bust right up the middle now in Southern Utah. That's how they got Boise State the first time. Great Southern tackle. Utah playing quick. Very, very good tackle there by the Broncos. Fall down once more into the ruck. Exited out the back. Southern Utah's got it. Boise State immediately all over them. Into the ruck one more time. Exits out to the right. Great Good tackle. defensive position by Boise State and a great tackle by Boise State as well. That is Bree Fry on the tackle. Southern Utah slipping out of that tackle keeping the ball on the attacking side of the oh. field. A good sign for the Thunderbirds. It, it looks like Southern Utah's called for not releasing in contact, and that's gonna hurt them there. And yeah. Boise State's gonna take advantage right here. With the quick tap. But no, she's looking. Oh, it looks like they weren't back 10, so they're gonna get an additional 10, and they just gotta go now. And another quick tap and go there. Southern Utah got caught sleeping. Oh, she didn't release the ball in her tap. She did not release the ball. And that's gonna hurt, because that could have been a runaway try. It looks like they're going to spin it and try to get it. Ooh, I'm trying to see what the call is here. As we have a substitute coming on, the substitute is Ali Franzak, the junior from Idaho Falls. So it looks like it could have been a possible, I'm not too sure what the call, but a possible knock on there by Boise State, a missed opportunity on that, and it's going to be a scrum to Southern Utah. And Southern Utah, oh, almost Ooh. had the ball. Oh, now getting knocked around a little bit, and that looks like we'll have a knock on Southern Utah. Or rather, yes, a knock on Southern Utah. Oh. 
It does. It looks some. I, I'm not too sure what he called right there, but it's going to be a tap penalty for Boise State. And Ali Frosak's going to lay a stiff arm oh, and a shoulder. Oh my goodness! Ali Frosak means business, and the layoff to the wide open teammate down the sideline goes Boise State. Ten, five, Broncos. What a play! That was perfectly executed for them. When Allie Fronsack puts the team on her back, and in doing so, she may have injured a Thunderbird, but my goodness, what a thunderous sequence there from Allie Fronsack, and what a great pass at the end. Broncos up four. Broncos up 10 to four now, as the conversion has not been attempted yet. The player down is being tended to right now. We will try to get a camera and see Hopefully the number okay. of that player. Hopefully they're okay, absolutely. Zemir is the rain picking up a little bit more right now. It looks like Boise State is showing great sportsmanship right now. Every player is taking a knee right now, and even the conversion hasn't even been attempted yet because the kicker is waiting to make sure the Thunderbird is okay before they continue on with this matchup. And as we pause here, we take a look at the fans out in the stands there. People from all around coming out and supporting their team. I imagine some have traveled pretty far here. As of all these players, this is, uh, this is a pretty big tournament out here on the West Coast in Rugby Sevens. Um, and, you know, we've had teams from Southern Utah, Northern Colorado, all parts of Oregon travel out here. Yeah, a lot of teams from the Mountain West and Pacific West coming out for a great day of rugby. Wish it was a little bit warmer, but I think regardless, the fans are enjoying it, having a great time here, and a lot of cheering going on. Absolutely, and welcome back up into the garage, everybody. I could call it a booth, I guess, but, you know, it's a garage. Uh, our team up here is doing pretty good. We've been having a fun time. I think everyone's starting to warm up a little bit. People are starting to smile more. Our executive producer, Nathan Smy Snyder, even cracked a smile there for a second. No, he did not. It's very rare sight, no, I would never, I would never accuse him of that. <laughs> and Nonetheless was... here, folks, we are now over with this game halfway through our day of rugby. And it looks like the Thunderbird is able, is coming off the field. She is a little banged up, but it seems to be she will be okay. Uh, and play will shortly resume. I am glad to see that she is getting off the field. It looks like she's being pretty heavily supported by her teammates or her friends there. Looks like I hope like everything's Vancouver. okay with her. Yeah. You just hate to see that. And we resume play here with the score being 10 to 5. Boise State kicks it off, and Southern Utah has it bounce around a little bit, and they'll just have to dive on it and go into the ruck. Nobody out to the right there. She was looking to pass, but didn't have a teammate home, and that ball will be kicked around. And a knock will be called. Looks like it's going to be a scrum to Boise State right here. Don't be surprised if they're going to look to target Maria Donovan here in this area. She only needs one step. She only needs one step to make a play. Donovan, like number 15, to closest to you right now. And instead, it will be number 10, Sydney Halsey, taking it herself, and the try is converted. 15 to 5, Sydney Halsey says, I don't need Maria Donovan. <laughs> I'll do this myself. And she makes it a two try game. I think we're starting to see that a little bit of experience play in in this game where Boise State had a little mistake in the first half, but is showing that they are the more dominant team, and that's why they are my tournament favorite to win this matchup. And that conversion kick is no good, keeping it at 15 to 5. Boise State, after the quick slip up there in the first half, or in the uh, first part of that first half, has rebounded strongly with three straight tries to take the 15 to 5 lead. So from the teams we have seen today, obviously I've given my take about Boise State, Montana State in that championship matchup. Who are you, from what you guys have seen, gonna be that possible matchup we see at the end of the day? I think it's gonna be Boise State, Montana State still. They came out so strongly against, Montana State did, they came out so strongly against a Mines team who we just saw deliver it to Boise State's B team a little bit there. This Boise State A team, I think they were a victim of that two and a half hour rest for the first minute of this game, but they've responded really nicely since, and their form is so good. 
they stay very well spread out. That's something I've noticed about this team. While Montana State may be a little bit more physically dominant, Boise State's form is really solid. No, I agree. I think uh, I think Montana State and Boise State A are going to be the ones to take it to the championship. Even just looking at their play style now, I think you're right. Like the first minute was a little slow for Boise State A, but they've definitely put on a performance since then. So going into this uh, this later half of the second half, it's going to be a very fun performance for them. Absolutely, it will. Coming up here for our next game after this, we are going to go back to Pool 3 for the final slate of Pool 3 games. It will be the College of Idaho. College of Idaho looking to get their first win in this tournament, taking on Willamette, who, you know, is only going to have 15 minutes of rest coming into this last game here. But that can honestly be work out into their favor a little bit, depending on how much stamina and endurance they have. If they're a team that's well conditioned, that is going to be more suited for them because they're going to have be warm. They're going to keep that blood flowing, and they're not going to have to think about any of their, what happened in that last game. So they can just kind of continue on from the success from they had in that last game, try to carry it over, and make a statement in this like, next game. Absolutely, I think that'll play to their benefit just a little bit. They're already warmed up. They're you know already got all the you know. They're already well, not like well rested, but you know, rested enough to continue on. And so I think this might play into advantage for them. Just as a reminder to all of you joining the live stream, we are University Television Productions. I'm Riley, this is Juan, and this is Kyle. And if we're fixing the slight error we have on the scoreboard, it is 15 5. Yes, Boise 15 State. to 5, Boise State, not 10 to 5, Boise State. I apologize for that. Anywho, we are University Television Productions. I am Riley. This is Juan and this is Kyle. We're happy to be with you today and we're happy that you're joining us for this 2024 coverage of the Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Tournament brought to you here at Boise State University in the beautiful but drizzly Boise, Idaho. Southern Utah will kick off to start this second half here. Trailing 15 to 5. Broncos will receive it, and here we go. She may lay it. Oh, stiff oh, arm. Oh, a quick Too stiff, stiff arm. arm right in the jaw. Down the sideline go the Broncos. A nice oh. little layoff there. This is number 12. Oh, oh. oh and a great little stiff arm. Great a nice little look. layoff there. That was a great pass sequence to set up a try. Great team effort and great support line. And Boise State's really putting their pedal to the metal and really just showing that why they believe to be the most dominating team. Ali Fronzak and Kaya Strang playing great team ball all the way down that right side, passing back and forth and throwing stiff arms galore. The coordination to do that execution there was phenomenal on both, on both team members there. Leland Hewitt will try the conversion. Let's see if they can be successful on this. Referee having a quick conversation with some Southern Utah players as that conversion is no good. Our score is 20 to five, less than a minute into this second half. One thing about Ali Fronzak is she may not be the fastest player on the field, but you do not want to tackle her one on one. She will drop the hammer and will make you pay if you try to tackle high. And she's still shown that in this game so far. Yes, she has as the Broncos extend their lead. Broncos kick it off to Southern Utah. Can't field it cleanly, but it bounces backwards. Ball still dribbling around there. Eventually the Broncos come up with it down the left side. Can they lay it off to somebody? No, and we're gonna go straight into the ruck here. Broncos looking to use that space to the right. Oh, oh and couldn't hang on to it. That'll be a knock. Looks like it's gonna be a scrum to the Thunderbirds. And as I look around at the field here, it looks like some of these snow banks are starting to melt, meaning it's probably warming up a little bit. A good sign for everybody. Thank goodness. Absolutely. My toes could use it, that's for sure. <laughs> sure thing. Broncos come out of the scrum and they immediately go to the right ball bouncing around, but it's found by Maria Donovan. She's can Maria fast. Donovan get the corner? Oh, yes, she can. Oh, Gotta get that ball down, though. Try. And she will. The try will be awarded to the All-American, a member of the All-Tournament team at Nationals last spring. Gets a try. You can't give her even a single step, but she will make you pay for it as she shows off her speed, just even uh, only about probably half of her speed right there. Yeah, that was a nice little saunter into the try for her as that kick is no good, making it 25-5. to five. Broncos up on the Thunderbirds.
with about halfway through the second half, we'd really like to see the Thunderbirds show off some kind of explosion here. It seems like Boise State's kind of, for the most part, been able to corral them and not let them do any explosive plays like they did against Northern Colorado. Absolutely. Thunderbirds get the ball here. Let's see if they can get a little bit of that momentum back because whatever they had in that first half was taken away quickly by this Broncos team. Thunderbirds exiting the ruck out to the right. And, oh, they were one slip tackle away from having a lane there. Ball being fought over. And a tap and go penalty will be awarded to Southern Utah. They take it immediately. That's Rachel Nebaker, the sophomore, with the ball. Down into the ruck they go. Ball immediately picked up. That's number two, Ella Georges. I apologize if I'm announcing that wrong. The freshman from Southern Utah. No, it was poached. And the ball was poached and then pushed out of bounds right into the snowbank. Make yourself a little snow pillow brief fry. <laughs> We're gonna have a line out to Southern Utah here after Brie Fry did that header into the snowbank. Hopefully that's not all ice down there because that can't feel good if it is. Ball goes in, two players go up and it will be taken by Southern Utah, but we will have a penalty on Southern Utah. Boise State will feed it into the scrum. Leland Hewitt gets the honors of feeding it into the scrum. It looks like from all the games we've seen today, it's been a consistent theme that lineups have been a struggle today. The scrums seem to be the way to go because we've had a couple of poor throws into the channel and just resulted in a scrum to the other team. Absolutely, and that scrum quickly is won by Boise State. But a bouncing pass causes them to have to reset, but resetting might be more of a blessing than a curse as they got numbers out to the left, but that's quickly squashed by a good rotation from Southern Utah's defense. Boise State now trying the right side to see if their luck's any better. Oh. Good passing there. Great Frozak passing. to Donovan, here comes Speed. Well, that, that that's is, not Donovan. That is, I believe. That is Kylie Nelson. My apologies, a sophomore out of Aptos, California. Back to the left now, here we go. This is number seven, Olivia Wood. Olivia Wood making a little bit of movement happen. Oh, I know. And a too aggressive of a pass. Cut back in. The securing that ruck right there. Take a second to get your offense set up because you do have that space wide. They're doing a great job spreading it. And oh, a little shift kick. Oh, it's oh, just out of the reach. Oh, I saved it. Oh. She saved it. Great, great effort play there on the far sideline. Boise State with this lead is definitely trying a few things out before the championship match team will work. So Back to the left we go. Take it down. Looks like the ball's poached by Southern Utah. Girls go to the ground fighting over the ball and the referee blows the whistle. Looks like we have a knock on. It's going to be Southern Utah's scrub. Great little sequence there from the Broncos, but it doesn't result in any points. But sometimes that's not necessarily the only goal. No, That right. was some good rugby we saw there. They're definitely trying a few things out and being a little bit more risky with the ball. Do, with having this 20 point lead right now, they're able to do these kind of things. Uh, but against Montana State, they will get, uh, they will get not penalized, but that will hurt them if they do those type of things and it doesn't work out for them. As we enter the last 30 seconds here, there's more fighting over the ball. Girls on the ground, bodies flying everywhere. The Broncos come up with it, and they got a three on two if they hurry. Well, that might be a little bit of obstruction right there that we're seeing, which could have been a penalty, but it looks like the ref is gonna play on. The referee will let it play it on, and down the right side is going to be Olivia Wood. Olivia Wood looking for the dump off. She finds it. Uh-oh, here comes the All-American. And milking a little bit of clock and getting better positioning. Maria Donovan is in again. When all else fails, find 15. Win and doubt, give it to 15 on the edge. And at this point, every time she's touched the ball, she's pretty much scored. I believe that's her fourth try of the day so far. Two in this game and two in the previous matchup. She's on fire right now, and hopefully they take that success onto the next game. I believe so, and the kick is just missed there by Kylie Nelson off to the right. And that will be your ball game, folks. Our final score here is Boise State A, Southern Utah, or Boise State A30, Southern Utah 5.
meaning that Boise State has locked up the one seed in pool one. And with the end of this game, we will say goodbye to Mr. Kyle Curry. He's got obligations elsewhere, but Kyle, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys having me on. And let me know when uh, Boise State wins the tournament. That's my uh, tournament favorite. Absolutely. Take care, man. Have a good one. Yeah, you as well. With the exit of Kyle, we welcome back our friend Alton, who's been working the camera for the last little bit. Alton, how is it over there? Freezing cold. <laughs> Freezing cold. That sounds about right. It's not much warmer over here, I'll tell you that. Yeah, but it's a lot more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> True that. <laughs> So Alton, what have you been noticing the last few games here as I shift over my rosters for this next game, which is going to be the College of Idaho versus Willamette? Well, honestly, I, I mean, I, obviously the the last one and a few of the other previous games have started to get bigger in the score gap, but I really feel like they're starting in those first halves are a lot more evenly contested than we saw at the beginning of the day. I mean, we saw by halftime, it was already two, three possession games by halftime. And I feel like over the last, you know, couple of games, maybe the last four, it feels like most of these games have been a lot tighter, at least going into halftime. It absolutely has been. We've had some close results recently. 5-5, Western Oregon, Willamette. 20 to 15 at University of Idaho and the College of Idaho and then 15 to 10 in that heartbreaker for Northern Colorado when they lost to Southern Utah, the team we just watched play against Boise State. And as we reset here, folks, Victory is on the line. First victory for both of these teams still being sought after with Willamette having a draw and a loss and the College of Idaho having two losses. Speed on speed here. We'll see which speed is better. The College of Idaho will kick it to Willamette to start this game. The College of Idaho in the white and purple bottoms. And then Willamette in the white shirts with the red trim and the white bottoms. It's been a fun day so far here. Thank you for joining us at UTP in our continuing coverage of the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Tournament presented by Boise State and hosted here at the campus of Boise State. Willamette starts with the ball. Players from the College of Idaho swarming. Willamette tosses it out to the right. A little bit of space there, but a great takedown by the College of Idaho. Into the ruck they go. Willamette tosses it out to the left, trying to reset. Bullying players is Willamette. Two, three girls on the ball. Cannot get her down. And finally, they do around midfield after gaining about 15 yards there. Willamette now on to the right. Nice little layoff there. Another nice little layoff. Starting to string them together. Another nice layoff, but that may have been a forward pass, and that is what the referee will call. Yeah, it started to look a little bit disorganized there from uh, Willamette as we kind of watched them move forward. I mean, they started to kind of bunch together, not necessarily being an organized line, so they really started running out of options there, and kind of leads to the forward pass. Yes, they did. And as we set up for the scrum here, College of Idaho will feed it in. Yeah, I'm very curious to see what uh, Willamette will do for their uh, their game plan this game after they came off that tie on the last one that they were competing in. As am I. They played very, very smart rugby in the last game, so I'm curious if we'll see some more kicks and some more position plays as we saw there, or if they will just try to muscle and speed, or out muscle and out speed the Yotes. So we reset the scrum, Yotes feed it in. And the ball will be won by the Oats. They dump it out to the right, and that's number four on the roster. Lily Haney with the ball. Into the ruck we go. Lots of fighting in there. And it looks like they came around the side on the ruck. It'll be a quick tap and go for the College of Idaho as Willamette's getting back to 10 meters. Approaching the attacking third is the College of Idaho. And it'll be another tap and go for the College of Idaho from further back. Right side's open if they've got the numbers. Oh, number, number 18, 18 for the College of Idaho attacking within 10 meters. Finally brought down by a host of Willamette. 
Yeah, Gracie Castillo, number 18 there. She's really making a run for her right there. Yes, she was. That was very impressive. College of Idaho slowly matriculating down the field, gaining traction with every second, and then a penalty erases it all. It'll be a tap and go penalty for Willamette. College of Idaho having to fall 10 meters back and give up that ground that they've been working so hard to gain for the last minute and a half. Willamette stringing together some nice passes now, and uh-oh, we got a breakaway. Let's see if anybody can catch him. One person gaining traction. Oh, great effort there from the College of Idaho, but can they get him with 10 meters left? Oh. No, they will not be able to, and an emphatic try signal from the referee. 5-0, Willamette's up. Referees out here having fun. I love that. I always love any uh, impassioned referee when he, when they're going out there to make a signal. What a play that was, though. That was Eloquent Johnson on the try conversion for Willamette to the sophomore. Eloquin, I'm sure hope that I'm saying your name right. I have been struggling over that one for the last couple of hours reading it here in front of me. And the conversion is good. 7-0 will lamb it up. And that conversion, as we've seen today, fellas, is huge. Yeah. That's oh, the difference yeah. between a win and a loss right there when you guys are scoring an even amount of tries. Well, even in like, you know, they, if they had gotten one of those in their tie, you know, that would have been th literally the difference between their tie and potentially even winning the game. Absolutely. As we go back to midfield and reset here at College of Idaho, looking to bounce back after gaining a ton of momentum there and getting into the attacking third of Willamette, but then committing a penalty that gave Willamette the tap and go that ultimately resulted in the try down at the other end. Oh, and immediately a nice little uh, nice little layoff there for the College of Idaho at number five. That is Brooke Lowry, the freshman, scores. Wow, that happened so quick. It was... All that momentum that Willamette had just immediately gone. What? And all of a sudden, the College of Idaho is a made kick away from tying this thing up. What a response. I mean, that's how you respond, giving up a, a, what could have been a back-breaking score is go right down the field and you know, in a matter of seconds and just tie and get ready to tie the thing up. That was a beautiful play there by Brooke Lowry. Her teammate was being held up by two Willamette players, and it looked like they were about to go down as that conversion is no good, keeping it at five to seven. It looked like they were about to go down, but at the last second, Lowry came in and took the ball from her teammate, much to Willamette's surprise because there was nobody around. Everybody just stopped and looked and went, where's she going? Well, she's gonna go score. <laughs> Especially because, you know, it was like when she got the ball, she was already full flight. I mean, it wasn't like she was right next to her, took the ball, then yeah, accelerated. She, she was already, yeah, she was already going. All right, and it looks like we may have a little bit of a shootout on our hands here as it's 5-7 early, and Willamette is now already across midfield. Possibly could be a high tackle there, but nothing's called. Into the ruck we go, and it looks like Willamette will win it, and they'll dip it out to the right. One more pass, it's a little high, stops momentum, and play will be stopped. That's going to be offsides on College of Idaho. I'm starting to get these hand signals. <laughs> you think you could go rough a game down there? No way. I think you should. <laughs> I don't think you, why not? What do you get to lose? Championship no match. Way. And ball kick forward there by Willamette. Down in the ruck we go, who will win it? Referee calls a stoppage, and the ball will be awarded to the College of Idaho for a tap and go penalty. Oh! Oh, met with a tackle right there. And it looks like Brooke Lowry wanted to stop play, but Willamette was not having any of it. And oh my oh, goodness, it happened another again! Another one! Running into destruction is Brooke Lowry. She has no fear. <laughs> and wins another foul. And they win another foul. Willamette not resetting for the ruck is the issue they're having currently. And then Ooh, here Gracie goes number Castillo 18. taking it all the way, it looks like. Gracie Castillo. There. No. Oh. But back up and in. Gracie Castillo converts the try. And just like that, it is 10 to 7. College of Idaho snatches the lead away from Willamette. I mean, it really just felt like all of a sudden the, the momentum has flipped. I mean, you know, College Vida has got just all of a sudden they took possession. They got a quick score to, to cut the deficit down to two and then got, got the ball back again and just continually finding these big plays in space against Willamette right now. Absolutely. 
And as the College of Idaho attempts the conversion here, it is up and it is good. Oh. Very, very important conversion there as that turns it into a five point game, meaning that a try will require a conversion from Willamette to take the lead back. Yeah, those penalties on that last position did not help Willamette at all. So I'm, see, I'm seeing a pattern here where it's Obviously, the possession, the more penalties it's messed with, it's not really helping out the opposition, so. Definitely, man. And as we come to halftime here of this 12 to seven game, who would you give the edge to right now, Alton? I think I'd give the edge to College of Idaho. I mean, you know, they've been a little bit more disciplined. I mean, they've had a few, uh, I would say, less fouls called on them right now. And then you got to consider too. I think their their quick restarts that they're they're given Willamette right now is just giving Willamette all, all kinds of fits. I mean, I, I think these quick restarts. I mean, we've seen them uh, after Willamette got their first, uh, you know, got their first try. How. Um, you know, we saw them go right down the field on a, on a quick play, and all of a sudden they got a, they got one of their own, and then um, another breakaway was off of a penalty. And then, um, so I think that's been the biggest thing is uh, Willamette's got to find a way to kind of stop these quick restarts from getting into these big open plays because that's where the College Vida has been feasting. Absolutely. What do you got, partner? Honestly, I think, uh, well, for Willamette, it's, they, they definitely got to find more more structure and composure out there. I think right now they're still kind of spreading themselves out. They're not making those one-on-one -on -one tackles like they need to to stop the offense from scoring. So I think they got to re-kind really of assess themselves off uh, defensively and then take that and also apply it to their offense. Absolutely, I agree. As we turn our attention back to the pitch here, we've got teams warming up for this next game, which is going to be Boise State's B team, fresh off of a recent 27-7 loss to the Colorado School of Mines, taking on Montana State, who we have not seen play for a couple hours now, very similar to Boise State's A team. They've had a big break. But the last time we saw Montana State, they were beating Colorado School of Mines 15-5. So logic would have you assume that Montana State will win this game, but as we have seen elsewhere, especially in the Western Oregon Willamette game, crazier things have happened. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think going into the game, you've got to probably look at Montana State being the favorite, just considering um, not only their own results today, but also um, neutral results between both teams. And I think um, it's going to be a tall task for Boise State's B team, but, you know, maybe they can uh, catch, uh, take advantage because there's probably going to be a little bit of an adjustment period for Montana State because, like you said, they haven't played for a couple of hours. Absolutely. And so we reset here with the referee having some conversations with his side judge. Looks like Willamette will kick to the College of Idaho to start this second half here. College of Idaho looking to build on their lead and Willamette looking to play some strong defense, get the ball back and go get a try of their own to tie this ball game up. Another big thing I think for Willamette too, they've got to they got to find a way to possess the, the, the ball more. I mean, I feel like I don't remember any of their possessions really outside of their, the one that they scored on. Uh, I feel like they've when they've had the ball, they've immediately turned it right back over. So got to find a way to possess the ball a little bit more in this half. Well, that's a good kick there by Willamette. And immediately they're pinning College of Idaho deep. College of Idaho coming down the right side and they got their speedster back in the game. That's Salipa Swai, the freshman who has scored a couple tries already. But she gives the ball up. Willamette's got it back. And there will be a penalty. It'll be a tap and go for Willamette. Let's see if they take advantage of it by playing quickly. They swing it out to the right. The College of Idaho's got some pretty good defense. And we will be resetting. It's an offside on the College of Idaho. We'll be moving the ball up and it'll be a tap and go penalty from there. K. Messina, number 27 from Southern Utah, looks to be okay. I didn't get a look at her leaving the pitch. I'm looking down at their team right now, and I can't tell if she is there. Oh, number uh, 22 there with a the score, or with a try, I should say. Ah, perfect. I look away for a second. It was a really impressive play there from Willamette. Nice composure to just and to... And the kick is almost made. Maybe Missed it by no it more than a feet, but we're tied up at 12 to 12. Yeah, and you know, it was interesting because watching, they got the compo they got their composure back. It was a great kickoff for the, or to start of that half for them, pinning in College of Idaho deep, going in 
uh, getting a turnover there, and then got a little bit lucky uh, on the offside call because they had actually just uh, you know thrown the ball away, and um, they were able to take advantage of that Idaho penalty and were able to punch it in the next play. Well, we're all knotted up here at 12 with five minutes left to go. Willamette jumping down College of Idaho's throat early in this second half and tying this ball game up. Let's see if they can build on that momentum or let's see if College of Idaho can regain their footing there. I'm telling you, the College of Idaho, if they can get it to number 14, Swy in space, then nobody can catch her. College of Idaho dragging defenders trying to get back closer to midfield. Yeah, that was uh, Gracie Castillo, who's been a very uh, prominent figure in this game here for the Yotes. We've been hearing her name a lot today. Into the ruck we go one more time. College of Idaho taking a second to get it out and it lugs it into the right. Trying to cut straight up now. Can they break a tackle? Oh, good hands there from Willamette to Snagger. Out to the left we go this time. College of Idaho. Uh -oh. oh, good pass. Uh -oh. And all of a sudden we got space. Guess who? Gracie Castillo. Who else? Almost into the attacking third now are the Yotes, but we'll have a stoppage of play. That is a diving penalty. On the Yotes. Which means it will be a tap and go for Willamette. Maybe they'll be able to capitalize on this like they did on their last possession. Obviously they're bouncing back a little bit. And you know how we talked about how they didn't have like, you know, the the, uh, the structure. Well, uh -oh, it looks like they found here we that go. here. Here goes Willamette. Swy, the only one that could bring them down and they do. And immediately the ball's turned over to the College of Idaho. Great take down there by Swy and a great job of ripping the ball away. And there's a tap and go there for the College of Idaho and they kind of catch Willamette off guard, but ooh, that was a stick right there. College of Idaho picks it back up. That's Gracie Castillo on the left side. Looking for a teammate, looking for help, looking for anybody. Nope, looking for Green. Ooh, Finally right gets brought down there. on the attacking side. College of Idaho goes quickly into the ruck, trying to take advantage of numbers. Back into the ruck they go there. A quick pick up from the College of Idaho, trying to break away. A little bit of pick up and tackle, pick up and tackle being played right now. Now will be a penalty on the College of Idaho. It'll be a tap and go back to Willamette. I feel like that the next team to score in this game, I think they're going to be the ones to win because I'm not sure that there's going to be multiple scores left in this game. With two minutes and 30 seconds left and our last score happening at the 5.30 mark, three minutes of not scoring would mean you're right. And as we say that, the old announcer's jinx coming on right now. <laughs> Willamette's breaking away. That is Raya Hirsch, the freshman. She will not be caught, and she will convert the try. Very important for Willamette there. 17 to 12, Willamette takes the lead off of the run from Raya Hirsch. She found a hole, and she hit it hard, busted through, and she went 50 meters untouched. This will be a big try or a big con uh, conversion attempt as well. If they're able to get this. That forces the College of Idaho to have to get one if they're able to tie the game back up. And it is good. That is a big, big conversion with a minute and a half left to go in this one. Forcing the College of Idaho, who has made a kick this game, mind you, to score a try and then convert the kick to tie it up. I'm or rather, good. oh, go on. No, uh, I was going to say, the big thing for them in these next, you know, this next minute, minute and a half is just going to be for the College of Idaho. Are they going to be able to finish some of these long, sustained spells of possession that they've had? I mean, they've had a few uh, possessions here in, in the last few minutes where they're getting down the field, but they're not finding a way to finish. Absolutely. College of Idaho's got the ball here in their own half. Good tackle there from Willamette into the ruck we go. College of Idaho having to get back and reset a little bit. But there will be a penalty on Willamette that will allow him a little more space with the tap and go. College of Idaho trying to bust through now. Both teams seeking their first win here. Willamette looks to have it in hand right now, but College of Idaho has about 45 more seconds to prove otherwise. 
tap and go for Willamette. College of Idaho is going to need to find possession back and they're going to need to find it in a hurry. Willamette on the other hand is trying to find the score to ice this game, which they may just have if they make one more pass. It's Grace Rogers on the outside. Oh, she sneaks right in. And she's still got it down that ball. She will. Grace Rogers scores what should be the icing on the cake for Willamette in their first victory here in the Fool's Gold Tournament. 24 to 12, Willamette leads the Yotes. What a way to respond, though, the, from Willamette. I mean, the way that this game, you know, it started for them. I mean, and the way the way that they had to come back into the into this game and just being able to keep building and not really letting the College of Idaho build on that lead any more than they did, and that's led to their first victory of the tournament. Yeah, what a big uh, progress they've made in their own game. Honestly, we saw how they started at the beginning and where they were in the previous game to see kind of how everything aligned for them here. I think they were playing a lot better rugby these last few minutes, and I think it kind of goes and shows in their success right now. Well, a ferocious second half comeback here from Willamette, you know, paint my face, put a nose on me and call me a clown because I thought the College of Idaho was the better team there in that first half. Willamette proved me very wrong in a very impressive way here in the second half. Well, Lamb, it's got the ball back here. It's Grace Rogers, who just had the try a moment ago. Looking to hold on to the ball. Oh, a great little layoff there. That's number 13. That's going to be Grace Jackson, the junior for Willamette, scores another one. And if there was any hope left for the College of Idaho, unfortunately, it is all gone now as Willamette has poured on 24 points here in this second half. We'll mark that 0 for 1 for the bold prediction of only being one more score left in the game. Will Willamette took that personally. I would not bet if I were any of us. <laughs> <laughs> and the final score of this game, folks, is going to be Willamette 33, the College of Idaho 12, as both of these two teams' tournaments come to an end. The College of Idaho, unfortunately, ends this tournament 0-3. Willamette ends it with a one in each column. One win, one loss, and one draw. It was a great game for Willamette. I mean, they, they made some adjustments at halftime because, like you said, I mean, the College of Idaho at, the, at halftime was the better team, and uh, they found a way to make some adjustments um, and, and really just kind of cut down on the mistakes, cut down on their turnovers a little bit. They were able to find some big plays, which helped them pull away. Well, I think it goes back to something that we mentioned earlier, was just every step's not only just much more intentional, but every step's more important and counts towards the score and just your overall play style. And obviously, uh, Willamette just got the job done today. All right, we have some shout outs to catch up on here. Drew French says BSU is unmatched. Beth Walsh says for the next game, this game that's coming up here, shout out to Riley Walsh, number eight, and the Montana State University Bobcats. Love from mom and dad. Oh, Beth, that's very sweet. If Riley watches this back, I'm sure she'll hear it. Thank you all for participating in the chat today. We still got a couple games left, so if you guys want to shout out your favorite player, you know, your daughter, aunt, cousin, whoever, <laughs> you know, throw it in the chat. We'll be happy to give the shout out. Andrew Vincent, a UTP alum, says UTP rocks the boys. Andrew Vincent, an alum of ours who actually, I, I believe, well, is working at, at yes, your station. He does, yes. yeah, I know Andrew. Yeah. I remember he did this game last fall, or he did the uh, the, la uh, the uh, rugby tournament in the fall, um, and did a pretty good job. I think it was just it was just him and one of the uh, one of the uh, r local rugby parents who right. and who was willing to help out, and um, they did the whole tournament together. Ironically enough, that was actually some of the the video I watched the last few days <laughs> in getting in preparation for this tournament. So glad to see that uh, you know hard work pays off. All right, we are now underway here. Yes, we are now underway here in the last game of Pool B. It will be Boise State's B team taking on Montana State. Montana State, if they win, will secure a date with Boise State's A team in the championship game. Boise State's B team, if they win, they're going to need to score a lot of points to make up that point differential. But theoretically, there is a chance. Fellas, what are you thinking for this game? Well, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting to see. Um, I think Boise State B, they're going to have to start fast. I think they're going to have to take advantage of any potential 
mistakes that Montana State might be more likely to make early on just because it's been a little while like uh, since they have last played. I mean, it's been a couple of hours and, you know, those sometimes you're just you get out of sorts while you're resting for that long and it's going to be important for them to start fast. But I'm predicting Montana State. What do you got? Well, uh, given the situation that Boise State B was playing with last game, I think they just need to be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more collaborative on their efforts, but I would like to see them be more explosive than their first game. I think they just, you know, they had great ideas, they just didn't get the execution done right. Maybe it'll show in this game against Montana State. So I'm kind of, I'm going to root for Boise State on this one. As a reminder, everybody, Boise State B lost their first game against the Colorado School of Mines by a score of 27 to 7. Montana State won their first game against Colorado School of Mines by a score of 15 to 5. And yes, a little update here. Andrew Vincent, the person we were talking about earlier, he graduated last semester and is now a reporter for KBOI's Channel 2. He graduated from this UTP program and is now working in the job that we all want. A sure sign that this program is a path to success. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Absolutely. And here we are two minutes into the game with the score still 0-0. Zero to zero. Boise State resetting here, a quick tap and go. That's going to be number six, Brooklyn Smith. Brooklyn Smith encroaching in on the five meter mark. Ball bouncing around a little bit. Montana State trying to fight back for possession, but Boise State wins it in the ruck. Montana State knocks it away. Boise State gets it back. Very ferocious play going on right now, and a penalty will be called. That was very great aggression from Boise State B right there. And I think that's kind of like the play style they need to have for the rest of the game today, bouncing back from the loss earlier today. Absolutely. I think, too, the big thing for them is they're going to just have their they're doing a good job of limiting what Montana State's been able to do in this opening three, three, three and a half minutes so far. And the more that they're able to keep them away from their half of the field, the better. Absolutely. As Montana State ball rolls around a little bit, but they win it in the scrum. Montana State trying to fight out of their own defensive half here. Boise State's trying to keep them in it. Gang tackling going on all around by Boise State. Uh-oh, but a breakaway. Here goes Montana State. Does anybody have the legs to catch her? The one person who might have does not. That's going to be number 12 for Montana State, Bridget Crowley. She received, she received a shout-out earlier, and now she's got five points for her team. It's amazing what a shout-out can do to a person, huh? Absolutely. 5-0 Bobcats here. Bridget Crowley. 60 meters untouched, bust straight through the defensive line, and in seven, all you got to do is make one person miss. You know, it's crazy there. Boise State actually had the numeric or the numbers advantage on the edge there. Um, that kick is no good off to the left, 5-0 still. Actually had the numbers advantage on the edge for the contain, but um, they just got their gaps wrong there. And it was a great run there by, by Crowley, just able to, to see the gap, sprint through it, and as soon as she got through, there was no one in position to catch her. Well, after a promising start there for the Broncos that saw them get all the way within five meters of scoring a try, Montana State turns it right around and they take the lead. Now the Broncos have a hole to dig themselves out of, something they were not able to do in their last game. I think the big thing is going to be avoiding a, such a monumental deficit that you have to climb multiple possessions. One or two isn't a big deal, but three and four, that's asking a lot. Absolutely, and that'll be a knock on by Boise State as they were not able to properly receive that. Montana State will be able to feed the ball into the scrum. I think another thing for Boise State B here as well is just minimizing those penalties and being able to just have possession as quickly but as effectively as possible for them, especially with a team that's starting to build momentum like Montana State right now. Absolutely. Montana State feeds it in. And it'll be kicked out. Montana State's going to exit to the left and try to make, take advantage. Oh, a little loop going on right here. Nice little layoff there for Montana State. Oh, good hit there. Aggressive hit. That's Boots Eastland. One of the coolest names of this tournament. Delivers a massive hit. There's a little tap and go for Montana State. Montana State now within 10 meters. Ball's pulled out of the ruck there. That's going to be number 12 for Montana State. That is Bridget wow. Crowley. Bridget Crowley, Bridget Crowley. Say her name twice. She scored two tries. We are 
over five minutes into this first half here with Bridget Crowley 10, Boise State 0. How about it? Yeah, I mean, the, the Bridget Crowley breakout game and, uh, you know, I think... Uh, and that kick will be good off the uprights. Wow. A little doink, 12-0 Bobcats. As we reset here, that hole we were talking about, Boise State not digging themselves in. They're doing it again, guys. They're doing it again. Well, they're, they just got to clean up some, the, the fundamentals. I think the big thing is they just, when they've had the ball, they've not been able, since that opening possession, they've just not been able to really do much with it. And I think that's going to be the key because you can't have the ball and not get points against a team as good as Montana State. A great boot there by Montana State as they were almost able to pick it up off the kick without a Boise State player touching it. And then some aggressive play. Montana State barreling over the ruck. We will have a scrum. Very good play there. Montana State really got up in their business and made it personal, knocked them back and was able to force this scrum. Well, I think another thing is too, they're really showing and demonstrating why they're one of the crowd favorites and you know, potential tournament winners for this evening, so. Absolutely. And that ball is booted forward, but we have a whistle first. And that is the halftime whistle. Going into the half, our score is going to be the Montana State Bobcats 12, Boise State Broncos B team zero. As a reminder again for everybody who may have just joined the live stream, you're joining a little late, but we're happy to have you anyways. We are University Television Productions, and this is coverage of the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Tournament live here from Boise State University on the Lincoln Intramural Field. I am Riley. This is my friend, KBOI Intern Juan, and then this is my fellow UTP student, Alton Dillis, and we are happy, happy, happy to be with you today. It's been a really fun day, guys. Yeah, it's been a great day of games. Um, you know, Honestly, uh, we had the snow delay, but you know it's been it's been a pretty comfortable day. I think just to see, watch all the games and and see how these teams have matched up today. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, How's it been? You enjoy it? Oh, I'm enjoying it a lot. Honestly, the warmer weather wouldn't be upset about. But honestly, I think I'm just I'm just amazed that earlier this morning this field was just blanketed in white snow, and now you can almost tell that there was none here. Yeah. I think that's the hilarious part. A very, very massive shout out to all of the parents and all of the players that spent the better part of two hours this morning shoveling off this field oh, and making yeah. it playable. Uh, that snow delay could have been much, much longer than a 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. one hour delay. We could have not been kicking this thing off until 11.30 or noon if we didn't have the people with the shovels putting in the work as they did. And it wasn't just shovels, too. We saw people pushing lacrosse nets. We saw people kicking snow off the field with their feet. I mean, people were doing all sorts of things. That's dedication right there, if that ever heard it. Well, this is a very big tournament out here for Boise State. This is their marquee tournament of the year, so... Anything to host it. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, wh how both of these teams are going to come out here, you know, in, in the second half. I think that um, it's going to be interesting to watch just because, I mean, Montana State, it felt like it was, they were just calm. They waited for their, their opportunities to strike, and then they took advantage of what, what Boise State B, uh, B team was giving them. And on the other side, it felt like Boise State was trying their best to find some opportunities, but it just kept slipping through their fingers. I think. It's going to be interesting to see if they're going to try to both come out you know, fast or if they're going to just try to play calm and in control and wait to see what the other team's going to give them. A couple of shout-outs here to go through. we got Brink Cooch and Broad. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but let's go Cooch and Broad. Go Cats. That is Annika Cooch and Broad. He is talking about. AV says, let's go, y'all killing it. Denise T says, amazing job. Jesse, that would be Jesse Tuggy, number one, Montana State. Kate Kuchenbrod says, W Cats. James McGeady says, Bridget Crowley is a savage. She has certainly been carrying it this game. Judy Nelson says, Grace Jackson, woot. And then Vicki Gardner says, go Montana State. Nice job, Sam Gardner. Thank you all. And once again, as a reminder, keep participating in the YouTube live chat. We love it and we'll be happy to shout out any player that you mention. As oh, we have wow. a ball kicked way, way forward there. Broncos and Bobcats chasing it alike, and the Bobcats will win it. Deep in their own defensive territory. Great kick there by the Broncos. I wasn't able to see who put a foot on it. But that will be a knock 
by Montana State, meaning that that kick will pay off well for the Broncos as they are now in the attacking third, looking to split this lead almost in half. Yeah, hopefully they do something with this possession here as they have a great field advantage and uh, be able to even just get the two-point conversion outside of that try. And we've got the Broncos feeding the ball into the scrum now. And they win it quickly and they exit it out to the left. Another kick forward. This may have been a halftime strategy adjustment of theirs, but Montana State picks this one up easily. Montana State breaking tackles, and finally they're down into the ruck. No, never mind. It was picked up by Boise State quickly. Yeah, she had nowhere to go on that possession right there. No, there's nowhere to go on that possession, but... Oh, and we have an injured Bobcat down on the field. That injured Bobcat will be number 14, Gracie Svetkovic-Wicks. Svetkovic-Wicks, the senior from Missoula, Montana, and I hope she's all right. As these games are starting to get more aggressive and they're starting to mean a little bit more, you'll start to see people put their bodies on the line a little bit more, and unfortunately, you will see injuries every once in a while, but we hope she's up and moving quickly as the teams gather. Rain's starting to fall a little bit harder now. It was a light drizzle earlier, and now you can call it something that resembles more of a rain. <laughs> I'm from Seattle, so I mean, this is still a drizzle to me, but I've also grown a little soft in my time out here in Boise. <laughs> Likewise, as a, I don't even, I'm, in Texas, I think we'd also consider this just a light drizzle, so. Well, in Texas, it's all or nothing, right? Yeah, it's right, either exactly. no rain, 90 yeah. and sunny, or uh, it's raining cats and dogs. Yeah, well, everything's bigger in Texas, so, I mean, it makes, it. it is, of course, going to be cats and dogs or nothing, right? Absolutely. Well, what part of Texas are you from? Uh, Dallas. Dallas, okay, okay. Where are you? Uh, Harlingen, so a little bit more down south. Harlingen, right yeah. on. Very interesting. All right, and as a reminder to the viewers at home, this is going to be the last game from Pool 2. Pool 1 has already concluded with Boise State A winning it and securing the one seed, which means the two seed in Pool 2 will be Southern Utah and the three seed, or the two seed in Pool 1 rather, will be Southern Utah and the three seed will be the University of Northern Colorado. In Pool 2, one seed is on the line right here in this game. If Montana State wins, they will take it. If Boise State wins and they get the score advantage, they will take it. But if this result holds, it will be Montana State playing Boise State A in the one seed game. It will be, as I do some quick mental math here, it will be uh, Colorado School of Mines playing Southern Utah in the two game, and then it will be Boise State B playing Northern Colorado in the three game. It's going to be interesting. I mean, you know, like Kyle said at the beginning of the day, you know, he thought that um, his two favorites coming into the, you know, two of his favorites coming into this tournament were Montana State and Boise State A. So, and, you know, if this result holds, that would be the championship game, and that, you know, good call from him at the beginning. Well, man's an oracle as Gracie comes off of the field. We have Drew French saying, shout out to Sean, our sir. Georgia Clendening saying, Riley is an awesome host. Georgia, we would have loved to have you here today. I'm sorry that you called out at the 11th hour. You would have been a wonderful camera op. We got Dragonfire saying, I remember doing this shoot when I was in UTP. I know how cold y'all are up there in the Lincoln garage. Doing a great job though, Dragonfire. It's freezing, but I appreciate it. Dragonfire, if you throw your real name in the chat, I bet you Nathan Snyder remembers you. And then we got Christy Lee saying, go Madison Lee, good rucking. Let's see, under, let's see the action's back underway now after that injury. And the action back underway. Boise State still attacking. But it appears that we are going to have a forward pass call. Montana State will get it in the ruck, or in the scrum, rather. The player coming off with a little bit of a hobble there for Boise State. Reaches the sideline okay. Ball goes in, and 
went out quickly, and here's a little bit of a loop from Montana State, and that player who just went out comes right back in, almost makes the tackle, but all of a sudden, guess who it is? Bridget Crowley breaks another tackle. A miraculous individual feat by Bridget Crowley, and she has her third try of the game. Bridget Crowley leaving Broncos in her wake. There's a litter of Bronco bodies over the field as Bridget Crowley pranced into the uh, end zone there. I mean, she's just feasting right now. I mean, right, got the ball well into the Bobcats half of the field and just made everybody look silly. I mean, outrunning people, making them, juking them out, making a move. I mean, incredible plays there. And she has single-handedly dragged Montana State to a 19 to nothing lead right now. As I hold the chat in my hand before I respond to this, let's get some Bridget Crowley's in the chat. Possible player of the tournament here just based off of the performance in this game. Maria Donovan may have something to say about that later, but very, very impressive individual effort. Looking forward to seeing the two of them squaring off later. Georgia says, definitely upset I couldn't make it. Well, yeah, we are too, and I don't really think you're that upset. Um, and then Dragonfire <laughs> says, Nathan will remember Anthony Lazardi. I started doing Nathan quotes for him. Anthony, I have a book that I have read of Nathan quotes. Nathan is nodding. You are the one that wrote that. I love that book. I'll go through it pretty much every day in class, and I'll pull out one just to throw out and see if anybody recognizes that I'm doing a Nathan quote. As we turn our attention back to the action here, we have Montana State feeding into a scrum, pressing up on their fourth try of the game here. The score is 19 to zero as Montana State has scored three tries and has made two conversions. Montana State really looking to put this game away here with just under two minutes left now, and they're within five meters of another try. Ball's in, being hooked around, and it's won by Boise State. Great win there. And ball now being bounced around, kicked out. Who's gonna get it on the bounce? It's Boise State who gets it on the bounce. Into the ruck we go. Let's see if Boise State can control it. No, we are going to have a penalty. And it'll be a quick tap and go penalty. It'll be won by Montana State. And the ball was dropped, but... You know, that may actually be a knock, guys. Let's see what they end up calling here. I don't know. That's. That ball may have been dropped forward when she went in the end zone, and if that's the case, then that'll be a knock. And it looks like that could have been the call because they're walking away from the end zone. That looks like that definitely may be the call. No, never mind. They will award the try to Montana State in the conversion. Great kick. Excellent kick, but it's missed off to the right. It will now be Montana State 24, Boise State B Team 0. Boise State B Team, unfortunately, today has just run into two teams that got a little bit more together than they do right now. Colorado School of Mines was able to run it up on them earlier, and now Montana State's doing the same thing. They have done some very good things today, though, this Boise State B team. It's been a couple of tough results, but they got a lot of positive stuff going on right now. They put together some good possessions and played some good rugby today. I think that's a good silver lining of it, right? You just gain the experience. You get to go out there, you get to compete, and just have a fun time doing it. Well, and ultimately, too, you know, this is just people learning the game for the most part. You know, very few of these people have prior rugby experience. And so you go out there, you have some fun with your friends, and you learn a new game, and you learn eventually over time how to be good at it. It's a great way to put it. And, you know, I mean, that's a good point about the, the tough competition they've had to play today I mean they've played two um, of the better teams in the tournament in their you know in their pool so absolutely as we have Montana State now dragging Boise State defenders within five meters of the try Montana State exit out to the right one more pass and oh, just about a meter short here coming up very close though and there is the dive to convert the try I will try to see a jersey number on that, but another try for Montana State, and the score is 29 to zero, Bobcats lead. Well, I've been impressed at the determination of the Bobcats here in the second half. I mean, they've, I mean, they, they were the better team in the first half. And but that kick is good, 31 to zero. We're the better team in the first half, but they've continued 
to uh, apply the pressure all second half and they're gonna get a comfortable win as a result. Yes, they will. Final score, 31 to zero as the rain begins to fall even harder here in Boise. Montana State secures a berth in the championship game where they will take on the Boise State A team coming up in approximately one hour here. As we switch to the last of the Pool 3 games here, guys, we got Western Oregon University taking on the University of Idaho. Western Oregon today is one and one in their game. No, one, zero and one. One win, no losses, and then the draw against Westman, or uh, Willamette, whereas the University of Idaho has won both of their games. So, winner takes all here in Pool 3. Wasn't drawn up that way, but we have the de facto Pool 3 championship game about to kick off right here. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how this one plays out. I mean, they they both have played um, some interesting games today, but um, they're both technically undefeated. So it's gonna be interesting to see how this one plays out. I think if Western Oregon's able to to be um, more in control, I think I like them in this matchup. Well, the University of Idaho just had a brilliant kickoff that sent Western Oregon all the way into their own end zone, and now they have the ball five meters out as a result of that. And look at the sheer strength it's taking just to get the run going down there. Well, University of Idaho here, they're really pressing, trying to get in, and just like that, they will possibly. Let's see what the referee ends up deciding here. Don't know if I saw a ruling, but it looks like they're going to give them the try. Now, see, that was kind of hard to tell because she dug the ball in initially, yeah. and then she did that little leap forward there and redug it. And so, yeah, but it looks like, yeah, it looks like they're going to give it to her. So it's going to be a good start here for the University of Idaho. Very good start there for the University of Idaho as they are up five to zero early. We got some very enthusiastic fans over there. I could hear them all the way from here with my headsets on. That's pretty impressive. Just shows the amount of passion going on here for the Pool 3 championship game. Absolutely, and Idaho boots it off to Western Oregon. Let's see if Western Oregon's got a response as we are only a minute and a half into this first half. Very, very big hit there from Lucy McDougall, the junior, but Western Oregon responds quickly. Western Oregon trying to press, trying to get closer to midfield. Into the ruck they go, and they're going to take it out to the right. Shoving off defenders is Western Oregon's number two, Jada Miller. And there we are, all good. Into the ruck we go, out to the left we go. Western Oregon's across midfield here. Continuing fighting. That is Estella Miranda Aguilar. Pass back. That was a good and bit. that will be a penalty on Western Oregon by the looks of it. So it'll be a scrum that Idaho gets defeated into. Sorry, what were you saying? I was gonna say it was looking good there until they were just misplaced a pass. And I think that's what they're calling on the penalty here, which I think this will be a very evenly matched game just watching these two teams line up against each other. I think they play very complimentary rugby. I think they also have very similar play styles, uh, which is a very ironic. Even like in their lineups here after the scrum, it's uh, very evenly spaced, very consistent on both ends. It's gonna be an interesting matchup for sure. Well, yeah, as, um, as Kyle was saying earlier, just because they're small schools doesn't necessarily mean they're bad at rugby. And I would say that these two schools are pretty good for how new their rugby programs are. You know, the size of their schools and such. As Idaho has the ball here, it's Lucy McDougald. Lucy McDougald, the junior, breaking free. Can anybody catch her? The only person who has a hope is Emily Moore, and she will not. University of Idaho scores again, and they are up 10 to zero. I believe that's her second of the game as well. Lucy McDougall with two early scores. 
That left side is absolutely eating up Western Oregon right now. And if they want a chance at winning this pool three group, they're going to need to stop the bleeding now. Very impressive start here though from, from Idaho. I mean, going fast and they've they've really taken it to Western Oregon and Western Oregon was trying to get some, you know, uh, get some momentum back by slowly moving the ball down the field, but we're able to get a stop and then immediately took advantage. They absolutely have. As we go back to the chat now here, folks, Drew French says, let's go BSUA. Jordan Scott says, let's go Jada. Number two, let's fight. Andrea Moser says, let's go cats. Hansi Food Signs says, stay calm, Wolves. We got this. Well, your Wolves are going to need to have a good last little stretch of this first half here to get back in this thing for the second half. Coach Smith, we love you, says Hansi Food Signs, as does uh, Hansi Food Signs also says, work oh, together, ladies. Six. And then Jackie Miller says, go Jada Miller, as Western Oregon is now on the breakaway. Number six, that's Tessa Medina. Tessa Medina, she's got people to throw to if she does, and she will. Western Oregon will cut this lead in half with a very impressive run there by Tessa Medina. What a play there from Western Oregon. I mean, got a great kick there out of their own end zone to get out of, um, to kind of get out of trouble there. And then from there, they just had too, too many numbers there on that on the edge, on that far side of the field. And that kick will be no good. It'll be 10 to five. Western Oregon cuts the lead in half. And it uh, led to a numbers advantage, three on one all the way down the field. And it's a big play for them because now it puts them back into the conversation here. One possession game with minute, minute and a half left in the first half. Absolutely. Right in the thick of it we are. Oh, but I think this would be very great for who, uh, you know, whoever gets the ball off in the first half or the second half. It'll be nice to see who uh, ends out on top on that, that run right there. Idaho with the ball at the Western Oregon kick. Oh, good contact there, but a nice little layoff from Idaho keeps the ball alive. Idaho fighting upfield, and we've got a penalty called. That'll be a penalty on Western Oregon, giving Idaho a tap and go. Lexi Verhage draws the penalty. The captain and also, fun fact, a player coach, guys. Idaho has no head coach. See, she is the coach. Oh, really? That's yes. very impressive, actually, to do two jobs. And the head coach, oh, a little bit too aggressive a pass there. Idaho will have to reset. But that's Lucy McDougall, who's already scored two for him. On the left side there, Wolves swarming. Vandals are able to get it. Oh, that's a great hit right there. Jada Miller laying the wood. We will have a penalty as Lucy McDougall is slow to get up. I would be too if Jada Miller hit me like that. I think if any of them hit me like that, I'd be <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Idaho here with the tap and go. They'll immediately drop it back. Idaho looking for the open. Oh, great interception there. Idaho gets the ball back now. Western Oregon still pressing though, forcing Idaho to go further and further back towards their own try line. Good tackles and good defense by Western Oregon. They're not giving Idaho an inch to breathe right now. Out to the left, Idaho is trying to find more space there. Into the ruck we go, ladies fighting over the ball. Idaho gets it and it's a boot down. Smart play by Idaho there just to get that ball out of the way and out of danger. And now, oh, another kick. Another kick. And Idaho seems to have to step, but Western Oregon closing it fast. Great fight there all around, and the ball will roll out of bounds. It will be a line out. And the line out will be awarded to, by the looks of it, Idaho. It looks like Western Oregon touched it last. But regardless, it will not matter as it appears that we have reached halftime. And that's the kind of effort you need if you're gonna stay in the uh, in contention here. I mean, between these two teams, I mean, seriously, I mean, a 
not only was Idaho getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, then a smart kick manages to push the ball down the field, get them out of trouble, and all of a sudden it looks like they're on the opportunity to potentially grab a try of their own. And then another great hustle from Western Oregon puts the ball out of play right as we hit halftime. I mean, that's just such great effort at both ends of the field by both these teams. Absolutely, and we apologize right now for our scoreboard malfunctioning, folks. We're trying to figure that out up here in the booth in the garage, but our score at halftime is five to five. Western Oregon, the University of Idaho are tied at five to five. We erroneously gave the University of Idaho a try that they did not actually convert. So it is just five to five, one try and a failed conversion for each team here at halftime. Fellas, second half, what are we thinking? Man, I don't know. It's been such an end to end the game. I mean, I'm not really sure what you know what to expect from the second half other than it's probably going to keep going to be honest because uh, they, both these teams they've been so evenly matched I mean we saw Idaho strike first look like they're going to hold the momentum all of a sudden Western Oregon made a, made some quick adjustments got a quick break on the other end and then they were pushing towards the end of the half there so I really don't know if I can pick absolutely yeah I still think it's anybody's game honestly I think both teams have capitalized on each other's mistakes but at the same time too they're still making them themselves accessible and where they need to and exposing those gaps but there's still a lot of game left still a lot of game left in these next seven minutes well as another reminder we are university television productions we are a program here at boise state that focuses on pretty much all things media we run a live show that comes out about once a week depending on how top of it we are uh, we are led by our executive producer and our fearless leader nathan snyder we are forever grateful for him uh, we are bringing you coverage of the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Tournament hosted by Boise State University and held on the campus of Boise State University at the prestigious Lincoln Intramural Field. We are in the last pool play game here before we get into seeded playoff play. We are in the de facto Pool 3 championship game watching Western Oregon and Idaho currently locked in a stalemate to see who will come away as victors of Pool 3 the small college division. Idaho receives the kick and immediately they're into the attack. This second half already starting with a lot more pace than the first half ended with. And that is going to be Lexi Verhage, the player coach out on the side and that was a forward pass. Good momentum there for Idaho squashed out by the mistake from the player coach. And so close there to a break, too, because that's exactly the kind of scenario you want. I mean, it's, you know, your speedster who's already scored, you know, and had some big plays today, just, um, you know, out in space, but just not quite able to line up with the ball carrier there initially and leads to a costly penalty. Exactly. Western Oregon now has the right to feed the ball into the scrum after the Idaho penalty, and let's see if they can win possession here and get the ball moving the other way. They can win possession, but Idaho's immediately all over. It doesn't matter. Western Oregon gets it out to the right. They've got numbers if they get it all the way out to the side, and they will not. Instead, there is a referee down. Yeah, we had a referee take a tumble there, and so play was stopped temporarily. I hope she's all right. Getting thumbs up from everybody. That's good to see. Looks like the referee collided with the Western Oregon player, so we will reset play. I think that's a moving screen on the referee. <laughs> Very grateful to all of our referees for coming out today. It's been cold for every single fan, player, broadcaster, media member, and referee out here. Been a good day all around. Western Oregon will enter the ball into the scrum here at almost exactly midfield. Could be more level of a game. 5-5 five, five and the ball's exactly at midfield. Western Oregon hooks it out onto their end and immediately they are met. That'll be a high tackle by the looks of it on Idaho. Western Oregon gets the ball. I'm not sure what that last call was there. That was going to be an offsides. The tap and go, you got to be 10 meters back. And number 15 for Idaho, Lucy McDougald, was not 10 meters back. And she was express expressing her displeasure to the referee over that call. Western Oregon now trying to attack. 
Only one or two more people to beat. Nice little layoff right there. Western Oregon, can they get some room? Things are moving in the right direction for him right now. That's Jada Miller. Jada Miller still fighting off defenders. Jada Miller still working her way down. Jada Miller lays it off at the very last moment, and that's going to be Estella Miranda Aguilar with the try. Looks like we may have a down wolf down there. We've got players down for both Idaho and Western Oregon. That was a very chaotic sequence that ended in Estella Miranda Aguilar, the junior, number seven, converting the try and putting Western Oregon up. Now, 12 to five, since the conversion is good. It was a great bit of team play there. I mean, they did such a good job, Western Oregon, moving down the field, and they took advantage of several costly penalties from the University of Idaho and just helped to sustain themselves, finding those openings, wearing down the University of Idaho's defense, and eventually they found their way through, courtesy of Jada Miller, who uh, was able to make some plays to get through the team. Absolutely. And so now with our score at 12 to five, does the University of Idaho, who started this game up, have a response? We will see right here as Western Oregon lines up for the kick. I think the University of Idaho is gonna have to work through the center of the field a lot. They've got really good talent in the center of the field that makes really good passes. And if they can get that ball out to Lucy McDougall on the outside, I think they'll have a lot of success. Ball bouncing around out there still. Looks like that'll be a knock on Idaho. Western Oregon will get it. Big thing here for Idaho, you gotta remember is you got you still got plenty of time. You still got a little over three minutes or so and left in this in the second half here. So you've got plenty of time, so there's no need to, to get into panic mode yet. You can still kind of play your game. You just gotta make sure that you get that you know, get the ball back and start really trying to push for that equalizer. Absolutely. Western Oregon lining up to feed it into the scrum here. Western Oregon gets it and they're immediately looking to work it left. Pass are not completed, almost picked up by McDougal. She could have been on the run if she got that. Scrapping around, Western Oregon ends up with it. Very, very strong hands there from Western Oregon to hold on to that one. Had a vandal scrapping at it, but managed to have those sticky fingers. Western Oregon still with the ball taken down. Into the ruck we go. Slowing the game down a little bit here. Letting everybody reset, offense and defense. Move close to getting intercepted there. Very close to getting intercepted, but still Western Oregon holding on to the ball, maintaining possession, doing a really good job of it. And that ball will fall forward. Western Oregon will pick it up. Referee will allow play to continue. Into the ruck we go. Western Oregon's gonna exit it out to the right. Let's see if they can get something going here. And they just might have something going. That's Jada Miller. Within 10 meters now, referee blows the whistle. It'll be a tap and go for Western Oregon. Let's see if they can catch Idaho off guard quickly. We've seen that happen a few times today. This is a pivotal moment though. They've, University of Idaho, if they want to win this game, they've got to stand tall here. Absolutely, they do. They've got to stop them. Number four for Western Oregon, whose name, unfortunately, I do not have on my roster, charges forward into the ruck we go, right into the hands of Claire Rickus. And Claire Rickus will convert the try. Claire Rickus, one of the two team captains, the other being Emily Moore, converts the try. And with that, it is 17 to five. Western Oregon up on the University of Idaho. I mean, there's still a chance for University of Idaho. I think it's just gonna have to be very aggressive and penalty free, but. That's true, and the kick is good, making it 19 to five. And that'll be it, folks. That's your ball game. Pool play is done. Western Oregon is your pool three small school champions. Congratulations to the Western Oregon Wolves. A very, very exceptional display of rugby from them today, especially from their leaders, Claire Rickus, Emily Moore, and we cannot talk about Western Oregon without talking about Jada Miller and Estella Miranda Aguilar, all of whom had tremendous impact on the Wolves games today. Yeah, they absolutely did. They were pivotal. I mean, in, in not in not even more so than just getting them out of some situations and getting them moving in the right direction. That was the most important thing. And I think you no. Know, uh
nobody more so than Jaden Miller. We saw do that so often for Western Oregon, and that was so big for them. And unbeaten today, two wins, that's pretty good. And we now pivot our attention, folks, to the start of seeded play. As we wait for the teams to take the field here, fellas. How are we feeling? Three games left. It's been a marathon of a day. Everyone That's having true. fun? Oh yeah, oh, it's, yeah, it's been a blast. I mean, you know, this has been a great level of competition. We've seen a lot of great teams today, and now this is where things are going to get interesting. Because I mean, even in in the group play, at least you think, okay, it's more of you know, it's a regular season game. You can kind of you can still kind of take some risks. Maybe you wouldn't in a, in a you know win or go home situation. Whereas you know this this you know this one's for all the marbles, verbally speaking. And so it's going to be interesting to see how we're going to see these games play out. I mean, are we going to see some more cagey affairs where they're going to kind of feel each other out, or are we going to just see them hit the ground running? I think you bring up a good point, too, because I think now that everyone's got to watch each team go and play, they can just kind of nitpick what has been working for them, maybe capitalize on some defense opportunities over there. It's going to be a lot of variety, but I think this is really where you're going to want to bring your A game going into a championship like this. So, Absolutely. Bye. An interesting question I have for you, gentlemen, actually. Do we think Pool A or Pool B is going to have the better record here? As far as the final round. The final round. Well, okay, let's look at the matchups here. Now, these are not confirmed matchups. This is just our best mathing doing its math. Now, we are media majors. <laughs> <laughs> so stick with us here. So we we, we might have to recalculate a couple of times. But what we know is going to happen is we know we are going to have the Boise State University A team taking on Montana State University Bobcats. We know that we are going, actually, we know all of this. We know we're going to have Southern Utah take on Colorado School of Mines, and we know we're going to have the University of Northern Colorado take on Boise State B. Now, starting with Boise State B and Northern Colorado, what do we think is going to happen? I personally think that Boise State B will pull out the win, but I think Colorado may get in and score a few tries. Colorado showed a lot of improvement, even just from their first game to their second game today. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little bit closer than you might anticipate. I would agree with that. I mean, I think um, I think the big thing is that we're considering here. I mean, Northern Colorado has put in a good performance today, um, but I think Boise State B was in a tougher group, and I think they've had a, they had some really bright moments. And so I, I think for that reason, I'm also going to go Boise State B. Um, but I think I agree with you. I think it's going to be a close affair. I think it's going to also be a close affair. I did like the aggression that Boise State B was bringing into that last game. Obviously, they, the game didn't go the way they wanted it to, but I think this is going to be a great opportunity for them to kind of put that stuff into practice, rush off the previous games and go into this kind of fresh. North Colorado had some great improvement from their first game going into their second. And I think it's still, I, I think it go either way, but I, I'm going to favor Boise State B on this one. Moving to the two-seed game now, we're going to have the Colorado School of Mines take on the Southern Utah University Thunderbirds. Now this one is a more interesting one to me because Colorado School of Mines, just based off of results, seems like the better team. But we saw a lot of really good play, including what I think is a pretty impressive win that Southern Utah had over Northern Colorado. I would agree with that, and I, I think that's why I'm actually going to go with Southern Utah here. I think um, I, I think they're a really good team. I liked a lot of what they've done today. They've looked really good, and I think um, we're gonna. I think that they're going to show that against Colorado School of Mines, who is a really good team. I just think I think Southern Utah has just got something about them today. I think uh, I think I want to favor Northern Colorado on this, or not uh, Northern Colorado. Southern uh, Utah. Southern Utah. I want to go. I want to go for Southern Utah just because I, I think they had a very aggressive play style against some some really hard teams. They really had everything kind of close together on their you know their execution that was just a little bit more flawless than uh, School of Mines. But I wouldn't put past the School of Mines if they also didn't come out with that same level of aggression. Obviously, they have a very high scoring team, but can they get it done here in this championship? I guess we'll find out here soon enough. I feel like my worry when when kind of looking at that game, I mean, that game I think is a really is going to be I think pro, I think it's going to be a really close game. I think all three of these pool matches, um, you know, these seeded pool matches are going to be close. Uh, but I think this one is the hardest one for me to call because I think 
I feel like the problem, you know, I, what I'm running into is Colorado School of Mines. I feel like they're just a very chaotic team, and I think if they were playing a team that was in more control, like I think if they were playing Boise State A, I think I would be more willing to be like, okay, I think I could, I would be willing to pick them there, because they, I think they're, that their chaotic style that they've shown today, I think that'd be really good against them, but I'm just not sure that that's going to work against Southern Utah. Well, as I pull out my little handy roster sheet here, looking at Colorado School of Mines roster, they only have three upperclassmen on this entire team. This team is composed of predominantly freshmen with a couple of sophomores sprinkled in there. So this is a team that had a ton of success in nationals last year at the Division II, le at the Division II level. They went all the way to the national finals before they were defeated by a team from the East Coast in a very con tightly contested battle. I believe it was 10 to five was the final score but they didn't return a lot of those girls. So they're having to reload with some different members and a different cast of characters and kind of find that organization again. Now that being said, they will be headed back to nationals, like I mentioned earlier, based off of their results against Northern Colorado, but this is not going to be the same team heading back to nationals that was the year prior. Then finally, the creme de la creme. Who you guys got in the ship? BSUA versus Montana State. So far, there's been a couple scares, mostly on the Boise State side, but both teams are coming into this game undefeated with something to prove here. Boise State A actually looking to rebound from a 55 to 7 15s loss that they had to Montana State back in the fall. Montana State kind of had their way with them. Boise State would love to defend their home turf and pull out the W in their own tournament. I'll let you start this one off. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to definitely go with the home advantage here. I think I'm going to go Boise State A. Obviously, they've been showing some great, great play style out there. It's been beautiful on the defensive side, making the tackles where they need to, especially the one-on-one -on -one matchups. I think that's been a big deal for them. And I think going into this game against Montana State, it's going to really rely on those one-on-one -on -one matchups. Just because we saw in their previous game, Montana State's really great at just getting the job done in the pockets, being able to meet in the end zone. But I think when it comes and said and done, I think defense is going to be the ultimate winner in this situation. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. I think when I think about this matchup, it's going to be a tough test for both of these teams. But I really think I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I think it's going to be Boise State A. And a big reason I feel like for that is because Montana State, we've watched them play today, and we've really only seen them take advantage of what their opponents are giving them. I'm not sure I'm, I'm ready. Like, I'm not sure that they've played a, a game yet today where I'm like, okay, that team was evenly, they were evenly matched there, and they, they just took, they but they found, they created their own, and they found a way. I'm just not sure I have seen that yet. I feel like Boise State A, we did see that a little bit when they were a little sluggish in their second game, and I think that's going to be um, a big helper for them coming into this championship game. Absolutely. Um, as we wait for action to resume here, I think it's safe for us to take a little break. Um, once we see the teams come back onto the field, we'll resume our coverage here once again. This is University Television's production of the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Tournament in Boise, Idaho. We thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in a few moments once we get started on the three-seed game, the Pool A three-seed, the Northern Colorado Bears versus the Pool 2, yeah, the Pool B 3 seed, Boise State University Broncos B team. We'll see you in a moment.
Actually, I think we're okay. That's cold. Oh, why is that cold? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. After our brief hiatus, we are going to skip the fifth place game for now and jump immediately to the third place game. We are hot. We will have the Colorado School of Mines 
and the Southern Utah Thunderbirds playing. Looking for third place here in this Fool's Gold Tournament are these two teams, each with one win and one loss on the day. Southern Utah's one win coming against Northern Colorado and Mines one win coming against Boise State's B team. Looks like Mines will kick off to Southern Utah to start this thing off. Fellas, let's play a third place game. Absolutely, I think, um, I think in spite of the, the rainy conditions right now, I I'm, expect, I'm hoping for, but expecting a high scoring affair here. I think both these teams are gonna put up some points. I think uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think it's gonna be a little bit opposite. I think both teams are gonna be very possessive when they get the uh, opportunity to get the ball, but I think they're gonna try to play a lot of security in these wet conditions. So I don't know, I'm assuming aggression, but also slower play. Now the kick is underway. It's been a while since we've seen mines on the field. I wonder if their muscles will have tightened up a little bit in the hour or two since they've played. Mines immediately gets the ball from Southern Utah, and they're on the advance, almost in Utah's third. Mines down the left sideline, dragging defenders. Hot start quickly for the Mines. She falls to the ground just to start the ruck. Looking to rotate it off to the right now is Mines. Chris passes all around. Can they get another? No, they cannot. Ball bounces backwards, play is still live. Can she lay it off to somebody? Yes, she can. Mines now approaching us here on the right side of the field. That ball is dropped, rolls forward. Not a knock because it rolled forward. It didn't bounce forward. Mines now with the ball, approaching, looking for the try, and it's converted. That will be Jade Lavelle, number 16 for Colorado School of Mines, unless my eyes are deceiving me. Mines up 5-0. What a start there to the to the match there. I mean, who's uh, who's to say that break affected them at all? I mean, really, really impressive start from the opening kick. They were able to regain the uh, the ball quickly, moving the ball down the field methodically, keeping the ball away from Southern Utah's defense, and just eventually found the opening on a great finish. The kick is no good, and the Ore Diggers lead the Thunderbirds by a score of five to zero. Mine's all set to kick off here at midfield as we get rid of that other ball. Get very, out of here. I'm very excited to see how the uh, Thunderbirds respond to that possession that they just witnessed. As am I, the Thunderbirds gave up the ball quickly after being kicked to at the beginning there, and then Mines was able to play around in their half for about a minute and a half before finally punching in the try. Thunderbirds grab the ball and get possession, looking for somebody to pass to now. Brought down and into the ruck we go. Very, very aggressive play by the Mines. Trinity Bohati, nope. Correct me, Annie Saldana there with the very aggressive play. I apologize earlier, folks. The earlier try was Mariana Moreau. It was not Jade Lavelle scoring. Mariana Moreau, the junior captain, with the first try for Mines. Mines will now get the ball in the quick tap and go after the Southern Utah penalty, but the referee will ask for them to reset it and do it again. Really interested here by how Southern uh, School or how School of Mines how they're approaching uh, the defensive portion of this. I mean, you've already we already kind of touched on it, but they're being very aggressive in their one v one tackling. I mean, you know, we saw on several uh, ruck opportunities. I mean, they just went straight into it and tried to flatten um, so, you know the players on Southern Utah. I mean, that's some aggression that we haven't seen very much today. Not at all, and there is the tap and go. The pass is deflected by the referee. Mines maintains possession, though. Looking for something down that left side there. Referee blows the whistle. Looks like we're lining up for a scrum here. Southern Utah will be feeding the ball into the scrum. It's a penalty on Mines. Ball is entered into the scrum by Southern Utah, but it is won by the Mines, and it will stay on this half of the field. Mines down the sideline, we go. Will anybody catch her? No, they will not. Mines on the board again, 10-0. Very impressive start from the Mines right there. Very impressive start from the Mines. 
and this time I believe it was Jade Lavelle with a great run down that far side. Yes, it was. Thank you all. These eyes are failing me. <laughs> also with the little stripes on the back of their jersey, the 15 and 16 look so similar to me. Wicked kits though. I like those mind kits. It's definitely a unique color scheme. I like those kits. I like the little orange too. It's a nice little flare there. Yeah, on the socks. And the kick is no good, making the score 10 to zero here with two minutes and change left to go in this first half. Mines firmly in control of this game. Southern Utah just looking to cross midfield for the first time. That ball is deflected right into the hands of the ore diggers. Nice little layoff there, and they're down the left side once more. Can Lavelle do it twice? Nice little dump off there. And we're into the ruck about 10 meters away from the try line. Taken down, good tackle there by Southern Utah as they get aggressive now. A tap and go after Southern Utah came around the side. Mines are trying to take advantage of Southern Utah falling asleep on defense a little bit. Mines pick it up one more time. Getting very close, referee blows the whistle and that will be a knock on the Mines. Very close there for the Mines, but that knock unfortunately will cause them to reset in a scrum where Southern Utah will have the right to feed in the ball. But that being said, Southern Utah fed the ball a moment ago and the Mines won it. Yeah, but this is a big opportunity for them to avoid what could have been a three uh, score deficit going in to the final minute or so of the first half. Absolutely. Southern Utah cannot allow a score here. A three score deficit is going to be very difficult to overcome in the second half. Well, especially with the Mines having possession of the ball, a majority of this first half is, you know, not really playing in any favor for the Thunderbirds this game. Not at all. We wait for a substitute to come on. This substitute for Southern Utah is Rachel Nebaker, the sophomore whose name has been called a few times today. Scrapping for the ball, the Mines come up with it. They win another one that Southern Utah drops in. Joe Lynn, it's not Lavelle, it's Moreau. Thank you very much, Joe, I apologize for that. And as I look down at the comments, I look up and the Mines are scoring another try. This, let me make sure that I get my numbers correctly once I see it here. Another great start here though for the, for the Col uh, Colorado School of Mines. I mean, they've just been dominant and they're gonna cap it with a three score lead in the dying embers of the first half. There we are, that is number five, Annie Saldana, the freshman, scoring that last try there for Mines. Moreau is in the black sweats, I see it now. Thank you very much, Joe Lynn, I appreciate the help. Oh, right through Southern her. Utah commits a knock, and Mines will be able, actually, here we go to the half. And our halftime score, seven minutes into this ball game, is Colorado School of Mines, 17 after a converted kick and Southern Utah zero. Let's see if Southern Utah can come back and make this one a ball game in the second half or if the Colorado School of Mines is going to run away with third place. Well, I'll tell you what's what surprised me. I mean, it isn't necessarily um, that the Colorado School of Mines is winning, although um, the, to the extent of which that they're winning is a little surprising. But I think the biggest thing that's surprising to me is the way that it's happened. I mean, Southern Utah has barely had the ball. I'd be shocked if, if um, you know, if we were keeping those kinds, of, had the ability to keep those kinds of stats, I'd be shocked if they've had the ball more than a minute in the first half. Well, also going off of that, I mean, I really genuinely thought that, you know, the Thunderbirds would have a little bit more possession, being a little bit more aggressive, but uh, even on the, on the scrums, they're losing the possession there, and that's kind of sad to see. So hopefully going into the second half, they, uh, you know, make some magic happen and get the boards on the board. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been really shocking just the level of dominance we've seen from the School of Mines. I mean, they're, they've are they just refused to lose the ball to Southern Utah, even if they have, not for very long. I mean, they get it right back, and they just continue to attack in wave after wave after wave, and that's what resulted in the 17-point lead that we see. Absolutely. 
And as the two teams huddle up, I can only imagine here that the Southern Utah huddled the message is, hey, let's find a way, let's find some motivation here, and let's try to get one score and see if we can snowball that into a few. And out there at the School of Mines, their huddle is just, hey, let's maintain. We got seven minutes, we'll get a third place, which is a great finish here, especially with the top level talent of Boise State's A team and Montana State taking up that one and two position. I would imagine Colorado School of Mines will be very pleased with taking third place out here. Yeah, I mean, a good performance and for them, I mean, if they're able to seal this one out and finish up in third place, I mean, it's, you know, there's a tough tournament here because there was a lot of really, really good teams here. And, um, you know, Southern Utah, for example, slash themselves, um, as they are newly promoted this year after a really, really good last year. And so I think it's gonna be, um, if they're able to hold this on, it's gonna be a really good result, like you said, for them and their placement in this tournament. As we start the second half here, Southern Utah will be kicking to mines. Let's see if Southern Utah can launch one up in the air and recover it quickly. I believe they still have not crossed the halfway mark, Southern Utah, with the ball offensively. Well, they're going to need to a lot more this next this next half. So well, certainly at least three times. And that is a good kick there from Southern Utah. Making Mines go all the way back within 10 meters of their touchline to get it. Mines starting their attack now, seeing if they can break free. They got Southern Utah's defense a little disjointed. Let's see if they can take advantage of it. Nice little layoff there from Mines, and they're able to keep the play going. A little bit of space now. Let's see if Southern Utah can recover. A nice layoff from Mines. Oh, there may be some room there. Another nice little layoff. Let's see if Mines can find some space now. They go down, let's go into the ruck. Exiting out to the left now. Mines has numbers if they make one more pass. Can't make the pass. Met very well by a Southern Utah defender who prevented the girl from making that pass. Into the ruck we go, Southern Utah coming over the top, really aggressively trying to fight them off, but Mines still gets the ball. Into the ruck one more time, Southern Utah really, really pushing trying to punish people for blocking them out of the ruck, and that time they do drop the ball a little bit. Southern Utah with some great defense for that stretch right there. Yeah, absolutely. They're gonna have an opportunity here to potentially possess the ball for the first time in a long while here if they're able to recover it off of the, the scrum. Yes, the knock by Colorado School of the Mines will allow Southern Utah to feed the ball in, but in the last two times they fed the ball into the scrum, Colorado School of Mines have won it. Can Southern Utah finally win one? No, they cannot. Scrums dominated by Colorado School of the Mines today. Mines working out to the right side and a cheeky little kick there. Let's see if they can run it down. Oh, she's got wheels! but could not recover it cleanly, but a nice little dump off there. One more, they got numbers on the right side if they want it. Nice little recovery there, a good bounce. Will they call a knock? No, they will not. And Mines will be in for another score. Wow. This has definitely just been the Mines game today. It has been the Mines game today. They have controlled possession. They have played the better rugby and they have dominated the scrums today, which I think is the big difference in this. Southern Utah a couple times has looked like they've had momentums. They've had Mines commit penalties. Southern Utah's had the advantage of putting the ball into the scrum, but they are 0 for their last three. Colorado School of Mines has dominated that facet of the game as that kick is no good to make the score 20 to zero. And it's interesting too, because I mean, you look at situations like that previous play where you see Colorado School Mines. They're kind of they win the they get the ball back outside out of the scrum, and they're kind of trapped. I mean, on, along that midfield line. I mean, Southern Utah they're in position one on one, and then they just create. They, they think about how they want to do this, and they come up with a great solution, which is just kick the ball behind them, which gets everybody on their back foot, and it allows them to get in behind the defensive line of Southern Utah, and its results. Mines just kicks it off. Did that go 10? Because if it did, they can grab it. Referee blows the whistle, and that'll be a knock on Mines. Into the scrum we go. Southern Utah feeding once again, and fellas, will they make it four in a row? I think they can. I think they can. Let's see here. If you look at the push, that's the big difference. Look at the first push that Mines gets when they go down into the scrum. Oh, and Southern Utah wins one. Oh, but they couldn't grab onto it. And that'll be a knock for Southern Utah. Back to a scrum we go. 
right when it looked like things were starting to go the Thunderbirds way. Well, you know, you talked about look at the, the push in the scrum there. I mean, I think Southern Utah's uh, line there took three steps backwards. Yes, they did. Mines this time aggressively. I don't think that one got in between their legs, though. I see. I think that one just uh, just missed the the gap there. That missed the tunnel there. Went off the uh, first girl on the left there in the scrum. Went off her foot. Feeding it back in is Mines, and Mines will win that one. Exited out to the right, but the referee blows the whistle. We are going to try this one more time. Big scrum moment right here, big scrum. Yeah. What, do they think? what do they say about third time? Third time's the charm. Bingo, here we go. Let's see it, number 10, that is Captain Emma Barta feeds it in, and then they win it. Barta passes it off to the right, and Colorado School of Mines is going again. Oh, and a great strip there by Southern Utah. Into the ruck they go, ball bounces off of the lady. Mines picks it up, that's number 16. This time, I know it's Jade Lavelle. Tiny but mighty, says her mom, Jade Lavelle. Does she convert the try? I can't tell what the signal is. I cannot is. tell what the call is. I do not believe she does. She will be awarded the try by the looks of it. She will not, nope, it will be a tap and go for Southern Utah, it's a penalty. Jade Lavelle's try is wiped off the board, but still a great individual effort nonetheless. That would have been a fifth try for them in a row. Yes, it would have been, as we are under two minutes now. Good tackle there, but possibly a high one by Mines. Southern Utah still fighting through. This is number six for Southern Utah. That's Malia Cronquist. I've said her name a whole lot today. She's been a stud player for these Thunderbirds. Dumps off to the right. Southern Utah getting dangerously close to out of bounds. And they are out of bounds as bodies fall into the snowbank or what's left of it. It will be a line out for Southern Utah by the looks of it. It will be a line out for Mines, actually, as Lavelle will be the one to take it out. Ball's in there, grabbed quickly by Mines. Clever little throw there. This is number three, Tilly Dozier, the freshman with the ball, and she lays it off. Lavelle's got it back. Number 14 now, this is Chandler Bergstrom, another freshman. Ball bouncing around over the right. Can Mines control it? Yes, they can. But it will be a knock. Southern Utah will get the ball. The freshman for Mines showing out here in this second half, making some good plays down on the attacking end of the field. As we approach 20 seconds left here in this game, that should just about do it with the Colorado School of Mines or Diggers taking third place in the Fool's Gold Tournament. It's 2024 edition. Def definitely wasn't an easy road to the journey, but uh, one that will paid off. Absolutely not. I think they're gonna be really Ball. happy with their performance today. I think so. Ball bounces around here a little bit. That'll be another knock for Southern Utah. And that will be your ball game, folks. Final score, Colorado School of Mines, Ore Diggers 20, Southern Utah University Thunderbirds 0. Colorado School of Mines wins the third place in the Fool's Gold Tournament. Really impressive showing there from uh, Colorado School of Mines. I mean, a really just truly dominant performance here against Southern Utah in this final game. And uh, I, I don't know if any of us saw that kind of performance coming, but um, they, you know, they played a couple of really good teams in their group, and they uh, took the lessons they learned from earlier today and applied them very quickly into their uh, match today to secure third place. And Pool B strikes first. Yes, they did. And as we look down to the bottom right here of the field, we see Boise State's A team starting to make their way to the bench. A great signal that the championship game is almost here, gentlemen. The game we've been talking about since 9 a.m. this morning is almost upon us. 
I think this one's going to be match of the day. I mean, you got two the you know two of the best teams um, in this tournament here outside of the the school of mines. Um, going up against each other and it's going to be really really interesting battle to see who's going to be crowned champion of the fool's gold tournament for those of you for those of you at home hoping to watch northern colorado take on boise state's b team it appears that that game may not be happening we haven't received any official word yet but with the going of the championship game now boise state a team wearing the blue Montana State wearing the white. It does not appear that we will get that Northern Colorado and Boise State B team game, which is unfortunate, but we understand that everybody has time constraints. Moving on to the field, Montana State is already ready to go while Boise State's A team has taken off their jackets. Fellas, give me your guess. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go Boise State A. I think um, they've had a really good, really good day today. I feel good about what they're gonna do. Oh, I definitely got to go for the home team on this one, especially for they, they've been able to do offensively. Just they they have a system and it's been working for them all day. Well, we are Broncos fans, but we are neutral commentators here. One thing that I am very excited about watching in this game is if the Broncos have an answer for Crowley because she was dominant in her last game. And if she can step up, she can rival Maria Donovan and possibly put Montana State over the top. Absolutely. I mean, she was so impactful uh, in their last game against, you know, against Boise State B, and I think that's going to be such a big factor for both of these teams. I mean, how are they going to deal with each other's X factors? I mean, obviously, you have Maria Donovan for Boise State, and on the other side, um, you know, you got Montana State. And I think you got to just be careful of the, the speed on the edge. But um, both teams, they're really comfortable. I think going you know, out playing outside, playing inside. So it's just going to be a matter of who's going to make less mistakes. I think that this is going to be about who's going to make less mistakes and be able to really shine when it comes through. And I think on top of that, too, it's just going to be high intensity the entire game. I mean, we are talking about the championship, but leading up to this, I mean, both teams just have had dominating performances and they, they're really great at what they specialize and it and it's not forgotten here. Turning to the chat. We have Joe Lynn, a very, very proud Colorado School of Mines Board Diggers fan right now saying, go Diggs, what a gutsy game, way to take it to them, proud of you ladies. Certainly a gutsy performance by Colorado School of Mines, gutsy performance by all teams toughing it out through these conditions today to put on a very good exhibition of rugby. Very, very impressed with what I've seen today. Absolutely. You know, I feel like even in spite of the field conditions improving as we've kind of gone along here, I still think the, the level really hasn't changed all that much, and it's just been a really high level all day. 13 games down and one more to go, folks. Here is the championship match of the entire Fool's Gold Tournament. Not to over-exaggerate, but this is for all the marbles. Boise State will kick off to Montana State. We got Broncos and we got Bobcats. In 15 minutes, we'll know the champion. Here we go, Bobcats will start with the ball. They receive it almost cleanly, ball is bounced backwards, and immediately, Montana State grabs it, and it looks like we are going to have a forward pass. A forward pass, Montana State, that pass may have gone straight up in the air, but the referee says it went a tiny bit forward. So Boise State and Montana State will go into a scrum less than 30 seconds into the game here. For Boise State, this game is all about getting it outside to Maria Donovan and then controlling the middle. They also need to stop Bridget Crowley, who has had a great display today. Ball being fought for right now between Montana State and Boise State. It'll be a foul penalty on Montana State, a tap and go for Boise State. And immediately we've got Ali Franzak passing over left, passing over left again. And that is going to be a knock, unfortunately, as she was trying to control that ball it bounced off her right hand slightly forward. Yeah, it looked like a great sequence is coming together there for Boise State A and then just not quite able to complete that last pass. And it's going to give an opportunity here for Montana State to potentially possess coming out of the scrum. So far, Boise State in the first two minutes has taken pretty good control of the game. Montana State not yet with a chance to really show what they can do offensively as we have seen some displays from them today. Ooh, Montana State trying to capitalize on that gap right there. Montana State trying to capitalize on that gap, and they just may. 
on the run. They're in the attacking third now. Oh, and a great hit from Boise State. Stops any momentum that they may have had there. What a good hit from Boise State as that looked very promising for Montana State and they slammed the door shut. Incredible stop there. I mean, in transition, that's exactly who Montana State wanted to get the ball to there. They uh, they found a way to get it to Brid Bridget Crowley, but she's chased down, and then Boise State with a great tackle in the open field results in a scrum here that's going to be uh, initiated by Boise State. That ball passed all the way through the tunnel, so we will reset the scrum. we go and Boise State will win it all oh, but a great play there by Montana State to knock it loose and now Boise State's on their heels the ruck is won quickly and Boise State's trying to get on the outside possibly for a kick or just to run up and get it out of Dodge up the sideline we go though guess who it is it's the All-American Maria Donovan does she have the closing speed number 13 for Montana State does not and Boise State will be on the board first Wow. wow. The Broncos strike first in the championship game. Maria Donovan, the All-American and the All-Tournament team member from the 2023 National Tournament, puts Boise State up 5-0. to zero. Incredible run there. I mean, it looked like Boise State was on their back foot going backwards as Montana State was pushing forward aggressively on defense. But then Maria Donovan just broke a tackle and was out and gone past every defender Montana State could muster. And that kick is no good for Boise State, keeping the score at 5-0. to zero. If conversions matter in any game, this may be the one. And Montana State will not roll over and die. This we know. Well, I think the thing is, too, is that the game is just one in milliseconds of just finding that gap and exposing it. And that's exactly what Boise State did in that section right there. Boise State looking to kick off here, holding on to a 5-0 lead as we are just over halfway through this first half. Good kick, goes about 15 meters and it's received by Montana State's Anna Kakuchibrod, the freshman from Missoula, Montana. We know her parents are watching right now. We will go down into a scrum, Boise State will feed it in. Montana State's got to be careful here because this is exactly what, what led to Boise State's last try. Absolutely. It looks like Montana State's going to win this one, and they will. Can Montana State make something happen offensively now? Grace Crowley. Oh, 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 here we go. There goes that number 12 again. We got a tie ball game, folks. Booyah. 5-5. Five, five. They found an answer. They Grace answered. Crowley, I'm running out of fingers, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> Putting the team on her back. Call her Greg Jennings. <laughs> Let's see if Montana State can convert here and take the lead or if it'll remain a tie game. This will be a tough angle, though. Kick is up. And, and it good. is good. Seven to five. Bobcats take the lead. Great kick there. Well, it looks like both teams are going to be vulnerable on those scrum plays. I mean, both teams have scored off of them now. I mean, I think it's really tough, I think, to stop the speed that both teams possess when you're in those scrums because you got so many members committed there to one side of the field and tied up with each other. And so it leaves a lot more room on the field. And there's already a ton because it's, you know, it's seven on seven. Um, and I think that's going to be really tough. One team is just going to have to solve it, I think, just by winning more scrums. Yes, there is some excellent speed on the outside for both teams. Into the ruck we go. Boise State picks it cleanly. Looking for something on the right side now. Crowley all over. Back to the left we go. Let's see if Boise State can find some real estate there. Quickly running out of it as they approach the sideline. Quick cut back there. Let's see if she can find somebody. Yes, she can. Good layoff there. Donovan's got it. Donovan not able to lay it off as she's swarmed by two Bobcats. And into the ruck we go. Oh. Rolling around on the ground. A tap and go. Crowley will take it for Montana State. Montana State quickly approaching here. They're almost within 10 meters. They slow it down, looking to reset their offense. 
Got two players out to either side, giving Crowley options. Oh, and a nice little kick there. Very cheeky play. Boise State will pick it up, though, within their own 10 meters. Fighting off Bobcats or the Broncos, trying to get it out, trying to give themselves some room. And every single tackle that Montana State's making right now, guys, there's two girls on it. Every single time they hit somebody, it's never one-on-one -on -one tackles. Montana State's swarming to the ball right now. Oh, well, they're definitely not letting up on that defense, and uh, it's really showing right there. And Boise State will kick it away, just hoping at this point that the referee will blow the whistle to call halftime. And the ruck we go, they dive over it. Montana State stands up. Will he blow the whistle or will he let play continue? Montana State getting dangerously close, dragging Broncos. Oh. Off to the left go the Bobcats. Seeing if they could find something there. Oh, possibly uh -oh. had a pass, but it gets knocked uh -oh. away. A nice little kick by the Bobcats puts it back in play. And that will be halftime. A very exciting first half, full of lots of action there, guys, especially that last little 90-second segment. What are we thinking? Well, I think uh, I think Boise State A is going to be thankful that they uh, found a way to, to hang on there on a goal line defense there for the that last minute or so of that really first was. half. That was some red zone defense <laughs> that the Broncos were just playing right there. But, I speak football for you Texas guys. <laughs> But, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it was a, a really tightly contested first half like we thought. The big impact players, Maria Donovan and, um, you know, and, and Bridget Crowley uh, making the difference right now. And we just got to see who's going to make the plays coming in the second half. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I genuinely think that both teams are just playing their best right now. And it's it's definitely showing. I mean, we have it's not even high scoring. It's just consistent. And that's it, the beautiful thing about it. This is some of the best rugby they've probably played all day. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, I, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the second half because I think Boise State really started the, fir the first half really strongly, but they started to fade a little bit uh, as Montana State got that that got that got um, try back there um, midway or, or so through the first half. And then from there, Montana State, I think, dominated the proceedings. And that's going to be the interesting thing to watch here is, is Boise State going to take the first half of the, the half again and then is Montana State going to dominate the second part of it or is it going to be a little bit more even or who's going to come out strongest? That's what I want to see. Likewise here as we come down to the last couple seconds here this first half. Very excited to see what this second half has to bring us. Both teams in the huddle now discussing strategies, going over what happened in the first seven minutes and what will happen in the second seven minutes. You know, I think both teams should just be even proud, not only just to be in the championship, but the fact that they've improved so much just from earlier this morning, what they were doing, now they're executing it. And it's, you know, obviously showing in this championship game that this is what happens when you play your best, you have your good time with your people, and regardless of the weather, you know, we're just here to play some great games. Yes, we are. And as we get ready to start the second half here, it looks like, as the team swaps side here, looks like Montana State will be kicking to Boise State to start this second half here. Montana State with a 7-5 lead over Boise State, but a very, very tightly contested game. As we were talking about earlier, the conversion being the only difference between the two teams right now. I know, how big is that right now? I mean. Boise State strikes first, but unable to knock in that conversion. And on the other side, Montana State responds just a few minutes later, but is able to finish theirs. And so they hold the lead at the end of the at the end of the half there. And that's going to be key. Who's going to be able to make the most of their opportunities? Ball's in play, and that is a big boot there. Boise State trying to make use of that extra space that's right there, finding some extra room. Down the sidelines we go. Here goes Maria Donovan one more time. Nobody's going to catch her. Maria Donovan. Second try of the game, and the Broncos are back in front. Absolutely unreal. Just gets the ball in on the short side of the field and broke not one, not two, but multiple tackles on her way down the field and just outruns the rest. And Maria Donovan showing why she's an All-American. 
And that kick is no good as well, meaning all that Montana State needs to take the lead back is a try. If that conversion went in, they would need the try, and then a misconversion would tie the game. 10 to seven ball game now, Boise State A up on Montana State. A little under six minutes left to go in this second half. We apologize for the timer on our score bug, not running right now, but you know, things happen. This is live broadcasting after all. <laughs> Montana State will grab the ball and let's see if they can respond to Boise State quickly. Whistle's blown. And we are going to have a tap and go at midfield for Montana State. Yeah, wondering how, uh, as the possessions change and the score changes, what teams are prioritizing over other things, whether it's the offense or the defense, obviously. Montana State busting through the middle right now. That's number 13, Sam Gardner, the sophomore from Cincinnati, Ohio. Is anybody going to catch her? No, the Bobcats will take the lead right back from the Broncos. Wow. Rugby giveth and it taketh away. 12-10, Montana State up on Boise State. Right up the middle, Sam Gardner went, guys, and you know, one broken arm tackle. I grew up playing youth football, right? And I heard arm tackles were the devil all the time. <laughs> Same thing reigns true here in rugby. You gotta get a hand on and you gotta keep it on. And that kick goes through the uprights, making it 14 to 10. Montana State with two tries and two conversions, and all of a sudden they're up four, guys. Yeah, they are, and uh, you know, uh, if you know, Montana State, that's exactly how you want to respond. I mean, did a good job there after that, uh, you know, tap and go at midfield to find a way to just slip through there. Um, great recognition, honestly, to see that, oh, if I just break this one tackle, I'm gone, and that's exactly what she did and hit the afterburners, and nobody was catching her, and that's exactly what Montana State needed to do is answer right away to the gauntlet that Boise State A put down. Yeah, if I'm Boise State, obviously, I want to get the try. But when it comes to the conversion, obviously, take the time to line it up properly and put a lot of boot in there just to make sure it goes through the uprights. But I'd be kind of concerned about those if I can't convert them. Well, you think about it, too, right now. I mean, they've, if they have both of those you know, conversions that they missed right now, we're in a tie ball game. And instead, you know, you got to wonder if Boise State maybe will start feeling the effects of the clock here um, as we start to wind down in the second half because they're, you know, they're, they're trailing right now, and they're going to be on. It's, the onus is on them to take the lead. Absolutely. And as the most recent try scorer, Sam Gardner, kicks it off, Boise State will receive it. It'll bounce around a little bit, and let's see who's going to come up with possession here. We got a knock called on Boise State. Broncos not able to corral that kick, and now Montana State has a great opportunity to get right back into the attacking third. The last two scrums have led to uh, tries for both teams. It'll be interesting to see if the same thing happens here either way as Boise State wins it. Can they get it wide? You know who is out on the right, number 15. Great takedown there from Crowley to deny the pass to Donovan, but Donovan ends up with it anyways. Donovan with the layoff, does not complete the pass. It's picked up by Montana State. Well, they're definitely prioritizing keeping uh, Donovan all boxed in there. Crowley's got it and throws it on the outside. That's Sam Gardner. Sam Gardner down the sideline, throwing stiff arms. Nice little layoff there from Gardner. They're within 10 meters now. Montana State plays it out to the right. Can they get in? Pressing, it's Jesse Tuggy. Fighting over the ball. And it's going to be a touch and go penalty for Montana State. They've got an opportunity now, but the referee stops play. 14 to 10 ball game here, and they will award the ball to Boise State, perhaps. Looks like we're actually going to see a yellow card shown here to Montana State. Number two, that is Mary Sanchez, the senior from Shelby, Montana. A bad mistake for Montana State to make at this point in the game. L up less than one try on Boise State and now down a woman for the next two minutes, which is almost the entire remainder of the second half. Now Montana State's going to have to find a way here to hang on tight they for the next few going, minutes. They're going to have to hang on because I feel like it's going to be a bumpy ride with number 15 out there who's got the ball and they do a great job of corralling her on the sidelines and that'll be a line out. Montana State will throw it in. 
quick throw in there for Montana State. Can they score a man down or at least hold on to the ball long enough to stave off the Bronco offense? On the right side, that's Miller Reifogel. She's running for vice president of Montana State student body. Pass to the left, cutting back to the right now, cutting up the middle. And taken down by Boise State. Good tackle there. You got a dog pile, and it will result in a Boise State tap and go. Holding the ball on the ground is the call for Montana State. Nice little stiff arm there from Boise State. Passes off to the right, quickly running out of real estate again, though it's Donovan. Can Donovan make a play? Donovan cuts back, breaks one tackle, does not break the tackle of Crowley. My goodness, Crowley is everywhere. Pass back from Boise State goes over the head, and they have to reset. Broncos win the ruck. Bad pass, though. Danger. And that will be Yes, we'll be calling a knock on Boise State. Be a scrum that Montana State gets to enter. Man, panicking when, when with the ball there, Boise State just felt like they were rushing through their reads there and it ended up with a costly, costly uh, knock there. Montana State a man down. Boise State's not taking advantage of that though. They're keeping their formations very compact right now. They're not spreading out as much as they need to be to take advantage of that one person advantage. Ball entered in for Montana State. We're back to even strength now. Crowley's got it. We got 10 seconds and counting. Can Montana State hold on or does Boise State have one more push in them? The tackle is made. Rifle holds on to it and tosses it back. Down onto the ground we go, we're into the ruck. Montana State, can they hold on for a few more seconds? As the timer goes off, we go by the referee's hand time here. We are not done yet. Boise State's got the ball. This may be their last opportunity. A stiff arm throw. Can Boise State get down the sideline? They're in the middle now. Can Boise State get away with it? It's Leland Hewitt, the junior from Boise, Idaho. Man, just one fool's goal for the Broncos. Wonderful play there, right at the buzzer, and you can see the heartbreak on Grace Crow on Bridget Crowley's face. It is no fault of her own. Oh my goodness, what an awesome finish. We couldn't ask for anything more here as the conversion is up, and it is good, just for good measure, making the score 17 to 14. The Bobcats holding on to hope there is more time, but there will not be. And with that Boise State, at the buzzer, by some grace of God, some divine intervention, will win fool's gold. 17 to 14, the final score over Montana State. Guys, what? What wow. just happened? Yeah. What? That, wow. that, Come on, that get out sequence. of here. That I, was ridiculous. I thought Montana State had seen the game out once they got the, they got the player that was sent off for the yellow card back on. They're, you're just in the last few seconds of, of the added time and then, Disaster. I mean, oh. it, it, absolute disaster. And I don't think we could start that without talking, you know, about Ali uh, Franzak, who starts the sequence there for Boise State, ushering them down the field before giving the selfless play, passing it to her teammate, allowing her to go seal the deal and win it in walk-off fashion for Boise State. Yeah, that final toss made all the difference in that situation, let alone the drive and the determination, like they were not giving up. They do not write movies like this. The set is far too cold. But Boise State wins Fool's Gold 2024. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure calling all these games with you today. Oh, it's, it's been, been a, a pleasure to join. Jose Alton, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a blast. Thank you for bearing through it with me. Thank you for going on little sleep, little food, little water. That's the beautiful thing about it, isn't it? Yeah, that truly is the beautiful thing about it. As we go down now to our hand camera, we can see Boise State's huddle. Lots of water being consumed, lots of hugs being exchanged, and smiles being had for the Broncos.
absolutely stellar finish to the Fool's Gold Tournament. Yeah, you One can see us time. up there as well on the tippy And top. you can see <laughs> us up here. <laughs> the there we go. Booth. One more time, this tournament will conclude by Boise State's A team beating the Montana State University Bobcats by a score of 17 to 14. The game winning try being scored by Leland Hewitt, the junior from Boise, Idaho. She's had multiple tries today, but none bigger than this one. Now for all of us here at University Television's Productions, from me, my friend Jose, and my friend Alton, I've been Riley Chappelle. Thank you very much for joining us for the 2024 Fool's Gold Rugby Sevens Women's Tournament. Take care.